Super Paper Mario has one of the most interesting fan bases I've ever seen, with a large part of the fan base disliking a majority of the series. Which begs the question, at what point are you not a fan of the overall series, but just happen to like a couple of the games in the franchise? As it stands, the Paper Mario fan base is split between supporters and critics of the newest Paper Mario games. Namely, the Origami King, with supporters of the game saying that it's really good, and some people calling it their favorite in the series, and critics saying that the game is nowhere near as good as the Thousand Year Door. Color Splash received pretty mixed reviews all around. Some people said that it was pretty good, there were elements that people liked, but stuff like the gameplay left a lot to be desired. And Sticker Star has one of the worst reputations I've ever seen a video game have. The Thousand Year Door is regarded as one of the best RPGs really ever by both supporters and critics of the newest Paper Mario games, and same can be said for the original Paper Mario. But in between all of these Paper Mario games, lies a Paper Mario game unlike any other, one so unique and different from the rest that people argue whether or not it should even be considered a Paper Mario game. I am of course referring to my personal favorite Paper Mario game, Super Paper Mario. Super Paper Mario released on April 9th, 2007 to actually pretty favorable reviews. But it wasn't received as well as the first two Paper Mario games, and diehard fans of the first two games were a little disappointed by this one. You see, unlike literally all other Paper Mario games, Super Paper Mario plays more like an action-adventure game, or essentially a 2D platformer with a lot of RPG elements. It's not that the gameplay is like awful or unplayable and completely unfun, it's just that, you know, going from the first two Paper Mario games to this is a hard pill to swallow. Now, personally, I still really like Super Paper Mario, and despite its changes, I don't know, it's still a pretty fun game, there's a lot to like here, and I just, I don't think this game gets the respect it deserves. If no one else is gonna defend this game, then I might as well be the one to do it, so without any further introductions, let's hop into defending Super Paper Mario. Super Paper Mario begins with Mario and Luigi just hanging out, chilling, having a good time, until Toad interrupts them and tells them that Princess Peach has been kidnapped. They head over to Bowser's castle. Oh, and by the way, that Toad you saw there, that guy? Uh, yeah, him? He's the only Toad you see throughout the entire game. Only one. If you're sick and tired of seeing Toads in the new Paper Mario games, they just look like all the other Toads, super generic, this game got you covered. Only Toad. No more Toads. I, they're extinct. Might as well be. So, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, they head over to Bowser's castle to find that he hasn't kidnapped Princess Peach, although he was about to. No. Instead, the culprit is this guy. His name is Count Black, and he plans to destroy all worlds by following the prophecies written in a book called the Dark Prognosticus. Mario attempts to stop him, but fails, and Count Black takes Peach, Luigi, Bowser, and all of his minions to a wedding? Specifically for Peach and Bowser. Yeah, for whatever reason, Count Black just really wants these two to get itched. Bowser is, of course, ecstatic about this and instantly says yes, but Peach needs a bit more convincing, and so Count Black's assistant, Nastasia, uses her super hypnotic powers to, well, you know, convince Peach. Turns out the reason Count Black wanted these two to get married is to summon the Chaos Heart, which will consume and destroy all worlds. But not to fear, Luigi's here to rescue the princess, save the day, and he messed everything up. Back to Mario. Mario's knocked out cold until a little butterfly named Tippy awakes him. Tippy tells Mario that because Bowser and Peach have been married, something known as the Void has been created, and that to save his friends, he's gonna have to come with her. Tippy transports Mario to a town known as Flipside, where this old geezer named Merlin resides. Merlin is a descendant of the ancients who created Flipside, and tells Mario about the Void. Essentially, the Void is a black hole that will soon grow larger and swallow all worlds, all dimensions, everything. And it's up to Mario to stop it. According to a book called The Light Prognosticus, a counter to Count Black's Dark Prognosticus, 
A hero wearing red hat, blue overalls, and a mustache will be the one to save all worlds. Just Mario's luck. Using the power of the eight pure hearts, the hero will be able to counteract the chaos heart, stop the void, and save all worlds. Merlin hands over the first pure heart to Mario, whereas he's supposed to go plop that sucker into a structure known as a heart pillar, which will then unlock a door to another dimension. Before leaving, Merlin gives Mario the return pipe, which lets him return home at any time, and he also tells him that he will learn a dimensional technique from a dimensional governor, which Merlin is pretty sure this is his friend Bestovius. We then get this little interlude where we get to see what Count Black and all of his minions are up to. We see Ochoch, the dim-witted warrior, Mimi, the shape-shifting trickster, and Dementio, the magical magician. They're all great characters and have a lot of fun dialogue, but we'll get to see more of them later. For now, we're focused on Count Black, who gets word from Nastasia that the hero is on the loose. So, he sends O-Chunks to go give them a piece of O-Chunks. <sighs> okay, pause. That was a lot to take in. Within the first few minutes of the game, you can already tell that this is going to be a vastly different Mario game. We've got new characters, new locations, a new story. It's really setting itself up to be a Mario game unlike anything we've ever seen before. And that's what I like about this game, is that even outside of the Paper Mario series, there's really no other game like it. It's really its own thing. Chapter 1-1 The Adventure Unfolds Now, with all of that out of the way, we can finally get to the gameplay of this video game. As I previously mentioned, Super Paper Mario is a 2D platformer with RPG elements. But what does that mean? Essentially, you have the RPG mechanics of HP, attack, and defense. Although defense is basically just for enemies, so you don't really need to worry about it. To increase your HP and attack, you need to level up by earning XP, and in this game, XP is essentially your score, like in a 2D Mario game. You earn it in the same ways too, defeating enemies and collecting mushrooms. Just like in a 2D Mario game, in order to defeat enemies, you jump on their heads. Simple as that. There's a couple other things too that are in this game, like items, which is kind of interesting. You can use them as healing items or to attack. And there's things like the Tippy Pointer, which essentially is this game's version of Tattle. Get more information on your enemies and see what their stats are. You can also use the Tippy Pointer to get information about other stuff besides enemies, like this random house here. Or you can use it to see invisible objects, like this hidden door here. And beyond both this random house and this hidden door is the main mechanic of this game, Segway! Living in Lionland Road, just like Merlin said, is Bistovius, who, for only a small fee of uh, all our coins, jokes on him, we only had four anyways, we unlock a new ability. The ability to <clears throat> flip between dimensions. It's pretty cool. Using our newfound flipping abilities, we can travel between 2D and 3D, which is just an interesting concept. There are limitations to this, though. If you are in 3D, there's a gauge in the top left corner that will slowly deplete and refill when you're in 2D. If that gauge reaches zero, you'll take one HP of damage. Using 3D, you can find hidden doors, hidden pathways, hidden blocks, secrets, the whole shebang. You can do everything with the 3D. It is this game's main mechanic. With that all out of the way, the rest of the level is pretty straightforward, just getting used to the 3D mechanics and the general gameplay of what this game is. But there are plenty of new enemies and items to go over, so uh, let's get talking about those. Goombas are Goombas. They're gonna Goomba around and be Goombas. One HP, one attack, no defense. They're Goombas. Squiglets! Other than the fact that there's already Goombas in this game, they are the Goombas of this game. Two HP, one attack, and they just walk around. They're essentially Goombas with two HP. Although, I guess when you're in their line of sight, they pause and hop for a second and then charge at you S slowly. I don't know. Cousin to the Squiglets are the Squigs. They have more HP and can spit rocks. If you're good enough, you can keep jumping on those rocks over and over again, doing tricks to get lots of XP. 
Which, uh, oh yeah, by the way, if you shake the Wii Remote after jumping on an enemy, you can do a trick, which will net you some bonus XP. Yeah. Cool Pachuca's behave much like they do in the Super Mario Bros. series. Jump on their heads, knock them into their shell, smack a shell into other enemies to deal lots of damage. And lastly, there's the Sproing Oing, who, if you jump on their head, they'll split into three mini Sproing Oings, which you have to defeat. Eh, not too bad. On top of those new enemies, there are some new power-ups, like the previously mentioned Mushroom, which heals 10 HP. Well, I mean, I guess that one's not new, but like, all the rest are new. Pow Pills! Don't ask me why they're called that. A group of eight 8-bit Marios will follow around you. They can defeat enemies by jumping on them, or by sacrificing themselves. But be careful, because they can fall in bottomless pits. Happy Flower! It's not really a power-up, but I don't know what else you call it. It rains coins down from above. Small ones are worth one, big coins are worth three. Last but not least is the Mega Star, where you transform into a ginormous 8-bit Mario, destroying anything in your path. And like, yeah, it's another 8-bit Mario power-up, but eh, I think this was before they really hurled 8-bit Mario and Retro Mario and all that stuff down our throats, so it's justified, and the Mega Star sections are fine. I mean, the sections are always designed for the Mega Star, so it usually just boils down to free XP, but eh, they're fun. Every chapter's got at least one of them, so it works. With that all said, and I forgot to talk about the cards. Cards! They're the collectible of this game. 256 of them in total, 50 scattered throughout the game. If you find a card of an enemy, you now deal double damage to that enemy. Now we're done. With the first level out of the way, so are the introduction. So, we're gonna start blazing through these levels a little bit quicker now. Chapter 1-2, A Foot in the Foothills. 1-2 takes place in Mount Lyland and is a pretty typical level. To traverse up this mounty exterior, you must use these flippity doo da things, or flip it to 3D at the beginning, there's a hidden door you can take that skips, honestly, quite a big chunk of the level. There's some small puzzles here and there, like this switch, which you have to turn into 3D for, or this ledge, which you can only get up by turning into 3D and jumping on these blocks. Just getting used to the idea that, hey, if you have an issue, try flipping into 3D. After making it past this spiny tromp section, and yes, that is their official name, and no, they actually don't just appear in this game, they appeared in the original Paper Mario as well. And they also appeared in Super Mario Kun, which is a manga-style adaptation of the Mario series that spans across several of the games, like Super Mario World, the Super Mario Land series, and even shit like Mario Party. And yeah, they made a Paper Mario one, and it's there. I just thought that was interesting. Anyways, make it past the spiny tromp section and BOOM! Welcome to the old town, except for the bridge is closed, so you gotta go talk to the bridge master. You head in the pipe to get to the background, go in his house, and talk to him, who... Somehow he got himself stuck in 3D. Eh, you flip him out of there, he flips the switch, opens the bridge, BOOM! Now you're actually in the old town. The old town's just like any other old town. There's a shop, there's houses, characters to talk to cards, it's got everything. You're just meant to walk around for a bit, talk to some of the townsfolk, figure out what to do. There's some secrets here and there, but what you're supposed to do is go into the bathrooms, head down this pipe, make these thwomps. Uh, look intimidating, but um, yeah. Through this door is another door, and through that door is jail. Oh. Luckily for Mario, inside of jail is a mini jail. A mini jail for Throw. Throw is a pixel which are created by the ancients. He's been trapped for 1500 years waiting for the hero. Who, well, you know, finally decided to arrive. He quickly joins your party and, as you would imagine, lets you pick up the objects and throw them. Oh yeah, and while we're at it, Tippy is also a pixel. You can tell this because all the pixels have gay text. Now that you've got throw, you can go talk to old man Watch It, who tells you to watch it, which, I mean, you probably should. You are talking to the legendary old man Watch It. You tell him you're the hero, but he won't believe you unless you have a hand-shaped pixel with you, which, now that you do, he calls up Green, the other bridge master, which means, yeah, this guy's name is Red. Red and Green. Wow, how'd you come up with those names? Jesus. You go talk with Green, who flips the switch, and then asks you what your favorite color is. No matter what the hell you say, he always just sky uppercuts you out of his house, and leaves you out by the bridge. 
which is actually kind of helpful. I mean, it saves you some time. And also, how come his bridge isn't in 3D? Red's bridge is in 3D. How come his isn't? This is I, I, stupid. How? I guess we know who the better brother is. Anyways, now with the bridge up, we can finally end chapter 1-2. Moving on. Chapter 1-3, The Sands of Yold. Starting off 1-3, we have a new power-up, the Speed Flower. It temporarily boosts your speed and you'll earn triple XP and coins while it's active. Although, sometimes they give you this power-up at like the worst times and it just becomes more of a nuisance than anything. There's also some new enemies around here, like the zombie stream you just saw there. They'll pop out of question mark blocks when you hit them, and upon defeation, you drop a lot of coins. On top of those, there's the bald clef too. I actually have a bit of defense you gotta worry about. Best way to handle these guys is to pick them up with throw and throw them into other enemies. Or if no other enemies are around, toss them into a sand pit to kill them. And there's also the boom boxes, who shoot a sonic wave projectile at you, which deals 2 damage. They can be a bit of a nuisance since, you know, they have a projectile and all, but they're not too bad. Jawbuffs are interesting, the only way you can defeat them is by flipping into 3D to get behind them and jump on their weak spot. It's a fun way to combine combat with the 3D mechanic. Gerbils, they spew a pink sleeping gas at you. If you fall asleep, keep shaking the Wii Remote to snap out of it. There's also a blue variant that shoots an ice gas at you, and if you get frozen, same deal, just keep shaking the Wii Remote to snap out of it. And yes, their enemy design is ass. Last but not least is the Spike Goomba. Although maybe it is least because there's only one in this entire level and it's just stuck in 3D all by itself. You can't even defeat it unless you grab an enemy and throw one at it. It's just here? I don't... I don't know why it's here, but it's there. So that's all the new stuff out of the way, but how does this level actually play? Well, it's essentially just one big puzzle. You gotta figure out what to do. There's a hidden pathway that reveals an ancient structure that has some text written on it that tells you to jump underneath this bomb tree ten times. Uh, and you actually don't need to read the text, you can just do this immediately if you already know what to do, but... You know. Throughout the level, there's plenty of enemies and secrets to find, and there's another puzzle you gotta solve using throw, but eventually you'll make it here. The first boss is here, and it's oh chunks. He has 20 HP and one attack. If you get too close, he'll grab you and hurl you. The best way to handle him is to use throw. Pick him up and toss him, and he'll be stunned, allowing you to get in an easy free hit. Once you defeated him, he'll blast off. The rest of the level is much of the same. Find this old signpost to get the hint. Press one and minus on this blue pedestal, and you'll finish up chapter one three. Chapter 1-4, Monster of the Ruins. Quickly, let's just get the new crap out of the way. Buzzy Beetles, they behave like they do in 2D Mario. Spiky Trumps, they're more of an obstacle than an enemy. They're invincible and just are a hurt box that you have to avoid. Alright, that's it. 1-4 combines all the abilities you have up to this point into one big level. You've got to use your 3D mechanic to solve puzzles. You've got to use the row to solve puzzles. Hell, you've even got to use Tippy to solve puzzles. It's a fun and engaging level and is also a nice change of pace, having a lot of smaller, more condensed rooms compared to the previous levels that have a large open lands of space. I would go more in depth, but I'm pretty sure you get the idea. You're in the old ruins, it's puzzly, it's got tricks, it's got traps, it's got the whole shebang, and it's got stairs. Incredible. Up the stairs and through the pipe and we're out of the old ruins. But wait, there's more. Meet Fractale. He looks big and scary, but don't worry. He's just here to defend the beer heart and was created by the ancients to do so. 
he recognizes that you're the hero and lets you on through. But wait! It's Dementio! Just as Fractal is gonna let you on through to get that pure heart, Dementio pops up and he zaps Fractal and messes with his code to make him evil. Now, Dementio may have turned Fractal evil, but he kind of sucks at it, because Fractal is super easy for the last boss of this chapter. All you gotta do is flip into 3D in this one section where he charges at you, hop on his back, and then throw these frackles at him by using throw. Once you've hit him three times, he'll do a loop-de-loop -loop to try and get you off his back. If you fall down, it's fine, you just need to repeat that previous phase to get back on, but if you're good enough, you can jump on him anyways, and you don't have to redo that phase, and you can just keep doing what you're doing. Hit him another three times, he'll do another loopy loop. Hit him another three times, and he goes down in a pretty violent fashion, to be honest. He may be a robot, but he has bones for some reason. I don't know. After defeating Fractale, you go to claim your pure heart and meet a character named Merlamina. She's part of the Ancients and tells you all about the pure hearts, how they came to be, stuff about her past, and she just goes on and on and on, and Mario and Tippy fall asleep, and there's a lot of text to read that I read and I don't remember it, but it's like story stuff, but you know, she gives you the pure heart. Now that we've got our second pure heart, let's check back in with our good pal Count Black. After O-Chunks got chunked, he got chucked back to Count the Black, where he proves that the hero is real, cause he got beat up. Count Black sets a trap for our heroes while Nastasia goes and swashes out the resistance, and also gives O-Chunks a scolding while she's at it. I don't know what tweaks or chin airs means, but it sounds funny. We cut to the exterior of Count Black's castle to find that Princess Peach and some of Bowser's minions are still alive. Turns out a bunch of Bowser's minions have been brainwashed to work for Count Black. Taking control of Peach, you head back into Count Black's castle to see the captain of the resistance get brainwashed as well. After wandering around Count Black's castle for a bit, you get stuck at a dead end and right before Peach is gonna get brainwashed, she just Teleports away somehow. Huh. Anyways, after that, we get this story about some guy that, like, got hurt and then this human girl helped him, even though she's supposed to be disgusted by him because he's part of the Dark Tribe or whatever. But, like, I don't know, it's probably not important. Someone probably just left her, like, fan fiction in the game on accident. With the second pure heart obtained, Mario returns back to Flipside to show it to Merlin. Who gives us a bit more information about Merlimina, who apparently wrote the Light Prognosticus. That's cool. However, Merlin gets interrupted by our boy Skeet, who tells him that a girl fell out of the sky, and Merlin and him rush over to loot the body. Turns out, though, that the body is of Princess Peach, and since Mario knows who Princess Peach is, unfortunately for Skeet and Merlin, they can't loot the body. Peach is knocked out cold, so Merlin suggests you add an over to a saffron to cook up a spicy soup, which can be made with a fire burst. You give her the spicy soup, and she awakes. She catches up on what's been going on all this time, and Merlin tells you where you're going to be going next, because apparently you're going to be meeting someone named the Mysterious Merli, who just like Merlin and Bastovius are the sentence of the ancients. After that, Peach joins your party, which means, yeah, she's a permanent party member you get to use throughout the game, which is pretty cool. So you explore Flipside looking for the beer heart, and obviously eventually you find it, and boom, bada bang, you got the second door. Chapter 2-1, Fogging to Merlees. Yeah, we're really starting to cut the crap here. 
trying to blaze through this game as quickly as possible. Oh, if we are cutting the crap, then that would imply that this game is crap, because that's the part we're cutting it, which is the opposite of what I'm trying to do in this video. I'm overanalyzing this analogy. Chapter 2-1 is a level. And that's all I have to say on it. Okay, there's a bit more to it than that, but it is still a very basic platforming level, but this time with a few parts designed for Peach. It's just getting you used to using her parasol ability and gives you a chance to view her pal pill and mega star forms. Speaking of power ups, we've got a new one, the slow flower. Behaves just like you think it would. Counterpart to the speed flower, instead of speeding up time, it slows it down. It's helpful for platforming sections, but uh, just like the speed flower, sometimes it's more of a nuisance than anything. There's a few new enemies as well, like Cheep Cheeps, who are fish and behave like fish. There's Grow Mebas, who clone themselves. To defeat them, you just have to defeat the original one, but you can wait for them to multiply a ton and then use a screen new like an ice storm and get a bunch of XP, but I'm usually too impatient to do that. And lastly, there's the Schlurps, who can't be jumped on and throw doesn't do anything to them. So how do you defeat them? Oh, with the fancy new Pixel, of course! Meet Boomer, this stubborn Facebook-using millennial-hating bomb, well, you know, is a bomb and gives Mario and Peach all the abilities of a terrorist. Using Boomer, you can blast your way through the rest of the level, and if you turn to 3D at the very end, there's a little shaky team, you can hop on down, get some cards. There's also some swoopers, and they didn't really fit in with the rest of the enemies, because I forgot them, so I didn't throw them in here. End of chapter! Chapter 2-2! Two -two. Tricks, treats, traps. 2-2 two -two starts off outside of Merle's mansion. Heading inside, you'll find these new enemies named Nips. They're guard dogs and will chase after you even in 3D. And are invincible. If you get caught by one, they'll kick you out of the mansion. You also find Merle's handmaid, Mimi. Although, as we know, Mimi's working for Count Black, so this definitely isn't her handmaid. But Mario and Peach don't know that yet, so they're oblivious, but I find it weird that we're showing Mimi's true form just right here. There's no, like, dramatic reveal for, like, a boss fight or something. This is just shown. I don't know, I always found that weird. Heading a bit further to the right, you'll find a Nah, who's just a beefed up nip. It's chained up to a locked door, so you gotta try and free it, because, I mean, what else are you gonna do? Maybe told you not to go in any of the other doors, but, of course, you're Mario and Peach, so you do. Although, maybe Mimi was just trying to be helpful, because three of these four doors are completely useless. They've just got tricks, treats, and traps. Oh, I get it now. Most of these rooms just lead you into pits with nothing special besides a couple enemies you have to defeat. Although one room does have a new enemy in the form of Boos, who only approach you when you're looking away, and when you do look at them, they'll turn invisible so you can't hit them, which can make them a bit harder to fight. The only door of interest here is the door farthest to the right. Going inside, there's seemingly nothing here, but if you press a button, a spike ceiling appears and slowly falls down onto you giving you a lot of time to rethink your life choices. Solution to this is just to turn into 3D. As per usual, jumping on top of the spike ceiling will take you up to a mini puzzle section with a key at the end of it. You can then use this key to free the Gnaw from earlier. We'll then attack Mimi and she'll run away being scared and stupid. And I would show you footage of this, but the footage got corrupted for some reason, so you're just gonna have to use your imagination. Oh yeah, also, END OF CHAPTER! CHAPTER 2-3 BREAKING THE BANK Starting off 2-3, we make it deeper into Merle's mansion and immediately break a vase. Mamie's back now and we owe her 1 million rubies. How do we get these rupees? Well, as she puts it, ENJOY LABOR! This is one of the more interesting levels in this game. It's certainly a standout, so I'll take you through a quick rundown. Throughout the mansion, you'll find these enslaved creatures called gerbils. A couple of them, for a few rubies, will give you some juicy info, and they earn those rubies 
you have to do, well, literal manual labor. For each energy pellet you collect by hitting this block, you'll earn one ruby. And you want about a hundred. And one of them. Once you're done laboring away, there's two gerbils you can talk to. This guy, who for just one ruby will tell you that there's a hidden passageway in the mansion. Pretty useful tip for just one ruby. And there's another guy who for a hundred rubies will tell you a four digit passcode to get into the PREMIUM LABOR ROOM! Punch that bad boy into the wall and enjoy the luxuries of premium enslavement. In your fancy new labor room, you can earn rubies ten times as fast. For each electrical pellet you produce, you'll earn ten rubies opposed to one ruby. And instead of hitting a block over and over again, you get to run in a hamster wheel. FOREVER! There's one last gerbil yet to talk to, and he's a bit harder to find, being in 3D. For 10,000 rubies, he'll give you the juiciest of info. And this is what you need all your rubies for. Working in this hamster wheel and getting 10,000 takes a while. Though. Eventually, once you have enough rubies, you can go talk to him, give him the rubies, get the code, but where to use it? Well, there's this area up top, but it's got this electrical fence in front of it. So how do you get past it? Oh, you already know. It's time for a new pixel, baby! Meet Slim! As his name implies, he'll make it super slim, even though you're literally paper, so like you already are. So it's kind of a weird ability. But like, whatever! He makes you slim, and when you stop when you're using him, Completely stop, you'll become invisible and invincible. Although, you know, you have to like stop, so it's not that useful, but it's it's good for puzzles. Using Slim, you can make it past the electrical fences and all that, punch in that passcode, and earn one million rubies. Yeah. Upon paying off your one million ruby debt, Mimi fucking explodes blowing your guts all over the room in a horrific, gory violence. You can also use Slim in 3D to get past stuff that you'd normally be too thick for. End of chapter! Chapter 2-4 The Basement Face-Off Turn the damn page already, come on! Now that we're in the basement of Merle's mansion, we finally get to meet the woman of the hour, Merle herself. She tells us that her power is fading, and that she also only speaks in rhymes, which you think might get old, but it's only for this one level, so I like it. As for the level itself, it's one big maze filled with lots of doors, enemies, and secret passageways. Once you're out of the maze, you'll find Merle once again, who tells you that for 10 million rubies you can earn yourself the pure heart. But don't be deceived, for this is not the true Merle. Turns out this fake Merle is once again Mimi. It turns into this. I don't. I don't like it. So, uh, yeah, you run away from that. You go into another maze section and make it to the bathrooms. Oh, there's some new enemies. New enemies! Mr. Eyes are pretty cool. You defeat them just how you would in Mario 64 by turning into 3D. Which is just a pretty cool enemy to include in this game. Curse yes, if you walk into them, they'll cause a status effect. For example, this one causes slowness. There's tons of these guys throughout the game that are different colors and cause different status effects, so, uh, yeah, don't run into them. And big boos. They're big boos. Boos, but big. You get the idea. Heading into the woman's bathroom, we find the real Merle, hiding in a toilet. But soon afterwards, we meet up with Mimi once again, and we have a Merle melee. Only kidding, instead we get a Merle game show! Figure out which Merle is the real one by asking interesting questions. You get some fun dialogue, doesn't matter what questions you ask though, the real Merle is always the one that's got the fly. You pick it, it's the real one, you win! Your reward for beating this game show is a boss fight against Mimi. 
she transforms back into her spider form. She doesn't have a specified amount of HP or anything, it's just a certain amount of hits. To deal damage to, you jump on her head, or you can throw the ruby she spits out back at her. Your reward for beating your reward is a pure heart from Merly, as you would come to expect. And with that being said and done, that finishes up chapter two. Yeah, done here. Say goodbye. No more Merle, no more mansion. And the next chapter is uh pretty interesting. It's pretty, it's pretty good. Pretty fun. Aw, oh, snippity snap. It's Count Black and he's with Nastasia and O-Chunks. O-Chunks had to write a 1,000 page essay, which is just kind of funny. Count Black summons Dementio and tells him to go after the heroes. O-Chunks wants to tag along. Stasia goes to take us out some rebel scum. Typical Count Black stuff. Wow. Okay. That's new. You're goddamn right, that's Luigi sitting right there on the ground, and you're goddamn right. He's playable in a Paper Mario game. Luigi gets found by these two Goombas, and they start to explore Count Black's castle. Just like Peach, and honestly most of the section is just a copy and paste from Peach's section, down to the fact that they get cornered. Next, we get one of gaming's saddest moments, where we see Gary the Goomba get hypnotized to work for Count Black. R.I.P. Gary the Goomba, he truly was a mad lad. Unlike his fucking partner over here who just bails and switches to Count Black's side like an asshole. Unfortunately for Luigi though, he gets gangbanged by Count Black's minions and is never heard from again. Ugh, more fan fiction. Anyways, we're back in Flipside and ready to find another hard pillar. By now, you've probably gotten the gist of this game. Finish a chapter, get the pure heart, use your abilities from the previous chapter to find the heart pillar. Place your pure heart in the heart pillar, which will unlock a door, go on that door, rinse, and repeat. Now while that's all you have to do in order to just beat the game, there's tons of other stuff you can do in Flipside, and at least to me, part of the fun of playing Super Paper Mario is Flipside. Just Talking to everyone you can talk to, exploring, finding secrets, all that good stuff. One of the returning challenges from Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door is the Pit of a Hundred Trials, which you can unlock and attempt after beating Chapter 2. So, as a way to kind of spruce up this playthrough of Super Paper Mario, I decided to attempt the Pit of a Hundred Trials as soon as possible, which had some uh, consequences. The way the Pit of a Hundred Trials works is, get this, you go through a hundred rooms. In each of those rooms, there are a bunch of enemies. One enemy has the key to get out of the room and head on to the next one, while all the rest have got nothing. The rooms are laid out in a very maze-like fashion, making it difficult to get to certain enemies. And there's also a five-minute timer, though it's very generous. Venturing through 100 rooms, each with a multitude of various enemies, some of which, once you get later on into the maze, can deal upwards of 2, 3, even 4 damage, makes the difficulty stem not from the timer, but from just survivability. Uh, it's a lot of enemies to fight, and the key mechanic's just there to force you to fight them, while being lenient enough that you don't have to fight every single enemy. Now, I say there's 100 rooms, and there is, but you really only have to worry about 90 of them, because every 10th floor is a break room where you'll get a card of one of your pixel partners, which is just kind of like a mini reward for making it this far into the bit of 100 trials. And there's also, sometimes, this guy named Flynn who will sell you just some random stuff like healing items or screen nukes or whatever. Now, I would love to say that I beat the bit of 100 trials on my first attempt as early as possible, but I didn't. Want to know how I died? Well, I'll show ya!
fuck was I supposed to know that would happen? I use the mystery box. Oh, I get a shell shock, an item which I have never used in this game before. I mean, like, okay, I have. But every time I have, I always fail this godforsaken act drink, man. So I actually do it well for once, so that's cool. Yeah, it's all big turtle shell, cool. I kick it, it bounces off of nothing. Ricochets back at me and deals 10 damage? 10? What the hell? I had exactly 10 HP, so I died. No, 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 but don't worry. Don't worry. He killed the fuzzy, which had the key in it. Great. I'm so happy for me. Well, a skip, hop, jump, and an hour and a half of my life I'm never getting back later. We've arrived at the end of the bit of 100 trials. So what do we get for going through all of that? A cookie, a brownie, a kiss on a cheek, a will to live? Nope. None of that. You get Racktail. Behold him and all of his reused asset glory. And I really do mean reused. He's literally just a reskin of Racktail, just a little bit harder. In all fairness, the jump is pretty big. Racktail deals 10 damage opposed to Fractail's 1. And the frackles on his back, or as they're called now, rackles, also deal 10 damage and have 10 HP. So, you better watch your step, because 10 damage is a lot. On top of that, each racktail phase takes 10 hits instead of 3, making the fight quite a bit longer. But it's still pretty damn easy. Your reward for beating the pit of 100 trials is actually a new pixel called Dashel. Does exactly what you think it would. Hold down one and you'll go super fast. And it is a very, very welcome addition to this game. So about those uh, consequences I mentioned. Look at my HP here. Look at my HP now. Jesus Christ. I got a total of six level ups from the Pit of 100 Trials. Which is a lot. It makes the rest of the game go from a cakewalk to like a fucking cake crawl. Which is why I don't recommend if this is your first time playing through the game that you do this, because... Yeah. But, if you're a veteran player of this game, then I highly recommend doing it. It's a great way to spice up a playthrough, and having Dashel so early on just makes the game just more enjoyable on a repeat playthrough. Anyways, um... Where were we again? Alright! Chapter 3-1! When Geeks Attack! Well, this is really pretty cool. It's an 8-bit aesthetic. I like it. Very retro. Very neat. SURPRISE! Butterfly Napper! We've got a zoo file in our case and he's stolen Tippy and made off with it. A shocking start for sure. But don't worry, our nerves are calmed from Barry, who is hiding in a berry bush. I bet the programmers had a fucking fiesta when they made that joke. Anyhow, Barry tells us that that geek freak zoo file motherfucker is named Francis, and that he's wanted in several countries. And he gives us some tips on how to get to him that all involve the color red for some reason. He also tells us that if we do manage to get to Francis and beat him up to A, turn him into the police, and B, come back to him. And with that being said, we can actually start the level now. With it being a retro-inspired level, there's a lot of returning enemies. We've got Piranha Plants, Hammer Bros, Magic Koopas. There's also some new ones, like these Blow Mebas, although they're just reskinned, stronger version of Grow Mebas, so I guess they're not that new. But there's also these Koopa and Toopa Strikers that'll kick Koopa shells at you. Which is. There's something. It's pretty unique, honestly. There's also a new variant of the Curses, these gray guys. Don't touch them, they send you back to Flipside. It's awful, bad, and horrible. Just don't touch them. And there's a lot of great segments there at this level. It feels like the designers had a lot of fun with it. There's a segment where this Koopa Troopa finds a Mega Star and uses it and becomes a Mega 8-bit Koopa. And then to defeat it, you get your own Mega Star and kick its ass. And it's just, it's really fun. 
One of Barry's tips said to fall between two red pipes, and what do you know, you fall down these two red pipes and you end up in 1-2. It's pretty cool, especially being able to explore the area in 3D. It's even got stuff like the differently colored Goombas, which are apparently called Gloombas? Not Galoombas, Gloombas, it's different and it's odd. But yeah, it's pretty fun, they've even got Warp Zone, which is cool. Using Warp Zone, you can make it to this big open field, and to the right of it are some castles. Hmm. Side note, I managed to get over the side of this castle by using bullet bills, which, oh yeah, bullet bills are in this game too. And there's like nothing over here, there's some enemies that you can defeat now, and there's also just a random question mark block with a coin in it. I guess as just a consolation prize? It's... It's just really weird. What you're supposed to do to that castle is blow it up, revealing none other than King of All Koopas, Bowser. Bowser's not too happy that you blow up his awesome castle, and also at the fact that you're Mario. So he challenges you to a duel and to defeat you once and for all. Do you see what I mean about this game being piss easy and also being over leveled at the same time? It's not a great combination. After stomping on a uh, Koopa, it pierces me tries to convince Bowser to join her and Mario. But Bowser's not having any of it. In this game, Bowser's just a big whiny baby. He says maybe he'd help them for Princess Peach, but there's no way he's helping Mario. He's always trashing his awesome plans and that he's grade A 100% prime cut final boss. He's gonna take over the world any day now. He's just, he's just a great character. I also like how it's not Peach that convinces Bowser to join. It's actually Mario who makes the point that if Count Black destroys all worlds, there won't be any worlds left to rule, which is enough to finally convince Bowser to join the party. As a character, Bowser is much bigger than Mario and Peach and is also a lot slower, but he has a ranged attack in the form of his fire breath, and also has a doubled attack stat as if that weren't enough. He is a very, very powerful character. And, uh, oh yeah, also, are we gonna end of chapter ourselves? Whatever that means. Chapter 3-2! Bloops, ahoy! Welcome to this game's first and only underwater level. Uh, kind of, you'll see what I mean later. It's the tile pool, you're underwater, and just like with Peach, the first level that you can truly play through with Bowser is very well designed for the character because Bowser can breathe fire underwater for some reason, which allows him to make quick work of the underwater enemies here. Bloopers are here, which is kinda neat, and Cheap Cheeps are here as well. We've already seen Cheap Cheeps, but these ones are green and are fully underwater this time. It's not like you can jump on them or anything. So yeah, it's a solid underwater level that works really well because of Bowser. But you know what else is solid? Our new pixel! Meet Thudley. The first thing he does is check out your girthitude. Overall, Peach scores a 1 million on the girthitude scale. And Thudley instantly joins our party due to Peach's sheer girthness. So, what can our new girthy friend do for us? Well, he gives us the ground pound ability, lets us peg down pegs, but also ground pound enemies underwater. You can't jump on enemies underwater, but I guess the ground pound is strong enough to break through the sheer force of the aquatic nature. Using Thuddily, we can traverse further into the aquatic depths of the tile pool. We find these new fish enemies called Bitakudas. I don't know, they're really weird looking, they only appear here. They're just big ass fish, and speaking of big ass sea creatures, that's big ass sea creature. Meet Big Boy Bloop, he is the biggest of bloops, and to defeat him, you must burn his red tentacle. Which was a hint from Barry, as per usual, Barry's the best, who doesn't love Barry? I love Barry. We defeat the bloop. Rest in peace, Big Bloop. You son of a bitch. And on that somber note, we end chapter 3 2.
Chapter 3-3 Up, up, and a tree! This level stinks! But in a good way. You wanna see why this level stinks? That's why this level stinks. 3-3 is this game's first vertical level, and it won't be its last. Because of how knockback works in this game, when you take damage from an enemy, it makes it very easy to fall off, go all the way down, and lose a bunch of your progress. Which stinks! But like I said, I kinda like it. Don't get me wrong, losing all your progress still sucks. But relative to the rest of the game, I feel like it works. It's nice to have one of these levels that everyone can agree upon. Yeah, this level sucks, it's difficult, it's annoying. And I can kind of appreciate for that. Most of the time in this game, losing is a choice, like with Pyramithra and Smash Bros. So, you know, changing that up for once, I like it. Don't get me wrong though, it's still very annoying. I mean, like, it's fine, but you know, it's not getting a Christmas card or anything. New enemies, we've got the poison gas gerbil. This thing is peak enemy design. I want a poster of it. Dialoids slither around the floor, wall, and ceiling, making them difficult to kill sometimes. They also come in a variety of colors, each with their own HP, attack, and speed. So, you know, watch out for those tiloids. Crazy daisies fucking suck. They're annoying and stupid. If you get hit by their freaking music note projectile, you'll either fall asleep, or if you get hit in the air, you'll take loads of knockback. And in this level, you'll probably fall down, because that's how this level works. And they're a big reason why this level sucks. And I hate them, and they're stupid. Uh, you can also find, like, a Maisy Daisy sometime. They're rare. Uh, they have loads of attack, and they're uh, just uh, scary. And lastly, there's two returning 2D Mario enemies. First of which is Lakitu, who works just like you think he would, with the exception being that you can't take his cloud like you can in normal 2D Mario, and Chain Chomp, so you can actually deal damage to in this game. Those are spinies, because Lakitu's buttons, the spinies, they, they work how you had you think. Okay, to the level at hand, you ascend the dotwood tree filled with lots of tricks, traps, and puzzly switch puzzles. Once you make it to the top, though, you are greeted with a familiar foe. Dementio is back, but this time there's no robot super dragon for him to control. Instead, he's gonna fight you face to face. He takes you to the D dimension, which he claims makes him 256 times more powerful. But I don't believe him because this boss fight is still pretty easy. He tries to summon squares, which if you get caught in will explode. But even with Bowser, they're still pretty easy to dodge. He'll shoot magic at you, sometimes he summons a clone of himself as well. It's still pretty easy though, so, you know, he probably should have just stuck to mind control. After defeating him, he teleports away. What a coward. Huh. Well, that's a little suspicious. <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing important. We carry on upwards the tree, hop on the red wind just like Barry said, and we sail our way to the end of chapter 3-3. Chapter 3-4, The Battle of Fort Francis. Now that we're finally at Fort Francis, we get to see what the geek's been up to. And it is very surprising that this game did not get an E10 enough. Seriously, Kirby gets one, but not this? Uh, Jesus. There is quite a bit to talk about in this stage, and if you've played it before, you know what I mean. So let's just cover the uh, gameplay first. It's pretty standard. It's a normal puzzle level. You need some keys, you need some passcodes, you talk to some guys, there's some puzzles to solve. You get the idea. There's some fun enemy sections, I suppose, but still, very basic. It's pretty bog standard for this game. You do get a new pixel, which is cool, named Carrie. And I'm just gonna tell you this right now, Bowser plus Carrie is broken, and I mean that wholeheartedly. It, like, you remember what I said about this game being a cakewalk and then a cake crawl? 
with Bowser and Carrie, it's like a cake stand. You're not even moving at this point. That's how much of a cake this is. What Carrie does is, well, Carrie lets you go over spiked things and also lets you jump on spiked enemies. But it also increases your speed, which is nice. And also, since you're constantly on a platform, since you jump on Carrie to use Carrie, Bowser can breathe fire in the air now, which is just absurd. Like, that was kind of a weakness of his before. But now it's not. And it's just like. <sighs> So that's the gameplay side of things, but the actual level itself is great. There is so much great text here. It's a geek's paradise. All of the fucking robots are cats. There's made cats. The enemies are cats. It's super funny. There's quizzes about like anime and action figures because they're action figures, not dolls. Yeah, I agree game. I fucking, I get it. There's posters of, like, Paper Mario characters and stuff. No, there's just lots of Nintendo references in this place. And like I said before, there is so much great dialogue and text. I really recommend just looking around and trying to read everything you can, because it's, it's great stuff. And also, it's made ten times funnier by the fact that this is a Mario game. This was allowed. Like, how? I mean, I guess they also did this, so I guess I, I'm not too surprised. And to top it all off, you can only enter Francis's room if you are a, quote, total hot babe, which is Princess Peach for some reason. I thought it'd be Bowser. To enter his room after taking the quiz, which all the answers are true, by the way, and he starts freaking out that there's a total hot babe in his room. What are you doing with your hand, man? Quit it! He then takes you into a dating sim. What the fuck? This is in a Mario game. How is this not E10 and up? Kirby, mild cartoon violence. This is mild sexual harassment. Unfortunately, you cannot actually get together with Francis. Eventually, no matter what, Peach will eventually use Boomer and blow everything up. After destroying his graphics card, he takes Tippy away, and you are forced to fight Francis. Although, he's not that difficult. He flashes you with his camera, he spawns these Meow Bomb guys, he tries to bore you- God, why this guy? I've all- fucking kill him already. Upon defeating Francis, Tippy reappears, and somehow births a pure heart. Apparently, there was some kind of seal on the pure heart. And by Tippy saying Mario and being filled with love, that's how it was broken. End of chapter! It's time for everyone's favorite intermission. What's Count Black up to? Well, as for his minions, not much. Dementia tells him how the heroes beat them, or they might be strong enough to defy the prophecy. Count Black's like, ah. No, it's fine. We'll set him on these guys, whoever him is, and all his goons scatter off. We then get an interesting conversation from Count Black Anastasia, where she's like, Ah, oh, you know, it's not too late, you can still change your mind. And Count Black's like, No, we have to do this, but if you want to leave, that's fine, you can do that. And she's like, No, no, I've sworn my life to you, I'll just I'll stick it out. You get the idea. And yet again, we get more of Dementio being a sneaky sneakster, spying in on conversations he shouldn't be in, clearly being up to something, but who knows what. Uh, more fan fiction about a girl named Timpani and a guy named Lumiere, and oh, oh, our love doesn't work, oh, we must part, goodbye. I don't know why they put this in the game. Well, that was awful. Man, that place sucks. Stupid Bitlands had a motherfucking zoo file in it. Anyways, let's go right back in. Chapter 3 1! We're doing this one again! Trust me, we're here for a good reason. 
Just like Barry said, once we beat the zoo file guy, come back and talk to him. We've beaten the zoo file guy, we come back and talk to him, and what do you know, he joins our party because he is a pixel after all, because he does have gay text. So, what can Barry do? Well, he spawns a spiky shield around you that protects you from enemies, and also does a bit of damage, it's, it's pretty helpful. Like Dashiell, he's optional, so you don't really need to use him for anything in particular, he's just here if you want him. And unlike Dashiell, you don't have to go through the pit of 100 trials to get him, you can just beat chapter 3. So that's neat. We can leave now though. Now that we're actually back on flip side, beer heart, heart pillar, door, go and door, what fun! Chapter 4-1 Into Outer Space That's right, we're going to space. This actually predates Mario Galaxy, which is kind of fun. Um, but Mario and friends can't breathe in space. That's, that's a problem. Tippy just kind of, well, freaks out because Mario's in space, can't breathe, don't know what to do. And she just somehow teleports everyone out of space? I don't know how she did that. I mean, I guess she did something similar in the beginning of the game, but like, still seems a little weird. So, we can't breathe in space. That sucks. We go talk to Merlin. He says that he had something that was like a space helmet we could use, but he just gave it away to some random boy. So we've gotta go find that boy and explain the situation. Turns out that boy's on the third floor and his name is Pook. He's using the helmet Merlin gave him as a fishbowl for Captain Gills. But Captain Gills is getting too big for the bowl, and Pook wants him to be set free. So he gives us the bowl with the fish yet inside, but we have to go find a place for Captain Gills to live. Head on into the basement and there's a body of water you can dump Captain Gills into. And there you go, you have the space helmet, now you can actually do chapter 4, but I really like this mini side quest. There's not many times where you're forced to talk to NPCs in this game, and it really sucks because a lot of the NPCs have some great dialogue that you just are bound to miss because the NPCs do like nothing in this game. Anyways, chapter 4-1! We can actually play it this time. Now that we have our space helmets, we can finally breathe in, in space. Imagine that. Or you can just deny to put it on over and over again, in which case you'll get a game over. What fun. But with it on, we can explore space, the final frontier. Well, more like the halfway point, actually. Anyways, yeah, it's a space level in a Mario game, before Mario Galaxy. Well, I guess also Super Mario Land 2 did that, so I guess that also predates Mario Galaxy. I always feel like Mario Galaxy is like, oh, it's Mario in space, that's so cool, they've never done that before, but like, no, they actually have done that before. Anyways, uh, space. You find an SOS signal, you follow it to its source, see some sparkly bits, use your tippy pointer on it to reveal a spaceship. And inside of that spaceship is a little tiny alien guy. Meet Squirps, he's a tiny little alien guy. And he knows about the pure heart, and also the fact that we're looking for the pure heart, which is kind of interesting, but he somehow knows that. Tippy immediately starts accusing him of being allied with Count Black and demanding answers. But Squirp says no, he's just a normal, regular alien guy. And that if you want the pure heart, you're gonna have to follow him. Because he's the captain and you are a space grunt. And they agree. Apparently all we have to do in order to get to the pure heart is Squirp, which is warping, but with more Squirps. So we give Squirps all of our energy and power so that he can squirt out a Squirp warp. And take us to the pure heart. Although, of course, it's not that easy. Apparently, we don't have enough energy to make it all the way to the pure heart. So, we've gotta walk, or in this case, space swim, the rest of the way. 
Don't worry though, Squirps is gonna help us out by pressing 2. We can fire a super squirt beam at enemies to defend ourselves in space. And by space swim, it really does mean space swim. Space controls very similarly to how water worked in the tile pool. I guess you don't have to press 2 to like swim or anything, but still, it's basically the same thing. So yeah, it's an underwater level coated in a nice space paint. And I really like it. Underwater levels in 2D Mario games are usually pretty hit or miss. Some are good, some are bad, some are just okay. It's a pretty big mixed bag. But I really like this approach to it. I mean, maybe this wasn't even going to be an underwater level at first. I like to think that it was, because I don't know, it just feels like it is. Maybe it was always supposed to be space. But regardless, it's using underwater controls as a space shooter. And it just works really, really well. And it's such a nice break from the previous levels, which were primarily platforming and puzzles. So it's just like, shoot things, you know? With this level taking place in space, you'd expect to find some alien-like creatures that are enemies. And you'd be exactly right, we've got these jellion guys that swim after Mario, these photons that can shoot pellets at you, and warpids that, well, warp. They're all good enemies that work pretty well within the environments. And with that being said, the rest of the level is pretty much just a straight shot forward, so... End of chapter! CHAPTER 4-2 A PAPER EMERGENCY I hope you didn't enjoy space swimming because we are immediately back to platforming. But in space. Squirp says that somewhere on this planet should be the space byway which will take us to the pure heart. However, Squirps forgot where it is. So, we gotta look for clues to find out where it is. And the bastard has to go to the bathroom. Fortunately for Squirps, there's a bathroom right here. Unfortunately for Squirps, there's a guy in the bathroom who doesn't have any toilet paper and has been waiting for some for over a hundred years. Jesus Christ. While Squirps waits to go to the bathroom, we explore the planet looking for clues and fighting a variety of new enemies. You've got these weird guys called Longators who stretch their bodies to attack you. Choppas, which fly around and can flip between dimensions. we got Beatboxers, which are just the other boxer guys, but stronger. we got Fuzzies, which are kind of cool, I guess. It's cool that they're in this game. They're not very strong though. And hooligans, which are kind of like space wigglers. They have a segmented body and jump around. You can only attack like their head. I don't know, they're kind of weird. All the enemies here are weird. The cool thing about this stage is the anti-gravity. It gives you big jumps. You can make giant leaps. But the second thing about this level is it uses that to like put you in pits. I don't mean like the, you know, you fall in and take one damage pits. No, I just mean pits. You just fall in and you have to slowly jump your way out of them. And it gets very, very annoying. So, what about these clues we're looking for? Well, for starters, there's a dimensional space rift hanging above this statue. Is it a statue? Is it just a rock? I forget. I don't know. It's, it kind of reminds me of, like, Mario. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but, yeah, there's that. And there's also these blobule creatures that you'll find throughout the level. We got weird belly buttons. You talk to them and they tell you to go to their elder. There's, there's, there's Among Us and Super Paper Mario. So you go and talk to the elder, and he says that he was once a space treasure hunter, and then he found a clue to big treasure, and for a thousand coins he'll give it to you. But you can haggle him down to only 10. So you take the clue from the Blappy guy, you return to Squirps, and you give the ancient clue to the guy in the bathroom, and he uses it as toilet paper. And out pops Fleep. Squirps finishes up going to the bathroom, and now you can use Fleep to deal with that interdimensional space rip from before. 
which is basically a Fleet Spear purpose as a pixel, although you can also use them to like stun enemies, but like, why would you do that? It's not, it's just not that useful. Anyways, you get a door key from that space rift, and you can use it on a door, and I swear this door always, it's just in the weirdest spot, it takes me a long time to find it. I mean, it only took me like a minute of time to find it, but still a pure minute of just looking for one door because it's in this random pit. I hate it. Anyways, you go in the door, there's a cool looking tree and some fuzzies, and it's also the end of chapter. Chapter 4-3, The Gates of Space. We are now in the space byway, which leads to the woe zone, which should have the pure heart. But Squirps is getting a little hungry. I hope you did enjoy 4-1 because we are back to space swimming. Yeah, breaking bricks, shooting enemies, finding red X's, flipping them with Fleep, which reveals two pillars, and one of which has a weirdly squirped shaped hole through which we can squish squirps into which makes a door appear some reason i don't a weird idea but okay we head through the door and immediately find another red x to which we flip and reveal another pillar but this one's got two squirps holes in it and we've only got one squirps to be holded so we pop him in there and nothing happens and he says the only solution is to get him something good to eat. So we've gotta go get him something tasty to eat. Luckily for us, written on this sign is a very obvious hint. Sweet that starts with cho and ends with lit. Gee, I wonder. Taking the portal just right of those gates leads you to a big open room with well, lots of other portals. And a new enemy. Elegons, they're like hooligans from before, but they fly through space instead of just hopping around and stuff. They're not too bad to deal with, but keep in mind, throughout this section, you don't have squirps, so you're forced to use, like, Dudley and Boomer to deal damage towards enemies, which can be a little annoying. Come to think of it, though, could you use squirps in this section? Like, could you just ignore the gates and not use Fleep, but just, like, just use squirps? Because I wish I'd have done that if that were the case, because that would make this section a lot easier. Do that on your next playthrough of this place. Uh, anyways, go through one of these portals and it takes you to a convenience store that only sells chocolate bars for some reason, and yeah, you buy a chocolate bar and bring it back to Squirps. Keep in mind, uh, just be mindful of where you're going because it could be a little easy to get lost in this place. I mean, all the portals are pretty well identifiable. There's usually like hard blocks around them and stuff to signify which one is which, but still, I've gotten lost here before and it sucks. Got the chocolate bar, return back to Scripps and feed him the chocolate bar. And his reaction to it is, well, I, he really, really likes the chocolate bar. So much so that he creates a goddamn clone of himself. And then that opens the gate. And I'm left with more questions than answers. But hey, end of chapter, I guess. Chapter 4-4, The Mysterious Mr. L. Whoa, 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 welcome to the Woe Zone. And whoa, this place is quite the maze. Just like Squirp said, the pure heart should be around here somewhere, and he scurries off to go find it. Getting right into things, the Woe Zone has a couple of new faces. Pig rhythms, they're big pigs. Jump on them once, comes two pigs and a little fast. Jump on it another time, one pig even faster, and the third time it's defeated, dropping a whole bunch of coins. They're not too bad to deal with, although the last pig can be a little tricky to jump on sometimes. And lastly, berry bads. They're barry bads. I won't go with berry bads because of barrier. Like I said, they summon a barrier around them when you get too close and they'll start shooting rings at you. But you can get around the barrier by flipping into 3D. 
And, uh, yeah, that's it. I guess there are some new tiloid colors, but they're the same enemy, just different, like, HP and attack. The Woe Zone is a maze-like puzzle level similar to that of the Yold Ruins from Chapter 1, but a bit more complex this time. It does some interesting things like keeping doors in 3D so you have to flip in 3D to even see them. That's pretty fun. And the big mechanic for this level, these gravity blocks that when hit will change the direction of the gravity, which allows for some interesting level design and makes combat a bit more difficult than is just fun idea. What else could I say? It's a, just a solid Super Paper Mario level. After finding your way through the Woe Zone, plug that dimension key into that door so you can catch up with Squirps. Everything seems peachy keen until a mysterious voice is heard. Who could it be? And all of the sudden, well, bam! He appears, dressed in his green and black coated clothing. It's the one and only Green Thunder. A.K.A. Mr. L. Meet this mysterious mustachioed man. He kicks aside squirps and challenges us to a duel. He says he'll give us a burial at sea. Well, in space, that is. What a clever, cunning, and handsome man. Before he brawls, he bashes you with a beautifully written insult. Mr. L, he has 40 HP and 3 attack. He also has a super high jump that when you get hit by it, takes 6 damage opposed to 3. Quite the damage for this point in the game, wouldn't you say? Well, besides that, he's really not that big a deal. He's pretty easy to deal with. But he can heal himself using a super shroom shake, and, uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's, it's a fun thing, though. You can grab his super shroom using throw. And you can also grab him using throw, and then switch to Mario, and you can flip into 3D, throw him into 3D, and just leave him in the three-dimensional world, and you can't do anything about it. But he's really stupid easy, so don't worry about it. Once you've defeated him, he summons his partner in crime, and in blood. Brobot! This thing's got a whopping 255 HP, 4 attack, and 3 defense. And before you thought things could get even crazier, boom, we're in space now. Yeah, that's right. This blast boss takes place in space and you scripts to shoot him. This is what he meant by a burial in space, huh? You fly around collecting power-ups, shooting him, and unfortunately, before you know it, the boss fight's already over. But it was fun while it lasted. Now that we've defeated both Mr. L and his Brobot, he runs away, because he's, he's stupid, you know, he's bad. But hey, Squirps is here, if you remember him, yeah, he's, he's awake now. We head through the door, and find Squirps' mom, who's a statue. Apparently, Squirps is a prince, and this is his mom, Queen of Scorpia, a once great kingdom. She was given the duties to protect the pure heart and hid it in the woe zone so no one would find it. 1500 years ago, Scorps was put to sleep and only to awaken when the hero found him and to lead them to the pure heart. And that's just about what he did. It all makes sense in hindsight. With a new dazzling gleaming blue pure heart in hand, that's the end of chapter four. And what a chapter it was. Oh, did you, oh yeah, did that. End of chapter! Woohoo! Ah, quick check in with the count shows us that our good pal Mr. L is indeed working for our Blecky boy. Everyone else makes their usual departures, except for Nastasia, who's like, oh, you know, maybe. It's not just that funny, I could have been that girl, you know? And Count Black's like, no, you could never have replaced her, Nastasia. I need to destroy all the worlds to ensure she's gone. Jubamo! I hope you are enjoying this fan fiction that snuck into the game because Blue Air and Timpani just got married. That's nice. 
We are back in Flipside, ready to find the next heart pillar. And Tippy has a heart attack. We take her back to Merlin's place, and he explains that apparently Tippy wasn't always a pixel. He found her in her original form and was hanging by a thread. And he turned her into a pixel using his ancestor's magic. But apparently the four may be running out or something, so, uh... Cool, she might die. Anyways, heart pillar. For the time being, we just leave Tippy at Merlin's place. But, uh, here's the thing. There's no more heart pillars in Flipside. But, if you remember, in the basement there's an interdimensional space rift. Because there's always interdimensional space rifts in basements. You can use Fleep to flip... That and reveals a secret corridor. You go through it and it takes you to this weird altar place. It's got images of presumably the ancients that built Flipside or maybe ancestors, something like that. And a couple of blocks. All you gotta do is hit them there side to side. I didn't know that as a kid though, even though there's a hint right outside of this place that tells you to do that exact thing. It's like the most obvious hint in the world, but I just didn't read the sign. So I had stuck in it for a while, but yeah, hit it side to side. Glass shatters open, revealing a new area. It's flap side, baby! The flap to the flip, the flip to the flop. We've got an entirely new place to explore. That's right, this game's hub world is twice as big as you originally thought. Flop side is just flip side, but flipped. Everything's the same, just, in, you know, reverse. Ah, oh, left and right, right is left. All the characters got new characters with their own names and personalities and stuff. All the buildings are basically the same, but some of them are a little different than one another. And yeah, it's pretty cool. And now that we're in flop side, we can, gotta go find a heart pillar. Every character in flip side has a counterpart in flop side, including Merlin. Meet Nolrem. He is basically just Merlin again. He's great. He's got, like, a granny cloak under him. Still the magnificent stash, though. He tells you that, um... Yeah, apparently Flipside's always been this way. He's always got a flip in the flop. Apparently him and Merlin are the only two that know about the flippity floppity. He tells you to head up to the first floor because there's a heart pillar up there. Just like how there's a heart pillar in Flipside. Yeah, all the heart pillars and stuff are also flips, so... It's pretty easy to find him here. With the pure heart now in place, you know what that means at this point. We've got ourselves a new door, which means we've got ourselves a new chapter, which means we're gonna have a fun time. Chapter 5-1, Downtown of Craig. Welcome to Downtown Craig! Sorry though, you're in the sky. Meet the Cragnons! I really like these guys, they're all really stupid and dumb cavemen, and they use a lot of words with Crag, and they talk real funny, and they're some of my favorite NPCs in this game. These two Cragnons are talking about how, oh, the big rock that watches us, oh, it's so great, oh, but we're gonna die soon, all Cragnons go extinct, and whatnot, until all of a sudden, Bowser falls out of the sky, or whoever you're playing as, and they're like, what, who are you, you're in the sky, dude, and they pick you up and take you to their leader. The chief of the Kragnons tells you what's been going on. Apparently, a group called the Floro Sapiens have been kidnapping Kragnons and taking them away. And the Kragnons are about to go extinct because of it. And they ask you if you'll hook them up. 
And you do hook them up because we're just such swell guys. Suddenly, what the Craig? The Floro Sapiens are here, and they've come to take all the Kragnons. You gotta beat them up. You gotta take them down. They think you're like a rare breed, apparently, and they're like, "Well, we better get them," and you kick their ass because they're really weak. Unfortunately, we were a bit too late, as some of the Floro Sapiens have already made off with a bunch of Kragnons. So we chase after them to save the Kragnons. And the city is on lockdown, and you can like check the buildings, and they got like funny text. We venture into the outskirts of Cragtown to find some new enemies. Moon clefts, they're like classroom for, but they had spikes on their head and a bit better stats. There's also putrid piranhas who can poison you by spewing out a poisonous gas. Slurps, which are like slurps, except for they take two bombs instead of one. Where do you go with the slurps? I feel like we have. I don't know. If we have it, we have it. If we have, we have. And last but not least, 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 moths. These guys are big honking dudes. They got 100 HP and 5 attack, which is a lot. But they make for a great source of XP. I forgot to mention so many. They take like 3 trips to kill them. That's it. That, that's all they do. So eventually, you'll come across these three blocks here. And what you're supposed to do is hit them in a certain order. And if you're like me, you can just kind of like mash at this and you'll just guess the correct combination. It's not that hard. But this next pair of three blocks... Pair of three blocks? I just can't speak today. This next trio of three blocks... Yeah, you can't guess the combination on this. So, what are you supposed to do? What you're supposed to do is head on back to Cragtown. See, the Floor Sapiens have left and so they're no longer on lockdown. And just period is just hanging out, having a good time. You talked to him, and he's the guy that if you get stuck on the first three, he'll give you a hint. But this time, he wants you to say please. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not quadrice, but what's the five one? Five times! That's a lot of pleases, and yes, you have to type out each individual one. But you do that, and he gives you this absurdly long combination that, like, you're not gonna remember, so you actually just have to write it down. Like, the code from, uh, Chapter 2 is, is, is funny, but, you know, it's also kind of really annoying. Now with the code, you head back to the three blocks, you punch in the code, do it correctly, Piper Pierce takes you to the foreground, and you go behind the wall, which is kind of fun, and it also takes you to the end of chapter! Chapter 5-2! Pixels, Tablets, and Craig! 5-2 continues where 5-1 left off, with the Flora Sapiens still on the loose. We chase after them, and they somehow do this. What sorcery is this? What? That's stupid. Anyways, we can't break this block, which is a damn shame. If you do a bit of exploring, you'll find these three pillars, each of which have got their own little slot for you to put something in. Hmm, and if you do a bit more exploring, you'll find this Kragnon graffiti of a stone, a water, and a fire, each of which are displayed in a similar fashion to those pillars. <laughs> You've gotta find three tablets of stone, water, and fire, one each of which can be found throughout the level, and there are hints throughout the level to demonstrate what you're supposed to do in order to get those tablets. Most of the big sense is the water when you just find the underwater, I'll imagine that. And there's like one pool of water throughout this entire level, so it's pretty easy to get. There's the fire one, which is a bit weird, but you just find this weird fire stone that just looks really out of place. Yeah, you just breathe fire on it with Bowser, and boom, you get the thing. And the stone one is really weird. You have to like do this whole song and dance around this like Yoshi statue. It's weird, but there's a hint for it, so it's all good. No 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 enemies pokies they fling their own bodies at you to attack you. 
I mean, they're fine. They have pokies, but it's just pretty brutal if you think about it. You can't jump with them. You gotta use carry. Pretty standard stuff. Clubbas! They don't sleep. I tell you, get near them or jump on them or just make noise. It's kind of weird and inconsistent when they wake up and when they don't. Um, but yeah, when they wake up, they'll chase after you and swing their clubs at you. You can jump on them, but it's a little tricky because you gotta avoid their club when you're trying to jump on them. So, yeah. And there's also a couple of new enemies, but they're also, like, not new. They're just, like, the same enemies, but different color palettes and stronger. That's Squads, Robus, and Tech Cursia, which I guess is a bit different. They, like, limit your tech, which the game counts as, like, your special abilities. And Mario can't flip into 3D. Bowser can't, like, breathe fire, stuff like that. Also, you can find Amazing Daisies here. I didn't find any, but... If you do, good for you. This is like one of three places you can actually find them. So, anyway. Now, this could be a totally normal, peaceful, standard level, but we just can't have nice things. Now, can we? Oh, Chunks is back once more and he wants a rematch to scramble our faces like an egg. And Tippy's just like, bro, this has already happened before. You're just gonna get your ass kicked. Like, what are you doing? And he's just like, blah, 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 blah. And Dementio appears too. Dementio's like, ah, ha, 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 let me take you to my magic room, lol. And then he takes you there and you fight O-Chunks. And you win because O-Chunks sucks. I mean, he's a bit strong this time around. He's got some new moves like the spin one or the charge tackle attack he's got. But uh, he's still really goddamn easy. Now, after defeating a Mario boss, they're usually just either explode in violent fashion or just like, Grr, I hate you, me, my. But here, it's a bit different. Oh, Chunks asks you to kill him, to put him out of his misery. You can't bear show his face to the count after a loss like this, and like, I get it, he's a warrior, honor, and all that crap, but still, it's very dark to see a Mario character willingly ask for death. But we can't have that. We don't get to slit Ochoke's throat, as great as that would be. A, a Dementio appears and is just like, oh man, sucks that you lost. But before you kill yourself, you want to try this thing out that I have? It'll help Count Black. And he's just like, ah, fine. And I blast off. Well, he's Ochunks does, I guess. Dementia just teleports. Now, with O-Chunks out of the way and all three tablets in hand, we can plop those in the three pillars, and out pops a new pixel in the form of Kudge, who is a walking, talking hammer. Because he doesn't really walk, but still, he lets us use the hammer ability, like from other Paper Mario games. Yeah, up to this point, you haven't had access to it. You get it more than halfway through the game. Kind of strange, but hey, it's cool that it's here, I guess. It lets you use a hammer, it's very spammable, it does extra damage, and it can also break those Super Mario World blocks that the, the, the Fallen Sapiens use to block off the thing so you break it, and you can finally end Chapter 5-2. Chapter 5-3! A crag in the dark. We have made it to the Floro Sapiens hideout, the Floro Caverns, and we are soon greeted by the incredible, the amazing, the best character in all of gaming, Flint Cragley. Flint Cragley is somewhat of a Cragnon celebrity. He films his adventures of the wild and does everything he can. He's super cool and everyone loves him. And he's also apparently like the only Kragnon that seems to have taken English lessons. He's spouting about how he's ventured into the dangerous caves to find the Floro Sapiens. But um, apparently his crew got lost and it's up to us to go find them because... <sighs> reasons, I guess. I don't know. Throughout the Floro Sapien caverns, you'll find a couple of new enemies. Spike the Buzzy Beetles are Spike the Buzzy Beetles, and Spanias spin at you. They also have spikes on their head. Um, by the way, you can use Kudge to, like, kill spiked enemies. You don't have to use Carry now. It's kind of helpful. It's useful for killing Buzzy Beetles, since you can actually kill them instead of them just going into their shell. It's nifty. 
Hello, Sapiens! So we kind of already went over them, but we really didn't, and now there's like more than just two of them. They throw their heads at you to attack, which is weird, and you can like kill the head, but the body will still be limping around. It's pretty weird. They come in a variety of flavors, like yellow, red, and purple. But, um, it's fairly cosmetic. No stat differences. And, uh, lastly, Kragnons. Yeah, you can fight Kragnons. They're brainwashed by the Floro Sapiens, and if you kill them, you lose EXP. You can't, like, lose a level from this. You can't, like, lose your attack up or HP up or whatever. But, I mean, yeah, you can still lose EXP, which is weird. I don't see many RPGs do that, but, uh, this one does. And it's also freaking creepy as heck that you can kill the freaking NPC character. Frick. There's also this crazy wacky minecart ride that you can do in 3D and 2D. Whoa! It's something. It's one of the few things that they do in 3D that, like, is just there for looking cool. Yeah, I mean, hey. It's something. Being honest here, there is not much more to this level. You just kind of look for the two crew guys. You find them, and then you return to Flint Craigley. That's about it. Upon returning Flint Craigley's crew, he gives you the key, and you open up the door and go through a Mega Star section, and then you end of chapter because this chapter's over, and uh, it was pretty damn short. Chapter five dash four: The Menace of King Crocus. Craigly ho says Flint Craigly and Craigly ho indeed. We've descended deeper into the Floral Caverns and have reached the main base of the Floral Sapien race. And it's quite the level, but you wanna know the best part about it? There's not a single new enemy to cover! <laughs> but technically there is one. Technically, it's actually two reverse curses and heavy curses, but like we've already gone over curses, reverse curses, reverse your controls if you touch and heavy curses, make the wheel heavy and make the jump bang. Like that, that's it. In the floral caverns, we find that despite being walking, talking, eyeless, sentient sunflower monsters, the floral sapiens actually have pretty advanced technologies with a fully functional sprout sensor and ID cards. On top of that, they also produce the aforementioned Sprout, which is how they brainwash and control the Kragnons. So yeah, pretty impressive stuff. And speaking of the Kragnons, there are a lot down here. This is a full up and running facility of these bad boys. They are all over the place and it's very easy to kill them, especially when the game gives you pal pills for some reason. Wandering around the floral caverns, You'll find some like hints and stuff that's like, oh, do things, and then you hit the flip, flip this skull here, and then you get a key. And behind this locked door, well, most of the Kragnons have been captured and brainwashed. This guy over here named Gabro has managed to survive with the help of a pixel. See, Gabro is freaking out because he's like, oh my god, we're going to die, take me, but not, not pixel here. And this pixel, whose name is Dottie, is like, no, dude, chill, everything's fine. These aren't floral sapiens. And he's like, bro, what? And then Tiffy's like, oh, you haven't been turned into a brainwashed fucking monster. Just like Flint Cragley has. And he's like, bruh, Flint Cragley, huge Cragley fan. Gotta go meet Flint Cragley. And then he leaves. He also demonstrates what Dottie's ability is, which is to make things super duper tiny. And, um, yeah. We got ourselves a new pixel. Dottie makes things small. To be honest, it's really not that useful. It's only used to go in, like, tiny doors or little areas. Which, I mean, I guess is useful, but, like, you know, not, like, combat-wise. Although it is kind of fun to be tiny sometimes as you run around. And you can also do this with her. This is great. Using Dottie, we can get ourselves a card key. Get through the card key door. We got it, because we're breaking and entering the Floral Sapiens, and we're going to release a bunch of the Floral Craggy and friggin' prisoners. 
it doesn't really do them much good. They're still brainwashed. But hey, we did it, and we are gonna meet up with our good pals. Oh, Chunks and Dementio. How you guys doing? Yep, these two are back once again, and they are ready to brawl. But this time, old Chunks has got a trick up his sleeve, in the form of Dementio, who summons a flow of sapiens sprout upon his head, turning him into O Cabbage, who is probably the best character in the game. There's a lot of best characters in this game. And yeah, he fights you, and honestly, I don't like to know what's different. It's basically the exact same boss as before. Maybe he hits a little harder, I really don't know. It's just as easy, although he did nail a couple of hits on me until I figured out the Berry Corner counter strategy, which is insane. You beat up old Chunk so bad the broccoli gets knocked right off of him. Uh, literally, the, the scrap comes off. Old Chunks isn't quite sure what he's doing here, though. So he threatens you, and leaves. Leaving behind Sprout for you to claim. You leave the room, and Dementio's there, and he's like, Whoa, they beat them on all the chunks. Just some suspicious stuff, I don't know, man. Don't know about this guy, he, he's different. Anyways, now that you got the floral Sprout, you can use it, and wear it, and make it past the floral Sprout sensors. Don't worry, all the mind-controlling juice is gone from it. Probably. And through this door is the namesake of Chapter 5-4, King Crocus. You see, the Flower Sapiens are under the rule of the Crocus family. Well, at least I presume it's a family. It's kind of not. Maybe it's just a species. Either way, starting with King Crocus the first, who was a pretty cool guy until he wasn't and started to suck and had a reign of terror, as it says. He was killed and then replaced by his daughter, Crocus II, who was pretty cool. And then when they died, their child took over, and then they died shortly afterwards. And then, we got the present day guy, King Crocus IV, who was the one that spearheaded the whole mind controlling, enslaving Kragnons thing. I'm oversimplifying things here because. The plaques actually give a lot of detailed information about these leaders. And up to this point, you really haven't thought much about the Flora Sapiens, but this gives them a lot of history and background. A lot more than you'd think for just what have up to this point been simple bad guys. Underneath each of these paintings are hidden holes with blacks in them to change colors. All you've got to do is match the blocks to their corresponding painting's color, and bada boom bada bing, you've got yourself a door. Of course, beyond these doors are none other than King Crocus IV himself, who is not happy with us. I mean, we have been mercilessly killing all of his people. So, uh, yeah, he, he, he's not, not great about that, and uh, on top of that, he's kind of an asshole. He only seems to care about beauty, and is enslaved and might brainwashed all the Kragnons. And he's also got the pure heart for some reason. That doesn't help either. So, um, we want that thing. You won't give it up. We've gotta kill him. This boss fight is interesting. He starts off by using these weird, moody, black flower guys. I don't know. They try to attack you, but you can also stand on them. And you can also pick them up with throw and throw them at King Crocus. Pretty standard stuff there. Then he moves on to phase two, where he'll just kind of float around the room weirdly popping in and out of his flower shield. You can pick him up, or you can pick up the petal shurikens he'll throw at you. Either way, throw the petal shurikens at him, or throw him at the petal shurikens. Either way works. And then you do that a couple times, and he dies. And just like that, King Krogos IV withers away before our eyes, dying, his last word being beautiful. Also, here come the Flora Sapiens who are, you know, disappointed and upset that their king is fucking dead and that you killed them. Cause they're kinda like, dude, this guy was so cool, like, he put our people first, I mean, sure, he may have enslaved and brainwashed all the Kragnons, but, and this, is this part takes a turn, apparently the Kragnons were polluting the water and stuff, and... Well, you know, since the Flora Sapiens are flowers, they kind of, like, really freaking need that to survive. And so, yeah, they were kind of forced to do that. 
And, uh, also, and come Flint Cragling Crew, because Flint Cragling Crew are just the coolest. And they're just like, alright, yeah, 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 okay, we'll stop polluting the water, we'll film this, and it'll be a smash hit. So, um, that kind of settles everything. But, uh, oh yeah, about that pure heart, the Flora Sapiens are just kind of like, you guys are the heroes, I guess, apparently. We've had this thing for like 1,500 years and are supposed to give it to like you guys because you're the heroes, even though you just killed that king. So, um, here you go. Kind of weird that they're giving it to us since we just killed their king, but no complaints here. We'll take it. It's time for everyone's favorite sitcom, What Are Count Black and Friends Up To? Oh, Chunks is singing about Count Black because he lost and that's his punishment. Although, gotta be honest, his song is kind of a banger. Just looking at the lyrics here. Mimi and Mr. L are dying to fight because Mimi hasn't gotten to do shit since Chapter 2 and Mr. L's a new guy, so you know, he's gotta have some more screen time. But, uh, Count Black's nowhere to be seen and that stage he doesn't want them going anywhere either. So, they're just like, oh man, and, and they leave. And Dementia was just like, yeah, yeah, I'll go too, I got shit to do. Yup. One romantic relationship fanfiction later. We are back in Flipside, and same old, same old. The void is growing bigger yet, so we better hurry the hell up before this thing swallows all universes. And, uh, yeah, we gotta go find the heart pillar, but it's in Flopside this time, and it's in the same location as the second heart pillar from the flip side, but it's floppity floppity, get the idea, I've mentioned this before, plop that sucker in, new door, and before we actually do important shit, how about we do a side quest, huh? If there is one thing I wish Super Paper Mario had more of, it would be side quests, because as it stands... Off the top of my head, the game has like one, and that one side quest isn't even that fun to do. So you know that side quest from the original Paper Mario, the Lucky Day Badge one, where you have to go talk to a bunch of different NPCs, but they all need a bunch of different things? Yeah, the developers of this game decided, hey, let's just do that one again for this game. Great, although in all fairness, this one isn't quite as tedious, but it's, it's still not good. <laughs> In order to initiate this side quest, you must go talk with Merle, who's set up a charm shop in Flopside. But, I guess I kind of forgot to mention that, didn't I? Also, I guess I should go over charms. Uh, if you've played Paper Mario before, you know how they work. Basically, you pay money, and randomly, after damaging an enemy, Merle will appear and give you, like, a random item or something. That's basically it. It's cool stuff. Anyways, you gotta talk with her, not from the front, but from behind. You talk with her and she needs a favor. Apparently during her move, she lost her crystal ball. But not to worry, more lovely has the same kind of crystal ball as she does. So you go and talk with her. But oh, she needs a favor too. Apparently Bestovius has some like equipment training thing that she needs. So you go talk with Bestovius and oh, he needs something from old man watching. But you know what, Old Man Watch is pretty cool, so I'm, I'm okay with this. You go and talk with Old Man Watch it, and apparently he's been having some strange dreams. This weird woman has been appearing in them that looks like this. Ah, gee, I sure do wonder what a that is. And he wants her out of his dreams, and apparently he just thinks we can help him get a person out of his dreams. What does he think of us? How can we do that? I mean, we can, but like... This man asks a lot of us. And apparently he also wants an autograph of- Alright, cool man. Finally, we go and talk with Marlamina, who hasn't been able to sleep, apparently. That sucks for her. And so, I guess she's been pranking Mr. Old Man Watch It over here for funsies, because they can't sleep. But, she ties herself out by blabbering on and on, as she typically does, and, uh, hey, now she can fall asleep. 
But we also need an autograph from her, so she gives us that and also leaves a kiss on it. But there's no kiss on this autograph. There is a star, though, which implies that she has a star shaped mouth. T take that as you will. Now that Merlamina can finally sleep, we head back to Old Man Watch It, who doesn't have her in his dreams anymore, although he's a little bummed about it. But hey, a deal's a deal. We give him the autograph, and he gives us what Vestovius asked for, which is the uh, you know what. Give that to Vestovius, and I can only assume that it was a gay porno with him and Old Man Watch It performed together. Anyways, he gives you the training machine that Merlovely wanted, which is apparently just a DS. You give Merlovely the DS, she gives you the crystal ball that Merlovely wanted, give that to her, and she gives you an old ass key. Cool! And a discount on her charms, I guess that's kinda nice. Now, while this key may seem useless at first, it opens a door in Flopside and all that shack that's got a treasure chest inside that houses a new Pixel Meet Piccolo, who is probably the least useful pixel in the entire game. See, what he does for the most part is purely cosmetic. All he does is changes your character's sound effects real retro. Yeah, NES Bowser, NES Mario, so cool. Yeah, that's really all he does. This thing can cure status ailments, which is something, but, you know, how often do you get a status ailment in this game? Curses are like the only means of getting most of them, and I guess, like, besides that, there's like poison. And that's it. Not to mention, like, half of the items in this game cure poison. Like, it's just, it's just, it's just not that useful. But hey, retro sound effect. Chapter 6 1 Summer Guy Showdown. We have reached a new world yet again, but something's different about this place. It's much closer to the void than Flipside, Flopside, or any other dimension we've been to for that matter. According to the sign, we are at King Samur's palace, and beyond its gates we find, well, some random guy, but more importantly, a Samur guy. He speaks of a hero that will someday appear. However, time is running out, and yet still, no show. Or so he thinks. So far, we've had a 100% success rate on being the heroes these random people are told about, so um, we're probably the hero in the situation too. This guy's name is Jade Blooper, guardian of the first gate, and he challenges us to a duel to which we easily best him. Upon defeating him, he states that the hero has finally arrived, and calls us a he despite the fact that we're Peach, you sexist piece of shit, Jade Blooper. And in comes the ruler of all Samur guys, King Samur. Yeah, this King Samur guy apparently has a goddamn beer heart, so uh, yeah, that's pretty cool that we have it. Uh, no, of course, it's never that easy now, is it? To prove to King Samur that we are the true hero, we have to defeat his 99 other Samur guys. Only then can we have the pure art. So we better get going. With 99 different Samur guys to fight, I'm not going over each individually, that's stupid. But, they all do have their own names and personalities and backstories, and man, it is funny. The writers had a freaking field day writing this part of the game. Even if you don't typically read the dialogue in video games, or this game in particular, I would definitely do it for this section. It's great. As for the Samurai guys themselves, though, they're all unique and special, like some wield clubs, some have spikes on their heads, some are tiny, some are big, some have got lots of attacks, some have got lots of defense. They're all unique and special, and yeah, you gotta gotta adapt to which one you're fighting. You know, do whatever. Bowser makes this place a cakewalk, although I didn't want to do that. I wanted to challenge myself, so I used Peach, because god damn it, I don't use Peach enough. There's also these ninjos that will appear, and yes, that's their official name. 
They'll throw shurikens and stuff at you, do typical ninja things to aid the samurai guys in their fight, but that doesn't seem very honorable to me. You know, two versus one, kind of bullshit if you ask me, but whatever. Everything is going smoothly until round 20, where upon defeating Rolling Thwomp, Count Black appears. Yeah, outside of the beginning of the game, our heroes really haven't gotten to seeing Count Black at all. I mean, of course, we've seen them, but, like, still. So, it's nice to see him again. You know, how, how is he doing? I, I'm not great. He still uh, hates us and wants us to die, and he's still destroying all the world, and is really just here to make fun of us. But Tippy's like, ah, you're horrible, you're sick, you're stupid, and Count Black's like, yeah, everything's pointless, must destroy it all, except for Tippany. She was the only thing that mattered to me, and Tippy's like, Tippany? I don't know why, I mean, I guess the, her name is kind of similar to Timpani, it's a weird coincidence if you ask me. Anyways, yeah, he's just here to like monologue and he leaves, but I guess his monologue was enough to convince our boy the Rolling Thwomp over here to go tell King Sandwich to just give us the pure heart already. So yeah, after that whole ordeal, we don't have to fight the rest of the Zammer guys, only 20 or so, the rest they all just kneel and let us go on through to get to the pure heart because, well, I mean, we do kind of need that to save their entire world and all other worlds, so that's nice of them. And also, it's nice we don't have to fight 99 Samurai guys, only like 20, so that's good because that would have gotten real boring real quickly and pretty difficult, too. I guess this game could use some difficulty. Anywho, after the 25th uh, Samurai guy, we finish Chapter 6-1. Chapter 6-2, The End of a World. Starting off 6-2, oh, well, would you look at that? The king's already here. He heard about our encounter with Count Black and figured he'd meet us here. And just for kicks and giggles, he'll let us have the pure art on the 26th floor. It is a dire situation, after all. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty nice to Pim. SON OF A BITCH! No pure heart for us? It was just a goddamn bomb. And the king's like, oh, that should have killed you. What the heck? I go, you're totally unfazed. Maybe because you reused the asset of Boomer. We're immune to Boomer. We've used him before. I like to imagine that's the actual cannon. Anyways, yeah, this isn't the actual king, it's freaking Mimi. Now, of course, Mimi's here to just get in our way, and we fight her, but it's a little different this time. Instead of being in her spider form, she just fights us in her regular form, floating around using rubies to attack you, and has a spinning wheel of them around her at all times. The way you're meant to attack her is by using throw, picking up the rubies, and, well, throwing them at her, but I found using berry works just as well. So, that's what I did. And we defeat her easily. We may have defeated Mimi, but all she set out to do was waste our time, and in that, she succeeded as the void grows even larger than before. This world is on the brink of destruction, and, you know, judging from the title of this chapter, you might be able to put the puzzle pieces together here. Mimi leaves and we tread on, but at the 30th gate, we're a little too late. Miraculously, Mario and Co. survived the end of an entire world. Very impressive durability. Tippy's recalling about how she apparently knows Count Black. Like, yeah, we all know Count Black. We just saw him. You know, you're not special. Anyways, everyone's fine, I guess. Things could be worse. Although, the door to the Samurai Guy Kingdom is still here. So, I guess we can go see what the apocalypse looks like. Chapter 6-1 The 
but it's fucking destroyed this time. Exiting the door, we find that the Samurai Kingdom has been completely destroyed. There is nothing left of this place, although Tippy can sense the pure heart very faintly, so maybe it survived the void, but things are certainly looking bleak. Heading onwards, there's nothing. The Samurai Kingdom as we knew it is gone. All of the Samurai guys, they're dead. The king, dead. I know this game has been darker than most other Mario games, or Paper Mario games for that matter as well, but this brings it to a whole nother level. These were just people, man, not even really enemies. They're just dead. And this will happen to all other worlds. Up to this point, we really haven't been shown what will happen when a world gets destroyed. And this, this is what will happen. But hey, no worries, there's a beer art. Everything's fine. Or is it? In comes Mr. L. Yeah, he's here to swipe up the beer art. And even though it's very damaged, we still gotta take that beer art away from him. And so, we battle with his all new robot L type. Does the L stand for loser? This new robot isn't a complete pushover though, it's got 64 HP, 5 attack, 4 defense, and 8 defense against fire. Although from what I could tell, it's just straight up on being to fire, although maybe I'm wrong. Either way, this thing has a plethora of attacks. It's got punches, a boomerang mustache, a ground pound, laser eyes, and vor. The easiest way to defeat this thing is by using Boomer. Just place a bomb when it does its ground pound and you'll be able to score some easy hits. After a couple Boomer explosions, it's down. After that robot brawl, Mr. L runs away like the Bitch that he is, leaving behind a pure heart for us to swipe up ourselves. Sure, it may be damaged still, but I mean, hey, it's good enough, probably. End of chapter! After the fight, and Mr. L's pretty glum. I mean, uh, come on, his robot got beat up again. He just can't seem to beat these zero guys, and hey, look. It's Dementio probably here to pat him on the back, you know, give him some sympathy. I mean, he can't show his face to the crowd, he's a disgrace, he lost another time. And, whoa! Dementio detects Mr. L, what the hell? Dementio says he can't have Mr. L around the count, and if he kills him here, he won't be found out. Uh, why does he need to kill Mr. L? Oh god, oh. Oh, he says not to worry, it won't be so bad. He'll send the heroes Mr. L's away in due time. Just so you saw us to play. Oh, God! Okay. Bye, Mr. L. Okay, bye. Checking back in on Count Black. We see that it's just him and Anastasia right now. She reports that Mr. L left the castles without orders to stomp the minions, although it turns out he was the one that got stomped and also killed because of Dementio, but of course Dementio reports in that it was the heroes that did it, or at least not him. And Count Black just kind of brushes it off, saying that he needs sacrifices, so I guess Dementio's plan worked. Also, Mimi left the castle as well without orders, so, um... Yeah, I guess what chunks maybe will slow around, but he's certainly not here right now. Count Black ponders if perhaps that pixel he saw truly was timpani. Although, I, I mean, I could see it. I mean, Perry is pretty good looking. Maybe in a past life he was a hot woman, but it's probably not. It's, there's no way it's him. And even if it was, Count Black says that at this point, not even he can stop the prophecy. It's already been set in stone. Huh. 
Back to more fan fiction. Timpani has been killed. Oh God, no! Whatever will we do? Blueby, uh, no, your kind can mix with humans. Tribe of Darkness. Wow, this, is, mm, this story's getting kind of good. Oh, hear me out. Uh, I think Blumier might be kind of black. I, I, I'm probably just taking crazy pills. Like, it's, it's, I'm just, it's not true, but like, you know, I, I, maybe it's my head cannon. Nah, I mean, yeah. We return to Flipside and head on over to Merlin's place to consult him about our new damaged pure heart. But for once, he really doesn't have a solution. In order to defeat Count Black, we need all eight pure hearts, and even if we place this in a heart pillar, it still wouldn't do anything. We are kinda screwed right now. But just when all hope seems lost, Dementio appears, yeah. He literally just teleports into Merlin's house like it's no big deal. And he informs us what we were already pretty afraid of, that all of our hard work was in vain. Without this pure heart, we can't continue. But don't worry, he's here to give us a consolation prize. By killing everyone. I guess I shouldn't say everyone. He spares Merlin, Tippy, and all the pixels, but, um, Mario, Peach, and Bowser? Yeah, they're all dead. But don't worry, he states that he just fulfilled their wishes by sending them to the next world. And peace is out. Well, hi! Hey, new face, so tell me, first time down here in the underwear? <laughs> just a little joke. People don't arrive here twice. <laughs> huh? What'd you say? What's the underwear? You're kidding, right? Man, for a guy with no extra lives, you're sure hilarious. Isn't it obvious? This is where people go when their games are over. Some call it world minus one. So, uh, how did your game end anyway? Was it one up bad jump or did someone. Mm. Wait, you'd say your game's not over? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one before. Nile's always the first step. Maybe you just need to hear it from Queen Jadies. She's the scariest thing in the underwear, and that is saying something. She rules over her shades, and she'll tell you straight your game is over. That's right. It's canon! Mario goes to hell when he runs out of lives, implying that he's committed several sins! As that Shay just explained, which by the way, he did a phenomenal job explaining it, he deserves a star. We are in the underwear, which is where people go when they die. Although Mario claims that he's not dead yet, but as the Shade said, he's just in denial, although... Changing from how the shade talks, it would imply that when you die, you become a shade. But Mario's not a shade, so maybe he is alive yet. And, you know, for being hell, it's actually quite a good place. I mean, it looks a little gloomy, but I mean, hang it. It's got this, like, tang fountain that heals all your HP. Kind of reminds me of the tang from, like, Neon Genesis. I don't know if that's, like, a thing in Japanese media, of, like, tang, and, like, it's just associated with, like, a, a death, because I think it is ongoing, it's related to death. Anyways, uh, I'm getting off track to here. Yeah, Mario's in hell. It's funny. There's some shades talking about how they died. It's just a fun idea. Mario in hell. They should have done this more. Uh, anyways, we better go find Queen JD's as It would seem like she's the one running this place. And also, we are just Mario right now. No other characters, no Tippy, no Pixels. Just Mario. Eventually, we find this angel child who's talking about how her one true love will someday appear, her prince, to which she opens her eyes and sees Mario, calling him a mustachioed fatty, to which I call her a bitch. We've got this pipe section where to get around the pipes, you gotta turn into 3D and jump over the spikes. 
There's also a new enemy, Dry Bones. They basically work how they do in any 2D Mario game. Can't kill them by jumping on them. You can only kill them by other special means, which right now we can't do that because we don't got any pixels or any characters, just Mario. So, um, can't kill them. I guess there's also photo boost, but like, I don't even think you can kill them in this game. So, I don't know, more of an obstacle than an enemy. We've got this interesting character here who for some reason talks as if he's a snake. And also, I love the way he opens and closes his mouth, it just looks really funny. You can pay him four coins to pass the river twigs. You don't have to do this, but it is faster than not paying him the four coins, so... Just pay him four coins. Continuing forward, we find these D-men. Yes, that's their actual name. I love the pun. Uh, work at hell? A great pay, I bet. Anyways, yeah, they just work for Queen Jadies, who... Speaking of which, we finally get to meet up with. Queen Jadis confirms for us that yes, we are dead, and yes, this is hell. However, we've got something of interest on us, being the pure heart. Thank God Mari decided to keep it. She is understandably shocked to see that we have something like a pure heart on us and wonders who exactly we are. But she is soon interrupted by a phone call that she gets from the king of the over there, or heaven. Gramby, who informs her that one of the Nimbuses has ran off. The name of the missing Nimby is Love Bee. Now, Queen Jadis would go look for her, but she's a little busy and solve all of her demons, so she asks us to do so, to which we say yes, and if you say no a bunch, she kills you, you know how this game is. So yeah, we have to go look for Love Bee, but first, we hand over our pure heart to her, and she also gives us a door key. So, yeah, neat. Apparently this key belongs to a door underneath the river twigs. So, we head there, jump into the water, sink down, and find these creepy hand guys that we can't kill that reach out to you. And this genuinely disturbing music that you would never think in a million years is from a Mario game. But I digress. Going through the door key door, we got this puzzle section using movable blocks, levers that can turn off and on water. It's pretty simple, but I like it. It's a fun change of pace from the previous chapter, and, uh, eh, I like it. After making it through that puzzle section, we head back outside to the underwear, find three more of those tang fountains, and after nearly 20 hours of playing this game, I can finally be happy. Cowering behind a rock, it's Luigi who's also ended up in hell, because... If you didn't know this already, hit the with the bandage off, but um Mr. L's actually leads you yeah, they just brainwashed him into being nah, hit the rip the band-aid off. Yeah, so yeah, after Dementio killed Mr. L, aka Luigi, he ended up here. Which stinks! Mario tells him that yeah, he's in hell, he is dead, and Luigi honestly doesn't seem too concerned about it. Mario tells him that he's looking for someone called Love Bee, and Luigi agrees to help because I mean, he's dead, he's got all the time in the world. That's right, Luigi joins our party too, finally! I'd also like to mention that uh, Luigi has committed several sins as well, since um, he's also in hell. Anyways, taking control of Luigi, he's like Mario, obviously. He's got a higher jump, slippery shoes, and hold down long enough and release, he'll perform a super jump, which does double damage to enemies above him if you hit him, and can also be used to get around Obstacles! Kinda sucks that you have to wait this long to use Luigi. But, I mean, I get why his ability kind of breaks a lot of obstacles in this game, so it makes sense they would wait to give him to that. And hey, save the best for last, you know? Using Luigi, we can access a new area of the underwear that we weren't able to get to before. It's also got some new enemies, like these ice piranhas that are just putrid piranhas, but it's a poisonous gas. It's an icy one that freezes you. Also a great example of how Luigi can use a super jump to attack enemies. And there's also a Gigabyte. I think we've seen the Megabytes before. I've probably gone over them. They're not very common enemies. And they're also another great example of how Luigi can use a super jump to attack enemies. Is it that good design? After defeating a couple more Icy Piranhas and jumping over a couple more pipes, we find that Angel go from before, who's still talking about her prince and stuff, and still does not like Mario or Luigi for that matter. If you gotta put some puzzle pieces together here, it's very obvious though, gee, I wonder who this character is. Yeah, it's Luffy. She's getting annoyed at us just existing and says if we truly are hers, then we should be able to know her name. Weird 
decision she made, but um, we know her name is Lumpy, and she runs away back to her mom. Turns out that her mom is Queen Jadis, though, so that works out for us. And um, while we were gone looking for Lumpy, she restored our pure heart, so we can actually use it now. How nice. She also sends us back to Flipside on top of that. What? How could this make it any better? We are back in Flipside. Merlin and Tippy are shocked to find Mario since, you know, he died, and Luigi because who the hell is Luigi? They head back to Merlin's place. Mario explains how they restored the pure heart back to its original form, not damaged in any way, shape, or form now, and Luigi introduces himself as Luigi. Merlin also confirms that yes, Luigi is most definitely the fourth hero, so, um, good for him. Uh, Tippy's still pretty concerned about Peach and Bowser, though. But before anything else, we should go place the beer heart in the heart pillar. With only one beer heart left to go. Uh, things are certainly looking up for us. As Tippy says it, we've gotta stop that bloomy air. Who the fuck is bloomy air, Tippy? You mean that guy from the fan fiction? That's weird that you would say that. Anyways, Chapter 7 1 Subterranean Vacation. Yep, that's right, we're back in hell once more. But this time, we gotta find the pure heart, because apparently it's here. How a pure heart gets in hell, I don't know. But regardless, we're here for a reason. So, we better go find it. With no other place left to go in the underwear, we head back to Queen Jade, to inform her that we're looking for a pure heart down here. She is shocked to see us, and also shocked to learn that we're looking for another pure heart. And she questions if we really are the heroes written in the prognosticus. It seems like she has a good understanding of what's been going on here with the pure hearts in the void and all. But if we want the pure heart, we're gonna have to talk with Granby, king of the over there. And just then, Love Bee appears, saying that she has her stuff back and is ready to head over to the over there when Queen Jadis gets the brilliant idea for us to take her to the over there. Great! Apparently, there's some monster that was sealed away in the underwear, but was recently freed due to an earthquake and has been roaming around since. And she couldn't risk Lovebee getting harmed, so we have to take her. But she'll inform Granby that we're looking for the pure heart and also give us a door that takes us to the end of chapter. Chapter 7 2 The Sealed Doors 3. We are here at the Underwear Road, the exit out of this place and into the Over There. However, with Lovey around and Tippy around, they tend to butt heads a lot, mainly Lovey instigating her and just being the worst character. But it's kind of funny. So I'll allow it. As for the underwear road itself, it's very, very dark. You're only able to see a small portion of the screen being around your character. Although I like the effect. It's the scribbly thing going on. I don't know why they want to be so artsy with it, but they did. You can also use Tippy to see a bit of the screen. As for new enemies, we got Dark Boos. They'll flip in and out of 3D and um, approach you and then attack you. And do like four damage to you, but they're pretty easy. The window between them appearing and actually attacking you was pretty generous. They're not new, but the hands from the uh, river twigs riz are here too. Uh, they're not like completely the same. They like don't 
exactly follow you, they just reach out and try and touch you. I don't know. Anyways, we can't go through this door, that sucks. It says it's being held closed by some mysterious force. This took me a while to figure out. Apparently you're supposed to use Tippy on this guy. That is not made clear. I kind of wish it was a bit more obvious than that, but whatever. The door is alive. Meet Door Guy the First. His job is to make sure you're not some kind of monster, so he's gotta quiz you. He gives you these complicated word problems and then proceeds to give you really simple questions like, Oh, what's my name? Boar guy the 64th? I just really like some of these answers. And also, I like the last question he gives you, where he gives you a word problem about apples and then asks you how many times in that paragraph did he just say the word apples. That's funny. I love him. He's in my top 10 favorite Nintendo characters of all time. This one door has more personality and life put into it than the entirety of Sticker Star. We proceed through Door Guy the First to find these three D-Men who are guarding this door to some deadly beast that they can't seem to tame. One of them jokingly asks if we can handle it for him, to which we say yes, to which they call us nuts. Although after reconsideration, they decide, oh what the heck, we'll let you try and defeat this thing. So what dangerous, ferocious beast could the demon not tame? Uh, uh, Bowser, who is um not happy right now. He doesn't know where he is, he's hungry, he misses Princess Peach, he's not having a good time. Although, he sees Luigi, which um weirdly enough he's not really too mad about. He's just kind of surprised to see Luigi. You'd think he'd despise him because he's well, Mario, but guess not. Although, it doesn't take long for him to get upset because we don't got Peach with us yet. And so he's like, oh, you're trying to get between me and her. I see, you're trying to ruin what we've got going on. And he attacks us. Uh, so, um, we gotta kick his ass. Bowser has 80 HP, 8 attack, and 2 defense, which is baloney. He should have like 55 HP and way more attack than just 8. I actually think that'd make this boss a bit more interesting if he did actually keep the stats that you gave him when uh, he was on your team, but, um, I guess not. Anyways, he's not too difficult. Even that 8 HP is a lie because only his fire breath has 8 HP. If you just run into him, he only deals, like, 2 damage to you, so that's, uh, that's pretty lame. Uh, and he's got a new attack, flailing arms, he just runs into you and... I guess it's a little hard to dodge, but not really. No, it was easy. You need to defeat him. After beating Bowser, he's like, Dog, damn it, why did I have to lose again? To which we tell him that we really don't have Peach. She's lost. We don't know where she is. And then he's like, well, Why didn't you just say so? Let's get looking for it. Yeah, it's okay, Bowser. And uh, yeah, we leave. The demon are pretty shocked to see that we're alive, but I mean, hey. We know Bowser, we're good pals. They give us the key to continue forward into the underwear road. Now, with Bowser. This next section is pretty annoying. It's this very, very, very long vertical section with lots of enemies thrown in, like Dark Boos, the Weird Hand Guys, and Dry Bones. Although, this time we can actually kill the Dry Bones now that we have our pixels and also Bowser. Uh, it's so annoying though because if you get hit you can just fall all the way down because of how knockback works in this game and also just like making a wrong jump they can also do that they can do some progress it's just it's not great although the part that makes it a bit more bearable is that using Bowser you can light the torches in the room so you can actually see which makes it a lot less annoying but still I'm not a fan. At the tippity top of the section, we have Door Guy the Second, who's also in my top 10 favorite Nintendo characters list. Uh, he's a bit different though than Door Guy the First. His questions all involve these videos he'll show you of just like shapes that are colored, and you've gotta figure out the question, take it all in. Because, um, yeah, they ask you, like, oh, what, what color was the most plentiful? How many triangles were there? Stuff like that. I actually got one of these wrong, so. Yeah, I guess I'm a fucking dumbass. Although he does throw in one of these joke questions that's like, oh, what numbered question are we on? Well, I got that one right. Uh, I forgot. I don't remember which one I got wrong. But either way, yeah, it's a bit different. You get them all right and you can pass on. 
Okay, we'll go forward, not pass on. Although we are in hell, so. Through door guy, the second we find yet another locked door. And a very out of place looking tooth door. And through it, we find the three hag sisters. Each one of these hags has got a quest for you to do. Well, not really quest, it's just a favor. This makes it seem more epic than it actually is. The only one you have to do is the first one. I think your name's like Hagra or something. She apparently lent a book to a demon, and you've gotta go retrieve it. She'll teleport you to the demon to get the book, but you've gotta make the trek back to her. They knew what they were doing with this section. God damn it. You give the book to her, and she'll give you the door key, which you can use to progress. But we still got two other hags to talk to. Hag number two is named Hagatha. She wants you to go talk to a D-man because she wants the D-man to record a tape of, like, her favorite show or something. So, she teleports Kia to him, and, uh, yeah, he says he'll take care of the taping thing. Her favorite show is Hag Mysteries. Very cool. And you've got to walk all the way back like before. Although, it's not as bad this time because, um, well, before you had to walk through both sections of the other way road, this time, it's just the vertical one. You come back and she gives you a hint. Apparently, there's a boss down here called the Underchomp. And its weakness is lullabies. If you sing it a song, it'll fall asleep. So, um, hopefully we just got good singing skills. Last but not least, is Hagness. She's different from all the rest in that all she wants of you is to listen to her story about her youth. She tells about how she fell madly in love with some boy and it turns out that boy was Granby, king of the over there. That's interesting. You don't get anything for listening to the story, she just does a thank you, but hey, I kinda like it. Just some, some simple words. I, 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 thank you, Hagness. You, you are nice. Continuing forward, we are in the last section of the Underwear Road. We got this staircase part with these spiny trumps. It's not too bad. At the end of it, we find the Door Guy the Third, who is just outside of my top ten favorite Nintendo characters list. Not worth the hype. However, his challenge for us is to defeat the Underchomp. Suddenly, we are in a turn-based combat scenario. We can attack techniques, pixels, items, switch, and escape. Although escaping doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know why they did this. Uh, it's super cool, don't get me wrong, but like, man, it must have been a lot of work to have to program all this into the game, especially since you can do stuff like use any of the pixels, use any of the items in the game. It's a lot of work for something that just they didn't have to do, but it's very cool. However, um, easiest way to defeat these guys is just like that hag said, if we play them a lullaby, they will all fall asleep. And if you have Piccolo like we do, you can do just that. So, um, I guess Piccolo finally has the actual use, besides 8-bit sound effects. So yeah, easiest way you can defeat them is just by using Piccolo. Although I messed around for a bit here. Uh, nearly dying, actually, I lived with like 4 HP. Um, but yeah. I did it, and we can move on from this place and finally end at chapter 7 2. <sighs> chapter 7 3 The Forbidden Apple. We are out of the underwear, finally into. Not really the over there quite yet, but we're close. Tippy's pretty concerned about Peach since, you know, we still have yet to find her, to which Luigi reassures her that she's fine. Luffy asks if this little Peach is the lady friend of Mario, to which Luigi answers, not really? And then Luffy says, he's a one-sided relationship. Which, like, after the comment in Chapter 2 and now this... Uh, man, uh, their relationship has never been more questionable. Anyways, Love Bee flies away and says for us to keep up with her, but she can fly and we can't, so we can't keep up with her! <sighs> there are a lot of new enemies to go over here, so that's probably where we should start. Parabuzzies and spiked parabuzzies. They behave like parabuzzies, but they can fly up and down or left to right. Also, 
I just find this funny that you can do this and kill them. This amused me. Rough buffs, they are kind of annoying, honestly. They're one of the enemies that have projectiles, which I'm never a big fan of. And they deal four damage, which for a projectile, yeah, that's quite a lot. They also have a decent amount of HP, like 15 or something, so they can be quite annoying. But still, they're not too bad. They've got a nice fluffy cushion surface for you to jump on anyways. Lastly, there's the Skello enemies. We got Skello Bits, Skello Baits, and Skello Bombers. There's also spiky variants of the Skello Bits and Baits. Starting with the Skello Bits, they're not too bad. 10 HP, attack is 2, and defense is 2 as well. But the problem I have with them is that the way they hold their spear, you can't really jump on their head. I mean, you can. It's possible. It's doable. But every time I try and do it, it just never works out in my favor, and I hate it. Besides that, they'll charge after you with their spears, and that's when you're supposed to jump on their head because their spear is down, but I live dangerously, alright. And then, um, spiky variants, same thing, just spike on their head, although they are pink for some reason. Then there's the Skello Bombers. They are weird because there's two variants. There's the variant that just throws their head at you to attack from the sky. They'll respawn a new head. Kind of weird, but whatever. And then there's the ones that'll throw down Skello Baits. The Skello Baits are pretty weak. 10 HP, 2 defense, and only 1 attack. But they can breathe Ice Breath, which um, will freeze you. That's not fun, especially when they are thrown down from the sky. You have to, like, jump into the sky to defeat their spawners. That's, that's annoying. This place is the Over There Stair. The treacherous climb up to... The over there. Which means, yes, it is another vertical level. We haven't had one of these, at least not a full vertical level since 3 3, and now in 7 3, we get to have another one. Yay! The over there stair is divided into seven sections, giving you seven opportunities to feel what it's like to lose all of the progress you just made. On the way up the over there stair, you'll find several numbered clouds, 80 of which to be exact, although you start at 11, so you get a bit of an extra head start, I guess. They serve as basically mini checkpoints, just giving you a good indicator that, hey, you're almost there and that you are indeed going in the right direction. On your way up the over there stair, you'll find several doors whose rooms are entirely dedicated to apples. Yeah, you'll find several apple trees on your way up here. All of which have got differently colored apples. Um, uh, keep on to them if you find them, because uh, they'll be important for later. Stair 1 and Stair 2 of the Over There Stair, they've got nothing of interest. But Stair 3 has the blue apple tree, and Stair 4 has the red apple tree, and also Princess Peach. Apparently Princess Peach has eaten the golden fruit, which is forbidden. Because according to Love Bee, Whoever eats it falls asleep for 100 years, and we don't have that kind of time, and we can't wake her up. However, there is some taboo fruit that we can find in the over there stair that will apparently wake her up. So, we've gotta go find it. The blue and the red apples, which are the only apples you probably have at this point, do do things to her, but not exactly what we want. The blue one makes her really tiny, and the red one makes her really big. And there's other ones too, like the yellow apple, which also resides on the fourth stair, although it's hidden away in some 3D area next to a sign that says, Hey bitch, yellow apple this way. Yellow apple does that. And there's also the pink apple, which um turns her into a peach. Gross. The pink apple resides on the fifth stair, being at the very beginning of it. And there's one last apple, being the black apple, which also resides on the fifth stair, but at the very top of it, in a similar situation to the yellow apple with a sign out front that says, Hey, bitch, black apple here. You give the black apple to her, and she wakes up, allowing her to finally join our team, finally letting us use all four heroes. Yeah. Now that we have Peach, we can use her to make it to the sixth stair, to which we can climb all the way up, making it to the seventh stair, and finding a little cloud named Cyrus. 
see, Cyrus wants to be the biggest cloud that he can be. You heard of a guy that ate mushrooms and became really, really big. So, he wants to become really, really big. And if you find any sort of big making thing, to give it to him. Yeah, you gotta go find the thing that makes Peach big and give it to him, that being the red apple. Conveniently, though, there's a pipe that just appears if you hit the switch, and, um, yeah, it takes you pretty much right next to the red apple tree, so you can just grab the red apple, come back, give it to him, and mada boom, bada bang, he's big now. Meet the new and improved Super Cyrus. By jumping on him now, he'll take you so far up, out of the atmosphere, and into outer space. I don't know why Earth's depicted here, it's kind of weird, but hey, Luigi's doing a space chicken dance. That's kind of funny. It'll shoot you all the way up to the end of the seventh stair, which is also the end of the over there stair, which is also the end of chapter seven. Dash the Chapter 7-4, A Bone-Chilling Tale. We have finally made it to the over there and are ready to meet up with Granby, who Lovey tells us is actually her father, which means, yep, Granby's her father and Queen Jadies is her mother. Continuing forth into the over there, ah, just like the over there stereo, this place is infested with the Skello enemies. And they seem to be terrorizing the NIMBYs. After saving this young NIMBY's life, he tells us that these guys are after the pure heart, which puts Granby in grave danger, which um, certainly worries Love B and us, because we need that pure heart, these guys can't have it. Just like the Over There Sare, the Over There is divided into several sections, eight of which to be exact. Using this key this young NIMBY gives us, we can go to the third sector, which has more NIMBYs for us to save, who then let us go to the fourth sector, which is where we find uh, more NIMBYs to save, but also a more important NIMBY named Wibby. Wibby tells us that the fiends, the beasts, they came and attacked, and they're at Granby's shrine as we speak, although they destroyed the bridge to get there, so... He can't get over to them, and Granby's all alone with the evil guys, and that's bad. To rebuild the bridge, we're gonna have to find three orbs, each of which is held by a certain person. Rebby, Blueby, and Yelby. So, we've gotta go find them, and get their orbs. Wibby hands us a key, which allows us to enter Sector 5, which doesn't really have anything of interest, besides allowing us to get to the other sectors. Speaking of which... As for the sectors, there's only a couple of interests. One, three, and eight don't really have anything, although eight does have this one weird NIMBY that just is faking it, basically. Eh, whatever. It's fine. There's also this boomerang bro, which usually boomerang bros are depicted in a dark blue, but in this game, they're gray for some reason, although I kind of like the change. It makes them look better. On Sector 7, we find Rebby, who's fighting off some of those foul Skello guys. I'm just gonna keep calling them Skello guys, because I don't know what else to call them. They all have different names and stuff, Skello. They're Skello guys, okay? Now we kick the Skello guys' ass, and we convince them to give us the Red Orb, mainly because Love Bee's with us. That helps a lot. In Sector 6, we find Yebby cowering away inside of a bathroom. The only way to get him out is by using reverse psychology, by telling him you are a monster when you aren't. Genius! He gives us the yellow orb. In Sector 2, we find Blueby, who is frozen in ice. You free him, and at first he doesn't remember anything, because you can actually find this guy before you talk to Wibby. Uh, and then you talk to Wibby, and you come back, and he can just remember, like, uh, okay, sure, whatever. He gives us the blue orb, cool. With all three orbs in possession, we head back to Sector 4 and plop each one individually onto this pedestal. And once all three are in place, we get this magical glowy effect and the bridge gets rebuilt. And it's pretty cool looking animation. I just want to mention here, I, I, I feel like I'm going through these parts really, really quickly, but... These chapters are much longer than I'm making them out to be. 
over there stare and the over there alone each or an hour. Like, there's a lot to these things. I'm just kind of going over the, like, nitty-gritty parts with the enemies and, like, finding secrets or whatever because I feel like I've already gone over that enough. You know what these levels entail. You know what they're like. So I'm just going over, like, the parts that make the uh, levels flow together, if you will. Adding up the bridge, we are finally at Granby Shrine. Or are we? I mean, yeah, we are, but there's these Skello guys once again here to stop us. But have no fear, for Rebby is here, and the two sides fight in a fucking battle of death and blood. Rebby sends his army of Nimbys out, and the other Skello guy sends his army, and they're fighting, and <laughs> corpses falling from the sky. There's like a couple Skello guys you have to fight on the ground, but still, it's just... This is great, man. The Nimbys hold off the Skello guys, and you head into Gramby's shrine. Finally meeting him. We find Gramby injured, but still alive. And behind him stands the creature that escaped the underwear, the beast! Bone chill. This is the guy that's been after the pure heart, but... As Lovely says, her father will never give up the pure heart, to which Bone Chill laughs, saying that she, Lovely, is the pure heart. Which is quite the accusation, although her father doesn't say anything back, he just kind of grunts, although he is hurt. Lovely doesn't believe it, and to be honest, I don't either right now. But uh, we have more pressing matters, like we need to kill this guy now. Tippy tells her to uh, take her father away and let us deal with Bone Chill. Bone Chill has 80 HP and 4 attack. His weak spot is his head. You have multiple ways of attacking it with Luigi's Super Jump or by using Throw. You can pick up the icicles that fall from the ceiling or the ones he shoots out. He is a frigid monster. He'll breathe ice breath from his cannon and attack you using the icicles and stuff. It's not too hard of a boss, but I just kind of like it. What can I say? It's fun. I wish more bosses were like this. It's kind of like, you know, a frack tail and stuff. He's kind of like that. It's more specific what you gotta do to attack him. I, I gotta be honest, a lot of bosses in this game I feel kind of samey. Like, you just attack up them by jumping. I like this one. It's more unique. It's different. It's cool. With Bone Chill defeated, Granby and Lovebe come rushing in. Uh, thank us for, you know, defeating that guy. But there's still one question. Is Lovebe actually the pure heart? Uh, yeah. Yeah, she is. Queen Jadis comes in and, um, confirms that for us. The pure heart was always in danger of falling into the wrong hands. So... As a means of protecting the pure hearts, they transformed it into love be a form that no one would suspect of being the pure heart. The pure heart has started sensing us, the heroes. We are worthy of possessing it. I'm kind of weird that it only started doing that now, but... I'll let it slide. Love B is understandably upset that her life is kind of meaningless. It was just a means of protecting the pure heart. And yet, as she states, she got scolded. She was not allowed to have fun. If they knew that she was not long for this world, why not let her enjoy it? Love being Granby start arguing back and forth at each other. It just kind of goes on for almost an uncomfortable amount of time. Until Queen JD steps in and says, that's enough. Queen JD says that, well, yes, she was created to protect the pure heart. Grams and her came to love her as a true daughter. She became part of them. And that maybe they were wrong to create her if all they caused was pain. And Love B 
accepts their apology and also accepts the fact that she has to return to her pure hard form. Although, before she goes, she tells Tippy to take good care of her and to save all the world. And lastly, she tells her parents that she loves them. Rambi says his parting words to us, and Luigi is like, okie dokie, and we acquire the final pure heart. Back to Count Black and Crew. Apparently they just got word that hey the heroes are still up and kicking. They didn't die. So um that sucks for them. No oh, chunks and Mimi are ready to give a party pooping blast bonanza. And so is Dementio, but he's got a question for the count. Does the name Boomy Air ring a bell? It does actually, yeah, it does. Which hey, hey, my head cannon's correct. Blumier is Count Black, which means Blumier knows Timpani. Huh? Uh, so who's Timpani then? I mean, it'd have to be someone that knows Blumier. Wait, uh, Dementia heard that name from uh, Tippy, which means Tippy must be Tippy. Holy shit! I just figured it out. Oh my god. Oh. Oh, yeah, Blue Mayor's having second thoughts about this whole destroying the worlds thing, um. But he says that not even he can stop it at this point. If the heroes want to save all the worlds, they better come quick. Man, this fanfiction stuff makes a whole lot more sense now. Gloomy Air is talking with his father. His father's telling him not to open that dark prognostic because not even his ancestors can handle it. But he does it anyway. Gloomy Air is now dead. He is Count Black. And his only purpose is to fulfill the dark prognosticus and destroy. All worlds. So if Tippy's Timpany, then it must be Tippy who's been having all of these fan fictions. She's been talking about Blue Bear. Oh, don't do it. Ah, makes so much sense. It seems like after each Pierre Heart we collect. She can regain a bit of her memory. As we know, when she was transformed into a pixel, she lost basically all of it, so, um... I don't know why the pure heart does that, but... Cool. For the last time, we head back to Merlin's place, and... I told what we already know. Count Black must be defeated, and now that we have all eight pure hearts, we can place the final one in his heart pillar. And instead of going to the flip side tower, this time we need to head to the flop side tower. Speaking of flip side and flop side, they have been the hub world for this entire game, and yet I still really haven't talked about them, basically at all. So, how about before we head to the final chapter, we talk about flip side and flop side? Does that sound good? I hate to be such a dick tease about the final chapter, but I mean, hey. Screw you. Flipside and Flopside are mirrored towns, and that goes for the shop stores and buildings and NPCs as well. So when I go over something in Flipside, I'm also going to go over its Flopside counterpart, because a lot of the time they're basically the same thing with small differences. So, let's go. First things first, 
Let's cover the shop stores and different buildings throughout Flipside and Flopside, and no better place to start than with the shop run by Housit. The shop itself is nothing special, it just sells your general everyday items you'd find in the first shop of the game. But there's one item that's unique here, being the star medal that you can buy and when used it gives you XP. I don't know, it's just kind of interesting that you can purchase XP in this game, I don't know how many RPGs decide to do that. As for Hazard himself, he actually runs basically every single shop in the game. You'll find this guy in the old town, outer space, with the Kragnons, everywhere. If there's a shop, he's running it. Except for the itty bitty shops, those are run by... I don't actually know who they're run by. Counterpart to how's it is not so. He hopes you have a not so bad day. It took me an embarrassing long amount of time to figure out the pun of these two guys' names. But you know what? I get it now, and I'm enjoying it. His shop is, again, kind of just your standard items, but a lot of things here are more expensive, you'll find, like Super Shrooms and Ultra Shrooms. It's nice that you can purchase them. Again, not much of interest, though. Although, he also does have another Star Medal-type item. It's the Gold Medal. It's more money, but you get more XP, so... I mean, hey. Neat stuff, I guess. Besides purchasing items, you can store items at both of these locations, although they don't have a separate storing facility, it's all the same. In fact, I think this goes for every shop in the game, except for, I guess, like the itty bits ones and the convenience store in outer space. But come on, I mean, those are obviously different. Are they run by... Well, I guess the outer space one is run by Housed. Anyways, yeah, you can store things, pick them up, and you can also sell items you find here. So, yeah as you would come to expect with a shop in an RPG. I didn't really go over them yet, although I did mention them. Itty bit shops, you'll find these places scattered throughout the game. You can enter them using Dottie, who I don't think I really mentioned can do that, just that they can go in tiny doors, but yeah, they can go in these tiny doors specifically. The items they sell at these places aren't super useful, just basic healing items. But a lot of the time, these are the only means of buying these items, and a lot of the time, the items they sell are very useful for recipes, so I guess they're useful in that aspect. And also, they share a point system with the other shops. You can't store anything here, but they share the point system, which I guess I should go over the point system. Point system, anytime you buy an item, you get one point. For every ten points you get, you'll get a random item. Usually something, again, useful for recipes, but, like, not super good for actual healing. Think, like, cake mix or something. Next up is Tignazin. You pay her five coins, spend the night, and when you wake up, you'll be fully healed. Uh, that's about it. Although it does state in the game that this was originally a mansion she inherited, to which she transformed it into an inn. So that's kind of interesting. Her flopside counterpart is Igna. Same type of deal, except for she has special packages, a mushroom flower and star. When you pay for them, when you wake up in 3D, you'll find different items. For the mushroom package, which costs 10 coins, you'll find a dried shroom. Flower package, which is 20 coins, you'll find a peachy peach. And 40 coins, the star package, you will find a slimy shroom when you wake up. Next up, we've got Merlevely's fortune telling shop, which, um, is basically this game's hint system. You pay her coins, and she'll tell you what to do next. Simple as that. Her flopside counterpart, we've also already met, Merle. she'll sell you charms, which I've already gone over, but I'll be a bit more in depth. She sells you trial advised and special packages. Best priced one is technically the advised package, which is normally 100 coins for 10. Special package is uh, 200 for 15, and trial is 5 for 50. So yeah, there you go. Although I actually got something wrong, not all of her uh, charms are free, just the first one. And it's only free if you do the side quest, so, yeah. Next up is Merlin's house, which has Merlin in it. What else do you want me to say? You just go back here after every chapter, yada yada. And then we move down to the basement, which has got a couple of houses, but I'm not gonna cover them until we cover the NPCs. So, next, we have Sweet Smiles. Sweet Smiles is run by Saffron, who will cook anything you give her. Anything, even if it turns out awful. She'll cook it. In the corner of this place, there's a DS that has a list of ingredients and where to find them, as well as a few recipes you can cook. Throughout the game, you'll find these cooking discs that you can plug into this DS, getting even more ingredients and recipes. It's pretty helpful for, well, making recipes and finding ingredients, especially since 
I don't think other Paper Mario games had something like this. Maybe they did. Uh, it's probably something. Either way, though, it's nice. Her flopside counterpart is called Dillis, and she owns Hot From. Same type of deal, she has the DS and stuff, it's all the same, except she'll cook two ingredients. You can combine them, getting pretty interesting stuff. Next up is Catch Dream, which is related to everything Catch Cards. If you don't remember Catch Cards, I'll catch you up to speed. There's 256 of them in total. You can find them of various characters and enemies. You can use items called Catch Cards to catch enemies in cards. Getting their card will also let you deal double damage to them, and it also stacks with how many cards you get of them. At Catch a Dream, you can buy these catch bags, where for 10 coins, you'll get a random catch card. It can be rare, it can be common, it's just random. And you guys want to buy uh, just normal catch cards here. You can also sell catch cards here. Their price will vary depending on their rarity. On top of that, this place is run by Hooden, and his flopside counterpart, Budin, runs Fondus Hoops, another card shop. This one sells catch card SPs instead of the normal catch cards. The item, not the actual, like, cards themselves. I know it's the item is the same thing as the actual, like, collectible. It's weird. I guess they're just called cards, but I always call them catch cards. Anyways, um, you can buy cot cards here. Yeah, instead of the randomized bags like before, you can buy them individually, although like before, prices will vary depending on how rare they are. But it's nice that once you have a lot of them and you just need specific ones, you can buy them here, although the stock is limited. Heading down a floor, we find the underwear. No, not the actual place, but a bar. The flopside variant's called the Over There. I kind of like this though, it's pretty cool how they're like, named after those places, but you haven't been to those places when you find these bars, so it's kind of like, what are they called? This is like a, the hint of things to come. I like it. As for the bars themselves, not much. There's just guys in here that really like milk and flip side, and guys that really like coffee and flop side. So that's what the bars serve. Although you can't actually buy from them. Instead, you can buy information from Garson and flip side and Carson and flop side. They've got a lot of lore and just general information. You talk to these guys a lot after each chapter if you want to get all their info because there's just so much here. It's crazy how much lore they locked behind this and it just adds a lot of depth to the game. These guys are very important if you want to learn more about this game. So, yeah. Hidden inside of the underwear bar, we find the secret exclusive Flipside Arcade, run by the Interchat. Here, you can play a variety of mini games, earn tokens, and use those tokens for rewards, like any arcade. A lot of these mini games are um, pretty basic, but they're really fun. They all use motion controls to some extent, and they're just, they're just, they're just nice, fun, simple mini games. We got this memory game that you gotta do. You have this Tilt Island game, tilt the Wii Remote and Mario will move accordingly try and dodge the spiky enemies, and everyone's favorite, from what I could tell, this mansion minigame. You're trying to save toads and shoot boos. It's great. They're all really fun, and yeah. There is one last secret hidden minigame that you have to have the golden card for, which you'll find in the flop side bar hidden in 3D where the entrance to the arcade normally would be. And with the golden card, you can play this hammer whacker minigame where this trooper striker will kick shells at you and you gotta whack them away with your hammer. It's pretty fun. It costs t 10 extra tokens to play opposed to the normal 10. You gotta pay 20. But it's also the easiest way to get tokens. On my first try, I easily got 100 tokens. At least once I easily, it was pretty close. But I also got the top high score. That's right. Fuck you, Hercules. And fuck you. Get wrecked and Hort, and Miffy, and Fred. They're all garbage compared to Luigi. Why is Luigi's L backwards? Anyways, um, speaking of Luigi, it, the character changes depending on who you're playing as, so like, if you play as Luigi in the Amber minigame, you actually play as Luigi. But for stuff like the Tilt Island minigame, like, if you're playing as Bowser, this shit's rough. Next up is Flim. Flim is in the basement of Flipside, and he'll sell you a variety of items, all at a discounted price, and some of them 
some can be pretty rare. Stuff like the Shooting Star is pretty useful because you can buy it cheap here. If he has it, his stock is pretty limited and it's just kind of random what he has. But if he does have some stuff like a Shooting Star, you can buy it for cheap, cook it, and turn it into a Meteor Meal, which sells for a lot of coins. He's just a helpful guy. Who doesn't love Flim? He's great. His flop side counterpart is Flam. Yes, yeah, Flim Flam, which apparently means a swindle and you learn something new every day. Flam's a bit more different. A lot different, actually. He sells maps and they all vary in prices. What you do is you look at the map and there's a X on it and like it'll have an image. It's like an AL treasure map and you go to that location and you use Fleep on the X where it would be and you get an item. There's 48 of them in total and yeah you can get a lot of good stuff from this and also a lot of bad stuff from it and they uh, maps are really expensive sometimes. This is needed for 100%ing and has its own little section um but uh yeah we'll cover this more in depthly later last but not least is welderberg you'll find him throughout the game always hidden in 3d and anytime you talk to him they'll ask if you want a pipe built and these pipes are pretty helpful he can build one from the main floor of flip side all the way down to the basement floor the floor that has the pit of 100 trials on it and he can also do that in flop side both of these will cost you 100 coins, but still, it's a pretty helpful travel. The big one he can do for you, though, is also in the main floor of Flipside and takes you to the main floor of Flopside. That pipe saves this game's overworld. Honest to God, I would hate this game's overworld if it weren't for this fucking pipe. Because traveling from Flipside to Flopside without this pipe is awful there's so many elevators you have to go through you have to flip into 3d several times and you have to go through that mural mural room again it's just the worst thank god for this pipe because it makes traveling between flip side and flop side so much easier and just so much better i, I, I love you welderberg you make this game's overworld actually really good so we've covered all the big NPCs, but what about the smaller random ones? The ones that you're probably not going to talk to, but you can. This may sound strange, but I love these NPCs. They're just so good. I hear a lot of people complain about them, saying they're not as good as previous Paper Mario games. But personally, I just don't think people talk to these guys and just assume that they're not as good. Because starting off, yeah, they do have a bit of generic text. But if you keep talking to them throughout the game, they really get good. So, we're going to talk about every single one of them. I'll be brief, for the most part, because some of these guys are legendary here. As I mentioned before, the NPCs starting off kind of have generic dialogue. Although I wouldn't even call it generic, just not showing much character. They're all focused on the void. And same goes for the end game. They're pretty much all focused on the void. However... In between those two parts, these guys are great. Starting with the first floor of Flipside, we have Skeet and his counterpart, Pete. They both are obsessed with the Twin Towers, not those ones, the Flipside and Flopside ones. And it's just great, like, they are in love with these things, and the idea of another tower existing disgusts them. Skeet hates the color black, he's racist, I think. Pete hates the color white. He's racist, I think. They're racist, alright? Hey man, I can't be mad at them for loving their towers, are you okay? Skeet is also the person who first found Princess Peach when she falls from the sky, so, um, there you go. Fun Super Paper Mario trivia, huh? Next up is Pook, who loves the sea. He's also that kid that owns Captain Gills, so yeah, after you uh, put Captain Gills in that water, that's basically all he talks about, but it's really nice. He loves Captain Gills, she always visits him, and it's just a nice thing. His flop side counterpart is Puck, who, contrary to him, loves the sky and everything about it. He's always talking about how he wants to fly, and how he doesn't like homework, and how he wants to be a carapoopa. You know, the turtle guys that can fly. 
Next up, moving down to the second floor, we have Chap, who loves the peacefulness and quietness of Flipside, although throughout the game he starts to change his mood about things, wishing something exciting would happen. Of course, every event he says or lists has actually already happened, and he's just oblivious to it. Especially the void, like how does he not see the void, it's whatever. Anyways, his flap side counterpart is Slim, who really isn't much of a counterpart outside of looks, they don't have anything in common. Although apparently in the PAL version, Chap's name is Glim, Glim Slim gives him something. Anyways, this guy loves women, he's always pining over one of them. He goes from Merle to Tigna to freaking Nastasia, like goddamn, what a simp. Next up is Fred, who is pretty worried about this whole end of the world thing. He's got a bucket list of stuff he wants to do before he dies, but um, he's too focused on, you know, his game's ending that uh, to actually do them. His flop side counterpart is Chet, who's kind of the complete opposite and just can't wait to see this world die. He loves the void. He can't wait to see what happens when everything goes boom. Next up, we've got Minnie, who I'm convinced is being paid by Merlovely to advertise for her fortune telling shop because, god damn it, that's all this girl talks about. All she wants to be is a fortune telling person. She loves fortune telling. She recommends fortune telling. That's all she talks about. She's been brainwashed by Merlovely, I swear. And her flop side counterpart, Winnie, is much the same, just obsessed with the charms and Merle instead. I feel bad for these two girls, I swear they've been brainwashed. Next up is Muffy, who just really likes Flipside. She's always talking about some sort of building in Flipside or something that you can do in Flipside, and she's just a very trendy hip teen. She ends every single sentence with babe. Her Flipside counterpart is much the same, just rather Flipside. Her name is Lucy, and she doesn't talk as hip and cool as uh, Muffy does. Honestly, she speaks kind of weird these guys aren't super interesting although there is something interesting about them being their name apparently the word muff has certain implications in the uk and so muffy's name was changed to lucy and lucy's name was changed to lacy in the uk version or pal version although weirdly enough even in the pal version muffy's high score name is still m f f y so i guess they cared but not that much <laughs> Tell me, have you met Blue who lives on the first floor? His face amuses me. I want to go see him now. Mayhap I should go peek in his window later on. Strictly speaking, girls should not talk to him. He has a history. What do you mean he has a history? What does that imply? Next up is Nora, who also likes Slipside like Muffy, although she's a bit more sweet about it. She was born and raised here, and out of the good will of her heart, she sweeps the streets every single day. That's how much she loves Flipside. Her Flopside counterpart, Carla, is much the same, just with Flopside. Although apparently her answer to the world destroying Flopside is to open a convenience store. Moving on down to the first floor, we have Walter and Gladys, who are a married couple and are very, very old, being married for 60 years, the game says. Although they've been married for 60 years and Walter has basically gone completely senile, Gladys just can't help but love him. She says she's fallen in love with him all over again and he's mighty hunky. Yeah, it's an ideal marriage right here is what we've got. Their flopside counterpart, though, is quite the opposite. Their names are Gertrude, the wife, and Harold, the husband. Same type of deal, married for like 60 years, super old. Except, these guys are questioning their entire life's purpose. They grew up very poor and couldn't even afford a wedding, a dress, a ring. And they just question if what they really wanted out of life was this. It's just a really dark idea. The world's about to end and these guys are just like questioning if they've wasted their whole lives. I mean, it's kind of funny though. Especially when compared to like Walter and Gladys who are just happy. Next is Sacre, who is an artiste. He's always looking for something new to add to his art, the next big thing. 
and is always striving to be the top creator, the big dog at the top of the artist chain. However, his art has kind of been on a downward spiral since he got married and had a child. Speaking of his child, you can talk to her, Ellie. She lets us in on, um, Sakurai's marital situation, and apparently, his wife has to go and sell his paintings, and she can never sell a single one, and she's barely at the house, always only coming back every once in a while, and for very short periods of time. And on top of all that, Ellie feels slightly responsible for her father's downfall in the art industry, which... God! <laughs> it's awful! And, um... Move a to their flop side counterpart, it's not much better, arguably worse. Blue is um Sakurai's counterpart and Lily is Ellie's counterpart. And um Blue just says the same thing every single time you talk to the guy, or basically the same thing, just telling you to get the hell out of his house because he's an artist snob who thinks you're stupid, I guess. Talk to Lily, who seems very mature for her age. Questioning the things her mother tells her and also having a pretty good grasp of their marital situation Which is presumably divorce judging from how Ellie talk or Lily talks so Yeah, this isn't great either. Also blue is the guy that that one girl was pining over Yeah, the one that got divorced, which I guess is what she meant by uh, He has a history It all comes together, huh? Next up is Muffy. Yep, there's another character called Muffy in this game, although just like at the PAL version, it was changed. This time it was changed to Tina, and her flopside counterpart is called Nina, which Muffy's counterpart in this game is called Buffy, which I just find hilarious. Anyways, basement, I guess not even basement, first floor Muffy here, really, really likes Saffron's cooking again. I'm convinced she's being paid to be an advertiser for her because she it's all she freaking talks about is her recipes. And same with Buffy, except for instead of Saffron, it's Dillis' cooking and stuff, so um yeah. Are you ready for the Sherry saga? Because this game has a Sherry saga. Alright, so Sherry, she's a well-known song artist and a good singer, whatever, right? And she loves her boyfriend. Her boyfriend's the greatest. She brings her gifts all the time. Great guy, right? But over the game, she, she loves him. But she starts to grow suspicious of him because he won't tell her where he works. And it grows throughout the game. She just keeps getting more suspicious. She asks, asks him. She nags him. And eventually he gets mad and he storms out. But this only grows her suspicion more so eventually she gets the idea to follow him to his work you know to see finally see where this guy works but as soon as she gets this idea as soon as she gets the idea he wakes up early and just leaves before she even has the chance to follow him so her plan doesn't work out and i would tell you what happens next but guess what we don't find that out until we beat the game and so until we beat the game you don't get to find out, so you gotta stay tuned, and it's well worth the wait for the Sherry Saga. Her flopside counterpart is Carrie, who is in a similar situation. She's a songwriter, but she's nowhere near as well known or anything. And she also has a boyfriend, but it's a little sad because apparently her boyfriend loves the arcade more than she does. She says her boyfriend's like a songwriter or something, and they write songs together and sing them. It's sweet, but yeah. I guess he's a he's a gamer, <laughs> so that's unfortunate for her. Next up, we've got Otto and Ditto. Otto has always got some new piece of information to share with you, and it's always super ridiculous common knowledge. Like, did you know if you eat a mushroom, you'll heal HP? I, crazy, bro! And then Ditto has actually, like, obscure information that he thinks everyone is already knows in his common knowledge. But it's, it's actually legitimately, like, helpful information. Stuff like Bowser's Fire Breath can break brick blocks. Like, I didn't know that. When you use Dottie, you can, like, enemies won't notice you. Which, like, I feel like I did know that, but I kind of forgot about it. I definitely didn't mention it when I went over Dottie. So, yeah, that's kind of useful, like... Yeah, he's just a cool guy. He undercuts himself. Ditto, 
you know, you're better than you give yourself credit for. You, you need a hug. Next up is Pitta, who's really, really into catch cards and just collecting them and finding them all. He's always telling you about his new latest cool card. So that counterpart is Pata, who is the complete opposite and hates catch cards and he's really annoyed as all his classmates for having them, but he also doesn't like feeling left out of them. Uh, poor kid. Once you obtain Boomer, you can blow up this wall on the first floor flip side and get to the back parts of it. First character here is Hieronicus. I think I called him like Hercule. I don't even know, but it's Hieronicus. This guy's kind of interesting. He's one of the only flip side characters that doesn't actually have a counterpart. I think the only other one is Welderberg. So. He's got that going for him, and he's an adventurer. He used to explore the lands, and he's got tons of stuff from the different chapters in this house. He's got, like, a um, picture of, like, a square pole. He has, like, the Mimi's vase thing. we got lots of stuff in it. It's a cool house. And uh, he's just a cool character. I, I don't know. I kind of like his design. He's interesting. On top of that, he also appears in Chapter 6. He's the first guy that you see there. He's fighting the Samur guys. Wow. Next up is Pearl and her granddaughter, Betsy. Pearl's a super sweet grandmother with a dark past, previously being known as Razor Pearl. Her granddaughter, Betsy, is sweet and naive, but also asks a lot of questions to her grandmother. Mainly, how did she get to live so long? To which... Her grandmother will respond with some typical question that makes sense and is actually true of how you want to live long. But Betsy always seems to take it in the worst way possible. Their flopside counterparts, Ruby and Mitzi, are, well, the opposite. Ruby always gives the worst advice about how to live long. And, well, Mitzi takes it, but she doesn't seem to be nearly as naive as Betsy is, so... I guess she's... She, she's more okay. <laughs> Next up is Helvetica, whose name is based on a typeface, which, um, I didn't know that. It's kind of interesting. His name is based on a typeface because he is a writer. However, he, while he has a lot of good ideas, he writes real slow and his stuff never gets published. And every time he tries to publish it, he finds out that his idea has been stolen and someone's already come up with it. He's, he's real upset about that and he's, he's struggling bad. Turns out that his flopside counterpart, Garamond, whose name is also based off a typeface, Kim comes up with the same ideas he does because when Helvetica dreams, he meets Garamond and they share ideas. Oh, well, rather, Helvetica shares his ideas and then Garamond takes his ideas and since he's a fi faster writer, he gets them out before Helvetica does. And how Garamond is a super good, well-known novelist and stuff, so... Yeah. Poor Helvetica. Next up is Patch, who talks about Flim, and that's it. I kid you not, I, that's all he does, he just talks about Flim. I don't even think his text changes throughout the whole entire game. Apparently he's a window shopper, and he's always just looking, and everyone hates him. Man... Poor Patch. Slop's like counterpart Hatch is a bit more interesting. He always hangs out inside that house that's uh, locked until you get the key and then it's got Piccolo inside. Yeah, that one. He seems to know a bit about it because apparently a great explorer once lived there and sold all of his treasure maps to, uh, what's Flim's counterpart again? Chap, right? No. Wait. Flam. Flam. Flam, that's his name. Yeah, he gave them all to Flam. Perhaps this great explorer is Hieronicus's flopside counterpart. Next up is Chap. Yup, there's another guy named Chap. I don't know why they repeated so many names with these guys, but hey, at least this Chap looks different than the other Chap. Chap is in the underwear bar all the time, and he enjoys the milk that is served there. He drinks it every day, arriving early at like noon, and never leaves until the day's over. Flapside counterpart is Chip, who does the same at the over there bar. And Flapside, although they don't serve milk, they serve coffee, so uh, yeah, he drinks that instead. Not much else going on, these guys just really enjoy their beverages. Next up is Mort and Hort. These guys are interesting that they are counterparts, yet they are found in the same place, the Flipside Arcade. 
Port's amazing at the arcade and has the high scores on all the games. So yeah, he's pretty cool, but he's not very cool because according to Tippy, he is a master of video games, but not the game of love. Mort, on the other hand, is awful at video games and has lost like all of his money playing them. So um, poor, poor man, poor man. Next up is Busy, who is the last person we're going to talk about, well, besides him and his flop set counterpart, who is Ledger. Busy himself is a magazine editor and is, well, constantly busy, always having delays and needing to do stuff to get it on time, and uh, doesn't seem all too concerned about the void until he realizes it's going to destroy all the worlds, to which he's pretty okay with it, actually. His flop side counterpart, Ledger, is the complete opposite. He is super good at his work, always has stuff on time, and apparently married the daughter of his boss, but he's barely home, so he rarely sees her or talks to her. Wow. And that is all of the NPCs in Flipside and Flopside. I think you can tell why I like these guys now, because they just have more personality and thought put into them than I think a lot of people give them credit for. I see a lot of people say that they're way worse than the NPCs in other Paper Mario games, but, um, I don't know. I think they're really good. As for Flipside and Flopside themselves, we're basically done talking about them. I mean, I guess there is stuff like the outskirts and, like, the enemies that you'll find throughout Flipside and Flopside and the secrets, but I'm not gonna go over all those individually. You can, like, find those for yourselves or whatever. I guess the only other thing of note, though, is you can find... HP plus and power plus things here. Yeah, like the badges from previous Paper Mario games. They're pretty cool, um, but they don't work like an actual badge. They're an item. You can use them and it'll permanently up your HP or your attack. Still though, pretty cool that you can find these things regardless. With all of that out of the way, there is only one thing left for us to do. Place the final peer heart inside of the heart pillar and head up to the last door and enter the final world, which this time the door isn't at Flipside Tower, it's at Flopside Tower. There's a big giant black one up there. So, yeah. After placing the final beer art in the last heart pillar, Norm approaches us saying that our time has come and we should make our final preparations for battle and to meet us at the top of Flopside Tower. We find him up there, and the door as well, and it's come to this. Nothing's left except for us. This door, the AP hearts, I guess there's a lot of stuff still here, but you get what I mean. Merlin also comes along, saying something about the light prognosticus and how the heroes can only win if they believe in themselves, if they haven't lost hope. He also talks to Tippy, saying stuff about her memory and how this might be difficult for her, implying that he knows about Tippy's past with Count Black, which is kind of interesting. But we have no time for that. The ends of all the world are at stake. No matter what Tippy thinks, she's gonna have to suck it up and fight her ex-boyfriend. So let's head into the final chapter. Chapter 8 1 The Impending Darkness. At long, long last, we have finally made it to Castle Black, and what a castle it is. We find ourselves inside of the void, apparently. So that's kind of cool that the final level takes place inside of the void, this thing we've been seeing throughout the whole game. I don't really understand how Castle Black is inside the void if it's supposed to destroy everything, but you know what? It gets a pass, because this thing is just badass. Look at it in 3D. It's so sick. Starting things off are the new enemies, Koopa Trolls. They've appeared in previous Paper Mario games and make a reappearance here. 
they're pretty tough, having a lot of defense and pretty good attack at that. They'll charge after you when they see you in the line of sight. And they're also like Koopas, so when you jump with them, they just go into their shells. You don't even defeat them, although you can use stuff like Kutch to, you know, actually defeat them. Next up are the Magiblots. They come in a variety of colors, including blue, red, and yellow. They'll teleport around in 2D and in 3D, shooting magical projectiles at you. And they make for a challenging enemy. I mean, they can flip in 2D and 3D. That's something that not every enemy can say for themselves. The colors actually do have stat changes on top of that. The blue ones have the highest HP, but lowest attack. The blue ones have the highest attack, but lowest HP. And the yellows are all around average. And we also have the Fire Bros, who shoot fire, but in this game they shoot it out of their mouth instead of their hand. I kind of like this change, though. It's just more cartoony and, I don't know, just better than their hand, what can I say? I guess that's also how they originally threw fires out of their mouths, like in Mario Bros. 3. So, that's kind of neat. There are a bunch of other new enemies, but they're all just simple reskins. We have the Red Eyes, Gobbuses, and Super Strikers. So, yeah, they're new, just stronger variants of previous enemies. Now, for the level design itself, I love the look of this place. It is just fun to look at. I mean, we've seen it before when we were playing as Peach or Luigi, and we were like, run around here and try not to get caught by like the stage and yada yada yada. But regardless, it's just so cool to see this place again. It's cool to go to those places that you were at when you were Peach or Luigi, because it's just, it's just neat. It's just neat, man. Um, it is ba pretty basic, though. I mean, there's lots of enemies around, and you gotta find, like, this key. You gotta match these torches and stuff. It's, you know, standard stuff, but still, I mean, it looks really cool. Just like these stairs. Incredible. Beyond these stairs is none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Oh Chunks. We have fought this guy so many times throughout this game, and yet here he is once again. But this time, oh, Bowser's picking a fight with him. He wants to go. They're about to have a big cock off, if you know what I mean. Bowser orders Mario Luigi to get Princess Peach out of the room and let him handle O-Chunks. And so they brawl! O-Chunks has 100 HP and 4 attack, and on top of that, he can now perform some aerial attacks. I wouldn't know what they were, because I defeated him in 5 hits, because I'm playing as Bowser, who deals 20 damage right now. So it wasn't very hard, but he gets really big, so um, he's got that going for him. Bowser defeats O-Chunks, and he's pretty sad once again, asking for him to end his games, just let him have his dignity, but Bowser's actually a little friendly, saying there's no shame in losing to such a studly boss like him. Mario, Peach, and Luigi all come back in the room, and the ceiling comes crashing down! But O-Chunks saves them. What a guy! He says for them to let them on through. They allowed that. Bowser defeat him square and fair. So just go. But Bowser's like, no, I, I'm gonna hold this too. I can hold this all day. And they have a big cock off, like I said. Uh, and they leave the room. And that's 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 not good. The door won't budge, and by the sounds of it, the ceiling came crashing down, and Bowser and O-Chunks are presumably dead. But Peach says they don't have time, and they must keep going, and as Luigi says, eh, Bowser's probably fine. I mean, he survived worse, so yeah, they continue forth without Bowser, finishing chapter 8-1. Chapter 8-2 The Crash The void grows larger yet 
and the end of all worlds creeps ever closer. Peach questions Count Black's plan. I mean, this is going to end up destroying him as well, so just what kind of evil plan is this? Tippy is concerned about Bloomy Air. I mean, it makes sense, but that can't get in the way of saving all worlds. So, we continue forth. No super new enemies, although there are still some new enemies in name only, being the stronger recolored variants. We have Zoingoins, Chromebas, and Blast Boxers. Those are it. 8 2 is laid out similarly to 8 1, but it's got a key difference. See, we may start out fighting all these enemies, but then we find Merlin. Yeah, he came all the way here just to help us. He says that for us to hit this block and it'll do amazing things for us. And, oh! You sly dog, Mimi. We are thrusted into jail yet again. However, we can escape using our puzzle skills. I see this puzzle a little obtuse. It took me a while to figure it out. Basically, you got this pipe room. You can go up to it and oh wow, there's a bunch of pipes here. And then there's this one really long pipe that goes all the way out of the room. And on the left and right of this place, there's like these other rooms, these corridors that you walk down. And at the end of them, there's a block. When you hit the block, it'll move the pipe that you leave through. And yeah, you need to move that pipe towards the needed pipe that leaves out. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. It just like, you kinda gotta figure it out, alright? But you get the key, you leave, and you continue onwards. Another hallway filled to the brim with lots of enemies. And then we find a large room with three inconspicuously placed hanging mushrooms. Yeah, you fall down them and there's enemies in the pits. One of these enemies has got the key. You grab the key and you can leave the room. To which we find Merle. Merle is here to ask us some questions. Uh, only for our own survival, I guess. So yeah, like, which beast is harder for you to make deceased? Goomba, Club, or Ultra Shroom? And then Hammer Bro, Fuzzies, or Thunder Rage. And then the last one, a Maisy Daisy, Francis, or Cooking Mistake. Now, I chose the good options for the first two, but for the last one, I chose Francis. And get this, you actually get to fight Francis. It's amazing. I love this part so much. He says that he was just sitting in his comfy chair watching Starship X9 when all of a sudden he warped here. Maybe his Recolatron 4500 extrapolated his dreams and couch warped him to Francine. Nothing's gonna take you away from me this time. Yeah, he's, he's still same old Francis. In fact, he even has like the same stats basically. And he's 40 HP and one attack and he behaves the exact same. Although you're gonna actually like tippy him this time, and she says that just looking at him gives her bad memories. Yeah, getting kidnapped will probably do that to you. After defeating Francis, he says he's gonna redo it on a simulation to see what went wrong. Yeah, anyways. I, he just disappears. What happens? Did he go home? Is he just stuck in this room? I don't... Anyways, you leave. And Merle is pissed. Or not Merle. Rather Mimi. Yeah, once again, it's Mimi. And this time, she's freaking angry as all hell. She's throwing insults at Princess Peach. Saying that, oh, she has a lot of talk when she has her boyfriends around, and then she gets serious. Peach is pissed, and she tells Mario and Luigi to get out, understood? And then they, they leave, walking backwards. I love this part so much. And you get to fight Mimi only as Peach. This time, Mimi transforms into a creepy spider transformation. And we brawl, well, Peach and Tippy and the Pixels too, which I guess I should also mention, yeah, you're only limited to Peach, but you still get all the Pixels and Tippy at your disposal. Um, same goes for the Bowser fight. Anyways, this fight is very similar to the one from the 
bathroom. She's got a couple new moves. She does like four attack. Gotta break a hole in legs to defeat her. It's the same type of deal. She can like, I don't know, twirl around with the rubies around her. She can summon rubies from the ground. I don't really remember if that one was new, but she can do it. And yeah, she's just same thing, but a little stronger. And Peach defeats her as, you know, Peach is better than Mimi, obviously. After defeating her, the bros come back in the room, and Mimi is sad and on her knees. And sad, because she lost. The bros continue onward, and Peach takes one last look at Mimi, and tells her to find somewhere safe. Mimi says as if she cares, and then, uh-oh, a disaster strikes. That's not great. And on top of that, the door is locked. Uh-oh. Apparently, the floor caved in, but Peach leapt into action and saved Mimi and is hanging on for dear life. Mimi says she doesn't want her stupid help, but Peach says that she was raised to help others. But it's not enough. And one last tremor, and they fall. That's, um, that's not great. And the door still won't open. Bowser and Peach are now both gone. What are we to do? And, well, Tippy says to just keep going. To which... The bros are hesitant at first, but, I mean, it's the end of all worlds. They should probably keep going. That's what Princess Peach would have wanted anyway. So, they continue forth, and that ends Chapter 8-2. Chapter 8-3! Countdown to Destruction! All that's left is Mario and Luigi. But, we must continue onwards. The void is growing yet. They just used the Mario sound effect for Luigi. What the hell game? As for new enemies, just simple recolored stronger variants. We have Sobari Bads, Agarithms, Longa Dials, and Red Jumps. This place has so many enemies. Just so many. Everywhere you go, there's just a bunch of enemies. They are really trying their all to make this final section as difficult as they can be. And I like it. This game's been pretty easy up to this point. You might as well make the last chapter as difficult as you can. We fought Ochunks and Mimi, so naturally, it's time for us to fight Dementio. He taunts us throughout the whole level. Well, I guess I wouldn't say taunts, but... You find his clones throughout the level, and they'll shoot projectiles at you while you're trying to figure out what to do. Like in this mirror section, where there's a bunch of these mirrors, but only a couple of them don't glimmer. And there's one in particular that's really easy to jump through, because it's fake, it's not even a mirror, it's just, it's just a hole in the wall. You go through there and you can get a key. There's another section that's very similar to this, with the whole fake mirrors and Dementio thing, but there's just a... BUNCH OF DEMENTIOS HERE! It's really weird and disturbing. There's also this other section, it's nothing to do with dementia, you're just hitting blocks, but it kind of stumped me for a bit, because like, you hit these blocks, and then all oh, doors appear, and then there's this other room that already has a door. But you have to hit the block above it anyways to spawn another door, and you go in this room, and you hit the block on the left, and you get a key, and then you can continue onwards, but like... I don't know, it took me a while to figure out, okay? Then you have this platform section where you have to figure out like which route to take and to get to the door so it'll take you to the right place without just looping you back. Kind of like in the original Super Mario Bros. and some of the castles. This also stumped me for a bit. Just in general, this is a pretty confusing, puzzling level. And I like it. Eventually, making it through all of the tricks and traps throughout Castle Black, we meet up with it, Dementio, who comments on the fact that we are missing the Ravishing Princess and the Arm Flailer. I guess he does like the Flail's arms a lot, doesn't he? Tippy tells him to just move out of the way, we don't have time for him. And he says he will, 
If we can defeat him first, we've proven to be powerful enemies in the past, so he's not gonna make it easy on us this time. And we also have to play a game of tag. But with magic! He summons a dimensional space rift, I guess. We flip it, we hit the block, and are teleported to Line Land. We can't go through any of the doors here, although there is Dementio, so I guess we should probably chase after him. There's uh, enemies, I mean, this is just Line Land 1 1, a section from it. We continue chasing after him and eventually catch up, but. We are met with yet another dimensional space rift and another block to hit, and then we are taken to Merle's mansion and continue chasing him, and we continue doing this through a bunch of different levels. We go to the Bitlands under the water with the bloopers, we go to outer space on that one planet, we go to the Craigland warning through there, and we even go to the Samurai Kingdom when it's all dead and destroyed. And we also even go to the underwear. He takes us through every single place throughout this game. One big magical field trip. But eventually we are warped back to Castle Black. Now I may have enjoyed that trip around all the levels, but Chippy the Heroes and everyone else didn't really seem to appreciate it much. And they tell them to stop messing around. But he says he's not messing around. He's been watching the heroes, and they are the only ones that can stand up to Count Black. And he asks them if they will help him destroy Count Black. What are you talking about? You want to betray him? Betray him? <laughs> oh no, it is Count Black who has betrayed me. He said he would destroy all worlds and create a new perfect world in their place. But he was lying. He plans to obliterate every world and then keep them all in ruin. I have always known about his nefarious goal, but I could never hope to stop him on my own. I fiend loyalty to him as I search for someone who could defeat him with me. Well, you see, that is why I rescued the princess from certain brainwashing. It's also why I sent you to the underwear to fix the broken fear heart, and why I freed a man to be reunited with his brother. Now do you see? You've been helping us all this time. Ah, <laughs> you've got me pegged! Now how about you return the favor? I'll give you the power you need to crush Count Black. Just fight by my side. Still you refuse? But this offer trips with generosity! With the chaos heart in our hands, we can rule every world. Do you still refuse? So you spit upon my offer. You wasted my time. For that... Your game ends. I think I'll start with the green one. The shag upon his lip will make a fine trophy. Shag? This mustache is all Luigi! Leave this one to me, bro. You run ahead. You've got worlds to save. You don't have time to fight this baddie. Don't let Bowser and Peach's sacrifices be for nothing. Or mine either. Besides, he made fun of my stats, bro. You know I'm sensitive about that. Let me at him. Run for it, bro. Thanks, bro. <laughs> How tender. I just squeezed out a tear. Yes, Mario can run along. And if he somehow manages to defeat Count Black on his own, all the better. And so I strike like an unseen dodgeball in an echoing gymnasium. Dementio has 80 HP and 4 attack. He'll summon clones, he'll throw his Dementio stuff at you. He's the same way he was in Chapter 3, but a little bit stronger. Uh, side note, when you're playing as Luigi here, you actually don't get tippy in all the pixels like when you were playing as Peach or Bowser, so... All you've got is the man in green. However, that's really all you need because he goes down quite easily. I, I cry uncle. Mercy uncle, I say. Had enough to mint you? I didn't need my superstar bro to take on you. I, I see that now. Your power is formidable. 
Which is exactly why I can't let you fall into Count Black's velvet-lined gloves. What are you doing? <laughs> I have you now, Luigi. We will both taste the agony of game overing by magic. <laughs> no! <laughs> Ciao! Well, all that remains is Mario, Tippy, and the Pixels. But Mario says that we must continue on. We'll grieve them all later. We have to stop Count Black. So, with that, we end Chapter 8, Dash 3. Chapter 8-4, Tippy and Count Black. We're ending this game how it began, with just a Mario and Tippy. That's it. Tippy feels pretty sorry for Mario. She promised she'd help find his friends, and now they're all gone forever. But Mario is pretty optimistic. He thinks that they're not dead. They're still alive. So, um... You know, denial is always the first step. Let's get going. Even in the last level of the game, you are still being thrown some new enemies. We have Kaptas, which are stronger versions of the Choppas, Pink Fuzzies, Stronger Fuzzies, and Mega Muts, Stronger Muts. There are also Poison Pokies, but they're a little special. They are stronger Pokies, but, I mean, they have an entirely new status to them being they can poison you. So, yeah, watch out for those guys. This level brings you back to the basics. In this level, you have to use stuff like Tippy's Pointer to find hidden doors, use Mario's 3D to get around objects and obstacles and all that. It's a very elementary level. And I like it for that. It just puts the basics of this game on steroids. This level is divided into three sections, each of which is comprised of two parts. The first section has you fighting poison pokies and captas, and then you have to go through this like little section here with the magiblots you gotta fight and use your tiki pointer to reveal this door which you have not had to do in a very long time. The second section has you platforming around using your 3D mechanic to get around obstacles and jumping over parabuzzies, stuff like that. And then you have to fight a bunch of these mega moths in order to get to the next door. And then after that, you head to the third section, which is the maze. The maze is one of the more difficult parts of this game. See, it is filled to the brim with enemies. Everywhere you go, there are a handful of enemies for you to fight. So you have to fight them while trying to solve a maze and like keep track of where you have been and haven't been and everything looks the same, and the only distinguishing thing that separates each room are the enemies which you're trying to defeat. Not to mention, you can you travel through the maze in 3D, so you have to worry about the 3D meter and flip it into 2D. When you flip it into 2D, then you have to fight the enemies, and it's just this difficult balancing act. I mean, it's not nothing like crazy difficult or anything, but it does bring a challenge and level of difficulty that this game hasn't really done before, and I applaud this section for it. I like the maze, even if it is a pain in the ass. After making it all the way through the maze, we head through this door and are greeted by a set of stairs. There's a save block, an ultra shroom, and one last door. We enter the room and Tippy immediately senses something. The Chaos Heart. At long, long last, we have finally made it to Count Black. He says that we truly are the heroes in the Light Prognosticus, but we are too late to stop the Dark Prognosticus and Count Black. 
Tippy asks him why he would ever want to destroy all worlds, to which he says, Worlds are meaningless, and it's better off that he destroys them all, as if they never existed. Tippy says that if that's the case, then was their meeting meaningless as well? Blumier says that Timpani should already know the answer. He doesn't have to tell her. But the hour has grown too late, and that she should know that by now. Tippy says that the only way to stop all of this is to stop Count Black, and that's exactly why her and Mario have come all this way. Very well, but he will do what he must in order to stop all worlds. That is his role, that is his fate, as it is written in the Dark Prognosticus. He tells Nastasia to leave, and that that's an order. She is hesitant, but leaves. Now with Anastasia gone, it's just Mario, Tippy, and Count Black. He has 150 HP with 8 attack. However, there's a bit of an issue. He's invincible, and we can't touch him. No matter what we do, he just won't take damage. Huh. Try as we might. But we just can't seem to damage him at all. Our attacks do nothing towards him. He scoffs at us, expecting more of a fight from the hero of the Light Prognosticus, and prepares to end our games. Is this the end? Oh, come on, you're giving up already! Come on, man up a little! You never give up this easy when you attack my castle! <laughs> so you are alive then. We would never let you destroy everything, you awful count. Yeah, you tell him, Princess. We aren't going to let you get away with this. We aren't giving up. You'll never win. You're all here, but how? I fell through the floor before I got flattened by the ceiling. And I fell through too and landed right on Bowser. It was a surprisingly soft landing. I don't even know what happened, bro, but the princess found me out cold. But we're all here now, so let's do this. You heard him? Now you've got to deal with all of us. <laughs> when the four heroes are united, it is all as foretold. What's this? What is happening to Count Black? The pure hearts. <sighs> huh? My barrier is gone. Four heroes unite. Their hope burns forth light to shatter the walls of light. Just like Merle said. So be it, says Count Black. But don't celebrate just yet. Your precious worlds aren't safe until my last breath. Let us finally end this. Now the true battle begins with Count Black. Count Black has the exact same stats as before. 150 HP and 8 attack. However, this time, we can actually attack him. He has a variety of moves, being able to summon mini voids that glow after you and deal some damage. He can rush after you with this red glowy attack. He can slow down time, which when you're in the slow down state, when his void attacks connect with you, they deal 8 damage. I think that's how this works. I mean, I couldn't, I, I could only gather so much info. Maybe he could do that without slowing you down, but regardless, he does have an attack that deals 8 damage, but most of the others do like 2 to 3. The other big attack he has is this ginormous void attack that's really weird and like lets you walk in midair to avoid it. You just hold in the opposite direction of it and if you don't then it drags you towards it. I imagine that if you get caught in this then you also take 8 damage and potentially this is even the attack that I got hit with before it's just that he used it like while I was inside it and so because of that I immediately got hit by it. I don't know it's kind of hard to tell. But regardless, 
he has a lot of moves, and I wouldn't say this is like super difficult or anything, but I got hit a fair amount trying to defeat him. And I wasn't like intentionally letting him hit me or anything. No, I was genuinely trying. This is just a really good boss. I like it. However, we must defeat Count Black, or Blumier, I guess we'll call him now. We do just that. Blech. Finish Count Black. Dispatch me and the Chaos Heart will disappear. The prophecy will be undone. Why does it have to end like this? Timpani, when you vanished, I searched long for you. I never gave up looking. I searched and searched. But I've never found you. Without you, the world had no meaning or joy. So I used the forbidden prophecy of the tribe of the ancients to end all worlds. I wanted to destroy everything that had taken you away from me. But I'm here now. No one can keep us apart anymore, don't you see? It is too late. Count Black has done so much evil. It must end. Just knowing that you are still alive and knowing that the world you still live in will continue. It gives me peace. I don't have long to live. You must end my game before the void destroys all. But we're finally together again. Count, look out! N Nastasia. Silly assistant, absorbing my attack to protect him. What an adorably hopeless gesture. I was about to give him the everlasting peace he so desperately wants. Dementio, you're alive? Ah, <laughs> of course! This is my moment! Even if the Count dies, the Chaos Heart won't disappear if I continue to control it. But I needed the power of the Pure Hearts to beat him, and I couldn't do that on my own. So I had you do all the sweaty labor for me. And you even used your Pure Hearts to defeat Count Black. If they make greeting cards to thank people for helping you with evil plans, I owe you one. What are you saying? I'm saying that you no longer have value to me, so I'm ending your games. They're all yours, Mr. L. Huh? Oh, oh ah, why am I flapping my arms? Oh, this this isn't good. I am Mr. L, Master Dementio. What is your bidding? When did this happen? When I sent Luigi here, I planted a seed in the fertile soil of his unconscious, and now that seed has sprouted spectacularly. Mr. L, run along now and get ready for your big entrance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, get ready for the greatest magic show you'll ever see. Nasticus says he's the ideal host for the power of the Chaos Heart. And now I'm going to add my own power to the spicy little concoction. No, stop! 
counted like you looked so tattered and pathetic, I nearly forgot about you. I'll squeeze the life out of you later. Just wait over in that dimension, okay? Great. Now the Chaos Heart is mine! I will use this to destroy all worlds and create perfect new ones. So shall we get started? Now I have all I need to become the king of all worlds. Meet Super Dementio! Try as you might, but he is completely invincible. Just like Count Black before, but this time we don't have the AP hearts to stop him. We hit him over and over and over again, but it just deals no damage. <laughs> I am now invincible! There is nothing you can do! And now it is time for the destruction to begin. Let it begin with you, as you wallow in helplessness like upside-down turtles. L power! Tippy, Count Black, and Anastasia are all trapped in Dementio's dimension. Tippy says they have to do something to help Mario, but they can't. Without the pure hearts, the Chaos Heart cannot be countered, and that they should just give up, says Count Black. But Tippy is not happy about that answer. She says that he promised her they'd find happiness, and that they finally found each other. And they found each other by staying alive, so what's the point of giving up now? They have to try. And all of a sudden, Count Black minions show up. Apparently, the reason they're here is because Nastasia said that the Count would be here. Or at least that she felt like he might be here. The minions are all super supportive of the Count, saying that what Dementio did was really mean, and that they're never gonna leave Count Black's side. And apparently, all of this emotion and feeling and jolly goodness is enough to, I don't know, resurrect the pure hearts, if you will? Bring them back with all of their power? And now that they're powered again, they can be used to stop Super Dementio. So, Tippy takes the eight pure hearts and brings them back to Mario. Let's stop wasting time and finish this, shall we? Ciao. What? What? What's going on? No, the pure hearts. I thought you wasted them all fighting Count Black. What's happening? I'm not invincible anymore. Now's our chance. The Pure Hearts have given us their power. Let's get him! Super Dementio! He has 200 HP and 6 attack with a variety of moves at his disposal. He can slam his fist to the ground or try and stomp on you as well as jumping around the arena. When he's at low HP, he'll slide from one end of the room to the other. In order to attack Super Dementia, you must jump on his head, and you can do this by jumping on these moving blocks with his face on them. However, they are also an attack in and of themselves, as when ordered to, they will shoot mini block projectiles at you. You can also do this weird, like, glowy thing that summons a bunch of them to attack you all in a row. It can be pretty hard to avoid these, but it's not too difficult. 
He also has one last attack that I didn't see, but when he's provoked by a guarding attack, like a Peach's Duck Parasol, for example, he'll summon an army of mini 8-bit Luigi's, like the Pow Pills, and they all jump after you and try and attack you, although they're very weak, dying to hitting uh, anything. They're dying to hitting anything. Super Dementio may have a lot of HP and a lot of different moves, but he is still no match for us. And <laughs> How did you do it? How could I have lost with the power of Luigi and the Chaos Heart and the prophecy? Has it been undone? I think your prophecy was wrong all along. You believed your prophecy and we believed in mopping the floor with you. Nothing is decided entirely by fate, you know? All things determine their destinies. Goodbye now, Dementio. We'll add a footnote to the prophecy about your failure. <coughs> you think this is the end? This isn't finished! You can't stop this now! You can't escape! I've been saving one last surprise! <laughs> Ciao! Eh, uh, what, what am I doing here? So it seems the end of all worlds is really upon us. So defeating Dementia wasn't enough to stop it? I thought the Chaos Art would disappear if the person controlling it fell. Dementio must have left behind a shadow of his power to continue controlling it. It won't last long, but it may be enough to ensure the end of every world. Oh great, so what are we gonna do now? There is only one thing left that we can do. This way. We are here, once again, in the wedding altar. We were here at the beginning of the game when Bowser and Peach got married during the prologue. And now, at the end of the game, we're here once again, but this time, for Count Black and Tippy. They're going to do this in order to banish the Chaos Heart using the powers of the pure heart and pure love. They can banish it forever, making it cease to exist Along with the pure hearts and anyone linked to them. Count Black is fine with this, as this is all his fault anyway. But Tippy? Well, she's okay with it too. As long as she's with Count Black, she's fine. The void grows ever closer to swallowing all worlds, including Castle Black. Count Black and Tippy must be quick, and so they head to the altar. Count Black and Tippy give their final vows to one another, and with one last I love you, Count Black, Tippy, and the Pure Hearts destroy the Chaos Heart.
With the Chaos Heart now destroyed, the Void 2 slowly disappears into nothingness, resurrecting every world it had just destroyed, from the Bitlands to the Craglands to even the Samurai Kingdom. Everything is back to normal. And we get a glimpse into Tippy and Count Black in their afterlife as they go to that one place that would give them happiness. Everyone reawakes in Flipside, all in one piece. And hey, even the stage is up now. And look, the void's disappearing. And oh, look, it's Merlin. He points out that um, Tippy's not here, and that she had to sacrifice herself with Count Black in order to save all worlds. But he reassures everyone that they're still out there somewhere. Anastasia's pretty happy about it, too, saying that they're all happy, reunited together. And she starts crying and is sad that she's all alone. She doesn't have the count. And no, go. Chunks tries to comfort her. It's really sweet. Merlin says that farewells are bittersweet, but as long as you are alive, the future is a blank page. And that he's hungry, and he asks Saffron to whoop up some of her celebratory snacks. Everyone walks away to go feast of their scrumptious snacks. And as Peach is walking away, she asks Merlin, what is it? And Merlin replies that he's thinking about Tippy, wondering if she truly is happy. Peach says that of course she is, and Merlin says that yes, she is. Now let's have at those snacks. So the dark prophecy was adverted and peace reigned. The dark prognosticus again faded into history. Count Blumiere and his love lady Timpani both vanished. Where did the pair go? None know. And so, the story of the lost book of prophecies comes to an end. May we meet again in another time and place. Sorry about that, just <laughs> accidentally dropped my metal pipes. Anyways, did you actually think we were done here? No, we still have a lot more to talk about because there's a postscape to this game. Kind of, not really. There's just like stuff you can do after beating the game. And there's also 100%ing, which we haven't talked about. So, let's get talking about that. After beating the game and booting up your save, you'll be greeted by Merlin. He's talking about Tippy and stuff, how uh, he was worried, but, but she's fine and stuff. And he also says that apparently it's been a while since Mario's last been here. Implying that it's been like at least a couple months or weeks or something. I don't know why they felt the need to include this, but they did. So, with the world save and the void gone, what can you do in this game? Well, how about we talk about the NPCs first? Because all of their texts have changed to reflect the fact that you, the hero, have saved all worlds. Most of their text is pretty generic, although there's a couple special things like, ah, uh, this person lost all their money at their arcade and they're gonna become a tour guide to earn some cash. But there's some even more special cases, like the fact that you can find old chunks here. You can find old chunks on the first floor, and talking with him reveals that he is doing very well, enjoying his life of peace and quietness. But he's a little sad because Nastasia is sad, and that makes him sad. And he wants to take her out on a date as you know, good friends, good chums, nothing romantic. He just wants to make her feel better, which uh. Means, yeah, on the flop side, first floor, you could talk to Nastasia, who is very depressed since Calflix has gone. And uh, she even states that now she knows how he feels, which I'm just saying is perfect sequel material. 
You can't do Merlovely's hints anymore because there's nothing to get hints about. She just says to do whatever feels best. Walter and Gladys are having marital issues, I think. Gladys finds a flyer to some store she's never heard of before, and apparently her husband won't come home and she wonders when she is, he is. And yeah, however, Walter's like right outside their home. I don't really understand what she means. And Walter's upset that the world ended because he drank too much cocoa and now he's sick. So, I, I, I don't know. Good news for Sacre and Ellie. One of their paintings actually sold. So now they, they have some money and they're going to celebrate when mom gets back. That's just sweet, lovely news. If you head down to the underwear bar, you can find the internet, who, when talked to, functions like a jukebox. Although, well, unfortunately, you can't actually choose the music. Uh, it's just random, but it can only be music that you've actually heard in the game so far, which is, yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting. Okay, so get this. Remember, like, Sherry and Carrie stuff? Yeah, okay, we're, we're coming back to this. We're, we're coming to the reveal, the end plot of this game. So, basically, Sherry followed her boyfriend to where he goes and she went to the underwear bar and didn't come out until nightfall she questions if he's two timing her with someone and here's my theory you talk to to carrie now you know she's still talking about how her boyfriend's true love is the arcade now here's the thing merlin has like said in merlin and orlam They've said that, like, ah, oh, they're the only ones that know about the flip-floppery going on, but there's a lot of evidence to support that that's not the case. In fact, something we're about to talk about is also going to, like, do that too. Anyways, um, so, if her, if, if Carrie's boyfriend, who's, she's in Flopside, goes to the arcade, that means he goes to Flipside, because there's not an arcade in Flopside, just the Flipside. So, here, here's my theory, there's only two people in the flaps the flip side arcade it's mort and hort and this guy this guy right here i believe that this is the culprit he even talks about how he's, he's bad with love or whatever in his in his tippy thing and he's two timing both of them but the thing is they're flip side and flap side counterparts meaning that he's two timing these people with themselves I guess it could also be that the flopside person's boyfriend is the flopside guy in there, and, you know, flopside person's in there is the flopside. But, like, you talk to this guy, and, like, oh, he doesn't mention anything about his poor love or anything. Yeah, I think this guy just genuinely loves the arcade. This guy's two-timing them, and that's why this is he's so secretive about it. So, there's my theory. From one interesting reveal to the next, if you go and talk to Hieronicus after beating the game, he'll talk about one last story. How he searched for a legendary pixel for a long time, and he chose his own friend's life over that pixel. Because that's what matters most. How sweet and heartfelt. Now, Hernicus, well, we don't see his flopside variant, he definitely does still have one. I mean, you talk to the guy outside of the flopside shack, and he tells him, Oh, there was a guy that lived here, sold all his maps, he was an adventurer, he sold him to Flam. So yeah, there's definitely a guy that lived here. And here's the interesting part. Inside of that house is a pixel, implying that the flopside variant Hieronicus chose the pixel over his own friend's life. And so filled with grief and regret, fled flopside and never was seen again. This is pretty cool. Remember Helvetica and Garamond? Yeah, well, apparently they switched places. I guess after, you know, Garamond stealing all of Helvetica's ideas through dreams, you know, he kind of deserved a break. So, they swapped places. Now Helvetica lives in Flapside with no deadlines and plans on getting a lot of sleep. And Garamond, he lives for the deadlines. So he's plenty happy having them here. And, uh, yeah, surprisingly happy ending for these two. Ditto gives us some helpful advice, saying that if you go to Francis' place, you can buy something nice, so uh, we'll have to keep that in mind. Harold and Gertrude are actually not having marital issues. Harold, for the first time, got Gertrude a gift. 
a ring. The wedding ring that they couldn't afford for their 60th anniversary. How lovely. You know, Chet, the guy that just really, really, really wanted to see the world end, well, he's actually not too bummed about the fact that you saved it. He's come around on things and says, no matter how bummed you are, you can't have the world's end. And he's glad he's still alive, so good for him. Uh, also, Lucy wants to become Nolrim's apprentice. I just kind of thought that was interesting. That covers most things I wanted to talk about. However, I wanted to talk about Garson and Carson a bit more because... I mean, I already talked about their stories that they can tell you, but I wanted to talk about a few specific ones that are really interesting. One of the stories I want to talk about is Merlin's love life, because yes, he apparently has one. It's stated several times throughout the game that the ancients had an absurd obsession with love and always fell madly into it, and yada yada yada. And that ringed true for their ancestors, which Merlin is one of. Apparently, he had this thing for Saffron and asked her on out a date. And she said that if he could eat this super big giant dinner, I forget what it was called, but if he could eat all of it, then she would date him. And he almost ate the entire thing. All that was left was one piece of parsley. However, then some injured girl came in and then he had to go and help her. And ever since then, he was captivated by the ancient and studies. So, um, yeah, that girl was tippy. I just kind of thought it was interesting that they put in a backstory because we knew Merlin found Tippy, but we didn't really know how. But apparently that's how, so. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Garson also has a story about the Samurai Kingdom. Apparently, Merlina's younger sister was the one who gave the Pure Heart to King Samur. Well, not the current King Samur, but, you know, the older King Samur. And they fell madly in love and had a hundred kids. And then those 100 princes, like, all had their guys. And then the number 100 became very important to the Samur Guy Kingdom. Hence, why well, I have to fight a hundred of them. Again, I just, you don't need to know this. It really doesn't change much about the game. It's just fun to know these weird pieces of information. The last info I wanted to talk about from Garson is that there's even more stylish moves. And by that, I mean, you know, you jump on the enemies and you shake the wearmo, you'll do a stylish move. And like, you know, the more you do, it changes and stuff, but it's still like, there's it's a set of them. However, by jumping on an enemy and alternating between left and right, tilting the wearmote, you can perform like a super stylish move. And they're like, you'll stay in the air for a really long amount of time and you'll get these really cool animations. And like, I just genuinely had no idea about these. And I'm like, I just, I don't know. I just want to know if anyone else in the world knew about this. I just, I don't know. Carson has some interesting info about the Tribe of Darkness. Apparently, they're actually part of the Tribe of Ancients, or at least they were. People like Nolan are even descendants of them. Apparently they had stronger magical powers than the rest of them, and there was a very important resource. However, someday they all vanished from the Tribe of Ancients, and they took the Dark Prognosticus with them. And of course, they took this for their own dark magical powers, but apparently they couldn't handle the book, and so they just didn't use it until Count Black used it, and, uh, well, you know, became Count Black and stuff. So... I just thought that was interesting, because it's not really made clear in-game without talking to, like, Carson and stuff what the Tribe of Darkness is. And yeah, they're part of the Ancients. He also has some interesting info on the villains of this game, like Oh Chunks, who apparently was once a very good general, having an army a thousand strong, that one of his trusted advisors sold him out, and all of his men fell in battle. And that's when Count Black scooped him up, preying on his shame and depression. He also talks about Mimi. Apparently her true form is shrouded in mystery. Which implies that the form we see in game isn't actually Mimi. Uh, it's just something else. Or maybe this isn't. This, this guy doesn't know about... I don't know. Either way, she's mysterious and it's not really known what she is. Uh, some people say that she was a failed pixel experiment by the ancients. Some say she was a witch that, like, made tra shape-shifting potions, and then, 
Oh, something happened. Yeah, I don't know. Mimi's just kind of weird. There's some info about Anastasia here, and she's telling her about her magical powers. And there's a really weird story titled Bats of Men or something like that. Apparently, some guy who was out looking for a missing girl that he loved or whatever found a bat stuck in a trap and then he released it and thanked it. And then as he was laying down for camp, the bat transformed into a girl of his species and swore an eternal loyalty to him. And uh, yeah, this is definitely Nastasia's backstory, even if it's not stated in the game. Specifically, at least. Uh, it's interesting. Kind of a weird story, but like, yeah, it's nice to give Nastasia something. Lastly, we have, well, just a bunch of information about pixels. For one, we know that the pixels were created by the ancients, but not specifically. Apparently, they were created by a powerful magician, and he created the original 12 pixels, which are the pixels we find in-game today. But he made many more after those original 12. However, today, I mean, that was like 3,000 years ago, and so there's not many pixels left except for the original 12. All of the rest have vanished because of the pixel uprising. You see, the ancients relied heavily on the pixels, although they did eventually fear that the wiser they grew and the smarter they got, that they would eventually, you know, turn on them. And that didn't happen until a pixel called the Pixel Queen came up, and she was a very powerful pixel and could, like, command all the other pixels. See, most of the pixels were contained in, you know, normal, like, vessels and stuff, but she, the Pixel Queen, she was contained by a demonic, evil spirit vessel. Hence why, you know, she was all bad and stuff, and so she ravaged the ancients with the power of the pixels. The ancients got enslaved by the pixels, however then the original 12 pixels appeared and fought against the pixel queen, using catch cards to trap the mind-controlled pixels and heal them. And like, they went and attacked the pixel queen, but oh, she hid, and then she used an uh, evil spell and cast bad images, but then, oh, one of the pixels was immune and could see the truth or whatever, and then, yeah, they, they fought the pixels, but then, as one of them died. Then, once the pixel queen was defeated, it turns out that uh, the pixel queen was actually the first pixel ever created, and was created by the master magician after learning about the dark pronosticus and studying it. And then the last surviving apprentice of the Master Magician took the Dark Pronosticus away from the Pixel Queen and hid it away so that something like this could ever happen again. However, um, somehow the Tribe of Darkness got their hands on the Dark Pronosticus, or maybe the Master Magician Apprentice was part of the Tribe of Darkness. Either way, um, yeah, moving on. Uh, the pixels and stuff, they really weren't trusted after that, even after some of the like original 12 saved them. So, um, it was outlawed, the pixel creation was outlawed, and um, because of that, uh, the tribe of ancients, their power just kind of got worse, and uh, hence why they don't have as big of an influence anymore, and uh, there's only like a couple of them left, because they didn't use the pixels anymore. They were a big help. And, um, I guess they also sailed away some of the, like, original 12 pixels so that, you know, the heroes could find them. Lastly, the Master Magician's Apprentice left behind a book, and in that book it stated that the Master Magician had a wife, a son, and a daughter. He lost both his wife and his son in a horrible accident, and his daughter grew sick and died shortly afterwards. However... It's said that, uh, the Pixel Queen, her soul is, uh, is not, like, some evil spirit or anything. It's a human, and apparently this human might just be the Master Magician's daughter who he sealed before she died, or something like that. So, that's pretty interesting. Um, also, uh, it's said that the Master Magician's son might have lived the accident, and this is where we talk about Dementio, because, honest to God, they don't really say much about Dementio in this game. Uh, Carson does talk about him. Apparently, he actually approached Count Black himself and was even turned away once. But Count Black read something in the Dark Pronosticus about someone similar, and then he hired him in. Now, I don't think that this supposed son that survived this horrible accident is Dementio. How? 
However, and the reason I think that is because this happened thousands of years ago, so unless Dementio is like thousands of years old or something, it wouldn't make much sense for him to be this, and it doesn't seem like he's thousands of years old or something. So, um, yeah, maybe this son survived and then, you know, eventually had more sons and it became Dementio, hence why he seems to know about stuff like the Dark Prognosticus or whatever and all of that past. Um, but that's just a theory. Anyways, that's basically all I want to talk about with Carson and Carson. They both just have a lot of interesting pieces of lore, some of which I didn't even bother covering. So, I just recommend talking to these guys if you played this game. I know I've explained a bunch of it anyways, but still, there's some neat stuff here. They also just have generally good hints, like Carson is the one who tells you to go ask Merle behind the counter in order to start that Piccolo side quest, and they have other stuff like that too. And they talk about like the flop side and flip side pit of a hundred trials and like why those are there. It's just, it's just a lot of lore here, so and hints. Anyways, now we can move on to 100%ing, which is a tedious task. Now, I say 100%ing in quotation marks because technically there's not really any way to check if you've 100 percent of the game, so it's all pretty subjective. But outside of just, you know, doing everything you can do in this game, completing all the side quests or whatnot, the main criteria for 100%ing are completing all the recipes, uh, doing all the maps, and collecting all 256 cards. I'm going to talk about 100%ing in the order that I did things and the order in which I recommend you do these things, starting with completing all of the recipes. In total, there are 96 different recipes. At least for me, by the end of the game, I had 33 done, or exactly one third of them. Um, it took me the next six hours to get the rest of the recipes. Yeah, I might as well just rip this bandage off now. 100%ing Super Paper Mario is not a fun task, and quite frankly, I don't recommend you do it. It's not to say, like, it was the worst experience in the world, but man, collecting all of the recipes was just a pain. There's, like, the cooking discs and stuff, which do help, but they don't really help much with actually doing the recipes. They do help with finding the ingredients, but just not the recipes. However, I mean, you know, the internet exists, so I just looked up a guide on all of the recipes in which you need to cook them and stuff. And I just used that instead of the end game like, d -esque disc system. It does tell you how to make all the recipes that are in the DS, it's just not terribly convenient to have to check it every time. The ingredients are just more helpful, you know, it's just a set location. It's pretty easy to remember where the ingredients are and they're pretty self-explanatory, so... That's why I recommend you look up the recipes. One issue with getting all the recipes are coins, because you need to purchase ingredients in order to make all these recipes and then cook them. However, the recipes themselves typically sell for more than they cost to make, so in the end, you're actually probably getting more coins out of this than you are spending them. It just feels like way more coins in the moment. It's also pretty overwhelming making all these recipes. Like I said, I had 66 to make. I had no idea where to start. Um, however, a strategy that worked pretty well for me was just selecting a specific ingredient probably one that doesn't have too many recipes involved with it and just getting as many ingredients of that as I needed and then you know finishing off that ingredient all right I don't need this ingredient anymore I can just forget about it and doing it like that um, still though like I said took me over six hours which I mean in hindsight that's like one recipe per ten minutes but weirdly enough it felt like it was a much faster pace than that. Most ingredients you can just purchase, but there are two that you can't, being turtley leaves, which drop from Koopa Troopas, and Daisy Tears, which drop from Crazy Daisies. The only way you can get these items is from killing those enemies, so you literally just have to kill them over and over and over again uh, until one drops. Um, I think you need like two Daisy Tears, and a couple turtley leaves in order to get all the recipes. 
It's probably the least fun part of getting all the recipes, honestly. It's, it's just not fun. Uh, best way to get turtle leaves is to go to 1-1, and there's this like section where you can just kick this Koopa shell into a bunch of other enemies, and it'll one-shot them. And you have a pretty good chance of getting a turtle leaf by doing this. And then you can just return back, back to the center, go back into 1-1, and rinse and repeat. And then, for the Amazing Daisies, or Crazy Daisies, um... 3-3 is your best option, and that's not a good option because each time you need to climb up this tree and go into the dotwood tree and kill all the crazy daisies there and pray to god one of them drops some daisy tears. Fuck this. Yeah, if you can already tell, I don't recommend you 100% this game. You don't get anything for doing it, spoilers alert, and it's not fun, it's not great, and I just did it because I really like this game, and I wanted to do it for the sake of the video, and god I wish I didn't. Moving on! Next up are the maps. Gotta be honest, I kinda like the maps in this game. They're one of my more favorite parts about 100%ing Super Paper Mario. You purchase them from Flam. You can find them in Flipside and the basement floor, like, you know, counterpart to Flam. You know Flam. Everyone knows Flam. The maps all vary in prices, and when you purchase one, they'll have a picture of some place in the game with a red X on them. You go to that place in game, flip the spot where the red X is, and boom, you'll get some new item or catch card. Some of the maps are pretty expensive, which is why I recommend you do all the recipes first, because after doing all of them, you'll have some spare recipes that you can sell in order to afford purchasing all the maps. And also, while completing all the maps, you might get some useful items that you can sell in order to, you know, afford more maps. The maps span all across the game. There's some on flip side, there's some on flop side, you can go to Lineland to get some, there's some on Merlin's Mansion, the Bitlands, Outer Space, Craglands, not the Samurai Kingdom, which the Samurai Kingdom is back now, and we'll touch on that later. Underwear, the Over There, and even Castle Black. They're all throughout the game. And getting all of them is kind of fun to do after you've beaten the game. It's just kind of like a, you know, fun thing. See what all the random NPCs you've seen throughout the game are doing now. Or, you know, just exploring the levels you've already explored before. Maybe you missed some secrets. Well, now's your chance to go back and find them. It's, it's, it's just a good time. Chapter 1 doesn't really have anything new to offer by heading back to it. Although you can talk with Bestovius, Old Man Watchet, all the townsfolks of the Old Town and stuff. They don't have anything super interesting to say, but apparently Bestovius and Old Ma Ratchet aren't on super good terms, but Old Man Watchet does kind of want to go see you Bestovius again, so hopefully they can rekindle. Chapter 2 is pretty cool, as you can go and talk with Mimi, as Merle actually hired her as her handmaid for real this time. Apparently Merle isn't around the mansion much, because she's a flop side, you know, working, so Mimi just pretends like this place is hers. And, yeah, you know what? Good for her. You know, stuck with, like, some of the chirbles, but they don't have anything super interesting to say. Two last little details I noticed on this run-through of Merle's mansion. Um, there's pictures of both Merlevely and Bestovius, which makes sense. I mean, Merle definitely knows Merlevely, but Bestovius? I don't really know if it's ever implied in a game that she knows about them. So, that's kind of interesting. And, um, if you ever wondered what mechanism was pulling that mushroom in one of the trapdoor rooms, uh, here you go. You can get in here by just flipping into 3D and using Dottie. In Chapter 3, if you head back to the underwater tile pool, you can find the big blooper's hands still trying to get you, even though you defeated him and you can't, like, refight him or anything. So I don't really know why these hands are still here, but, uh, whatever. Um... Also, Francis! You can talk with Francis again, and he has got something new for you. Um, meet Tiptron, Robo Tippy. Works exactly like Tippy, and for 999 coins, you can purchase Tiptron from Francis. And um, it behaves just like Tippy. You can tattle things that you maybe didn't get to tattle before, or whatever. So. That's cool. I did not have enough money to buy it my first go around, but I did get enough money eventually. Chapter 4 doesn't have anything super interesting, except for the fact that, uh, Scorps is back. I kind of thought he died by his mom at the end of Chapter 4 a little bit, but no, he was just sleeping. 
Um, so he's fine. Don't worry about squirps, and you can get him back and use him in space. So that's pretty cool. You talk to those weird belly button alien creatures, I guess, but they have pretty generic text, and uh, there's really nothing else in space. So, uh, moving on. Chapter 5 has quite a bit, actually, to talk about. There's the obvious, you can talk with the Kragnons again, see what they're up to, Flint Cragley, all of his crew, um, stuff like that. But also, there was this tiny little hole you might have found um, near the Kragnon town. And if you use Dottie to go inside of it, you can find Wacka. Yeah, Wacka's in this game. Jump on his head or burn him or... Hit him with a hammer. Either way, he'll drop a whack a bump, which heals, I think, uh, 30 HP, something like that. And you can cook it, and which um, only makes it recover 5 HP. But it sells for a lot of money. And every time you enter Chapter 5, you can do this. This isn't like a one time thing or something, or every once in a while. No, you can just do this as much as you want, and it is. Definitely the easiest and best way to earn money in this game. Also, uh, King Crocus is back. I almost forgot. Yeah, I thought he died at the end of Chapter 5. I don't know why it's up with me and just thinking characters die at the end of chapters. Like, Squirps, that's pretty obvious he's a save. I really didn't think that entirely. It's just, you know, uh, theory. But my theory is disproven by him in Chapter 4. I have to be in the game. But King Crocus, no, I definitely just thought this guy died. But no, he is back. He is alive. And uh, surprisingly, he doesn't really seem to have any ill will about you whooping his ass. Because, I mean, I guess you needed that for your heart and all. Everything turned out fine between them and the Kragnons. So, you know, everything's peachy king. Skipping Chapter 6, again, we'll get to it. And moving on to Chapter 7, there's not much in the underwear. You can't even find Queen Jadies. But heading to the over there, I mean, there's all the, you know, little angel guys, I forget what they're called, NIMBYs, that's what they're called, NIMBYs, all of them and the important guys and whatnot, but the big thing here is talking with Queen Jadies and Granby, and also Love Bee. Yeah, I don't really know how, but Love Bee is back, and not even Queen Jadies or Granby know how she's back. I guess something maybe the pure heart did? Now, this does kind of retract a bit away from her, you know, sacrifice to become the pure heart. But, I don't know, I don't feel like it takes enough away for me to say this is bad or anything, and it's nice to see them get a happy ending, so, that's nice. Well, there are some maps related to Chapter 8, and while their rewards are pretty cool, getting Count Black catch cards and stuff like that, um, and Super Dementio catch card, that's pretty cool as well, uh, there's like nothing in chapter 8 really, so that's all of them. With all recipes and treasure maps now completed, we move on to the next step of 100%ing Super Paper Mario, the Flopside Pit of 100 Trials. In the Flopside Pit of 100 Trials, you will find these dark variants of enemies. They'll have much better stats and are completely black. Um, they're Difficult, but they're the same as previous enemies, only a little stronger. We've seen stuff like this before. Um, I guess the developers just got lazy and just made them all black. But hey, it looks pretty cool and it fits with the Game & Watch aesthetic this place has got going on. Um, it is difficult. I did die once, um, but I had a live stream, so I was alright and I could heal up immediately afterwards. But hey, just the fact that I died here with... Uh, you know, as much health in the stats as I have, it says something about its difficulty. Uh, once you make it to the end of the flop side, but I've under trials, you are greeted by a mysterious voice who says that they work for the ancients, and that they wish to give powers to the true heroes. But whether we are the true heroes or not, is still left unanswered. Apparently, as going through this whole rigmarole wasn't enough for them, and they have a new challenge for us. To do it all over again. What fun! Yep, you have to do this not once, but twice in order to 100% the game and finish everything up here. But we're not gonna do that right now. We'll save doing this a second time for later. In the meantime, how about we finish up the Samurai Kingdom? See what that's all about. 
Actually, now that I have 999 coins from completing the Flopside Pit of 100 Trials, I went and got Tip John because, I mean, you know, might as well get it. Like I said, Tip John is just tippy. It's just here so that you can tattle things after you've already beaten the game. That's really all it's here for. But it's kind of neat that Tip John's here. It's Robo Tippy. And you have a unique interaction that happens if you get Tiptron and go talk with Merlin, so... That's, that's something. With all worlds saved, we can finally complete the Samur Guy Challenge. For fun this time, we don't need the PR anymore, but still, we can try it nonetheless. We've already fought the first 20 or so, but there's still 80 more we have yet to fight. And some of these guys are pretty interesting. They get progressively more difficult as you go on, just having better, stronger attacks, stuff like that, but overall, they don't really change much. In fact, we basically saw all the variants we can really fight. All of these Samurai guys are pretty unique and special, and they just have really fun characters, and... God, I really wish I could, like, talk over specific ones, but I don't remember which ones are, and I don't feel like going through the footage. Just, like... Trust me, if you take the time to tippy every single Samurai guy, which is why I made sure I got tip John before doing this, there's so many great ones. Like, one off the top of my head is Footsteps of Meat. There's this guy that's called Footsteps of Coins, and he's talking about coin blocks, and apparently has a brother called Footsteps of Meat. Like, that's just great, that concept. As for the Samurai guys themselves, there are a lot of them. I already talked about them briefly when we were in Chapter 6, but I'll go more in-depthly now. There's green ones, which don't typically jump, and they just kind of swing their swords around. There's blue ones, which jump very high. There's red ones, which can shoot shockwaves from their weapons. There's red and blue ones, which we didn't get to see our first go-around. They can shoot energy balls from their mouths, and sometimes they can jump too. There's the big guys, which, you know, and they just wheel the club, and they can jump, and they can roll, and they also have higher HP and attack than most others. There's the tiny guys, which are really fast, but they always have 1 HP. There's, um, these, I guess, night guys? They are always at the end of each chapter, except for the very last one. They've got, like, you know, big mustaches, and they're pretty powerful. They can shoot laser beams. Um, there's just a lot of them. There's the neon guys, which are pretty cool. These can flip into 3D and have a very long sword that stretches across the entire screen. Although, because of how they behave and act, it makes their fights pretty trivial and very easy, but I don't know, they're kind of cool. And then, of course, there's stuff like spiked enemies, which you can't jump on, and then maced enemies, which are basically just like swords, but they usually have higher attack. Speaking of fighting Samurai guys, um, strategies. Don't use carry against the spiked enemies. I mean, you can, but from what I tried, it's really finicky. Like, I had a very hard time jumping on enemies with carry when they were spiked. I don't know what the hit detection is on it, but you could just get hit constantly and it feels like you slide off of their heads. It's really weird. For the spiked enemies, I would recommend using Boomer or Bowser. Also... If you're going to use Bowser, um, he's pretty good. I mean, he has a double the attack stat. Like, he's obviously going to be amazing, and he's, like, the best for combat in this game. But at the start of rounds, he's really bad, because if you're using Bowser, you're going to be using Bowser Care. Like, that's just how it is. And you're going to be using his Fire Breath to kill enemies, obviously. But sometimes, just depending on how the Samurai guy are feeling, they can attack you before you even have a chance to jump on carry. Um... In fact, that happens a lot, so a lot of the time what you have to do is you have to walk away slowly as Bowser and then jump on carry. And, like, depending on what the Samurai guy is, they can also just, like, shoot a projectile or run up to you or whatever. So, start of rounds, it is kind of hard to get Bowser going, but once he's going, he's going great. And, um, Dottie? Dottie's insane? Uh, see, when you are in small form, when you're tiny... Enemies can't see you. They don't, like, react to you. They just think you're not there. And even when you jump on them, they don't notice you or anything. They don't attack you. Uh, and you can do that with the Samurai guys. So, assuming they are not quick enough or you're quick enough to get away from them long enough to switch into Dottie, uh, you just win the fight. 
And, like, even if they're spiked enemies, you can just switch to Bowser and burn them. So, like, that works for every single fight, but it's kind of a pain sometimes to set up, so I didn't use it. But, you know, just saying. That's, like, a very free... Oh, it works amazingly against, um... The big boys, the big men, because they're super slow. So that's that's a strategy. I didn't use it because I wanted to challenge myself a bit, but you know. Outside of that, I didn't actually I didn't use Bowser for this. I I haven't been using Bowser throughout the entire playthrough. Um for reasons that I'll talk about later. But um using Mario, mainly Luigi or Peach or whoever, pixels are pretty helpful. Um Boomer's the best one more than likely, I'd say. Um, because you can just plant a bomb, you can run away, plant a bomb, and then boom, blow it up when they get close. But also, just normal jumping on their heads and timing jumps is good enough. Most enemies aren't more than a two-hit KO, sometimes three. More if they're bigger, but still. It's not that difficult. But I didn't bring that many healing items with me, so I was cutting it pretty close on some of these fights sometimes. Anyways... After you defeat the big guy, the last man, which, by the way, this guy is super unique. He can, like, breathe fire. He does these rolls. He has, like, the most HP, most attack. He's pretty cool final boss for this area. I really like him. You get a bunch of cards uh, of all of the TTYD uh, Paper Mario partners. So that's pretty cool. That's neat. I should also mention... That throughout the flop side pit of 100 trials, you get uh, cards of all of the original Paper Mario characters. So that's your replacement for the pixels in the flip side one. And now, if you've done all those, you have all the cards of all the partners in all the games. So uh, yeah, it's so cool. That's the Samurai Kingdom. Overall, I would say that the Samurai Kingdom is probably the hardest challenge in this game. Like, sure, on paper. The flip side and flop side pit of 100 trials may seem more difficult, especially the flop side one, but, like, you get lots of experience from doing those, meaning you're going to be leveling up a lot. So you're gonna get free heals. Samurai Kingdom, that's not the case. You can only really heal through your items. Like, you do get experience, but it's very, very minuscule. Like, I leveled up once from defeating all of these Samurai guys. So, it's just more difficult because you don't get as many free heals. So, I would definitely recommend bringing as many healing items and stuff like that as you can because it's going to be very, very useful. Um, also, weird sign up, but also like Merle's package. Um, that sounds bad. Um, uh, the charms, <laughs> that's a better way of putting it. Um, the charms, you get less opportunities to get charms in this place because you're just gonna be jumping on less enemies because there's only like a couple you know what I mean? like well most of them guys go down in one jump so you're not really gonna be getting many opportunities to get like free items either um speaking of the flaps I've been on the trials though now that we've been the samurai kingdom let's go do that finish that thing up the second go around of the flap side pit of Andre trials is the exact same as the first except you don't get any cards this time you're just going through it um i guess i could talk strategies but it's basically the same as the flip side except for well not really because now you have way more pixels so like kudge is great boomer is great um bowser is pretty good but he actually still has some flaws here because of how cramped the corridors are he's really big and can get hit really easily and just maneuvering's hard Sure, Carrie Bowser is still insane, but the carry part of him is less useful here because of just how the rooms are set up, so... I don't know, I'd honestly say Mario's a better choice here, being able to flip into 3D and use pixels much more efficiently than Bowser can. So, like I said, Kudge and Boomer are great, but also Dottie is even more broken than she is in the Samurai Kingdom because... Like, you just, there's more open spaces and the enemies don't really hunt you down. At least most of them don't chase after you or anything. So it's very easy to tr transform into Dottie and then just have all the enemies ignore you. And you can defeat them super easily. Like I said, if they're spikes or something, you switch the Bowser. And yeah, in fact, I actually used this strategy for several, several rooms. And it's kind of one of the solutions to one of the rooms. 
Like, there's just a so bari bad, or I guess a dark so bari bad, on a platform, and then... But the platform isn't, you can't flip into 3D. So your solution, at least the one I went with, was switching to Dottie so it doesn't notice you. But I really like this room, because I feel like there's a multiple solutions, some that I didn't think of. Um, also, fun fact, I actually died on this run-through of the flop set of 100 trials. That's why I didn't show footage of me dying with the live stream, because it actually happened to you. Uh, so, you know, just felt like I would bring that up. Anyways... Head through the final rooms of the Flopside Pit of 100 Trials to make it to the 100th floor and see what this mysterious figure is all about. <laughs> What's up, Beeros? I should come clean. I don't really work for the Ancients. Don't get me wrong, they did create me, but I work for my own cursed powers. Anyway, the name is Shadow. I've been testing you to study you, and now your clones are complete. Now is when I beat you and take your place as heroes. Oh, heroes, blessed souls. I must destroy you all with the power of Shadow. Plot twist, this guy doesn't work for the ancients, and he's an evil shadow cloning bastard. <laughs> Meet Dark Luigi. He looks exactly like Luigi, except for the fact that he actually has Mr. L's bandana, so that's kind of weird. He has 100 HP, and attack is 10. Yeah, and he works basically just like how fighting Mr. L would work, or how fighting Luigi would work, because he's got his super jump. Um, I think he can also heal using super shrooms. And, um, yeah, he's pretty difficult. I mean, 100 HP is a lot, and 10 attack is just as much. Not to mention that his super jump does 20 damage instead of the normal 10. But we can also do insane damage to him. I decided to fight this guy as Luigi. I just kind of thought it would be cool to do that. After blasting away Luigi, he moves on to Bowser. Well, it's 100 HP, 20 attack, and 4 defense. Not to mention he has spikes, so you can't stomp on him. This is easily the most dangerous one out of all the copies because of how much ridiculous damage he can do. 20 is a lot. I decided to use a courage shell to like boost my defense. And even with it being perfectly timed, it was still dealing 10 damage per hit. Like It's pretty insane. This Bowser can breathe fire like the normal Bowser, but also can flail his arms, um, like in uh, Chapter 7 when we fought Bowser. I also fought this Bowser as Bowser, because it just felt necessary. Then, he moves on to Peach. Peach has 100 HP and 10 attack, and she can also use her parasol in mid-air and to duck. And let me tell you, fighting Peach as Peach when Peach has Peach's abilities is kind of annoying because this peach is really smart and ducks all the time and when she ducks you can't hit her at all and it's really annoying the nice thing about fighting these guys is that they don't really have the pixels so um that's an advantage you have over all of them now, honest to god like even using barry to try and attack her was not working the best Although I did have a Volt Shroom, which I decided to use, and that helped out a lot because it paralyzed Peach, so I could just like whack her with Barry or jump on her head, and that made quick work of her. But again, if I didn't have that Volt Shroom, I would have been screwed. Well, I mean, at least fighting this Peach as Peach. If I was Bowser, this would have been a very different story, but you know, I wanted to fight them all as their characters because I thought that was cool. And finally! He moves on to Mario, and Mario is pretty interesting. He also has 100 HP and 10 attack, but he can use his hammer, and of course he's going to jump around and stuff, but he can also flip into 3D, which is cool, Um, but it's also kind of a weakness, because when he flips in, when you flip into 3D, he flips into 3D, and then you can flip out of 3D, or and then he'll flip out of 3D, and then while he's flipping out of 3D, you can just jump on him, and then you can do this, it's just, it's, um, yeah, it's not great, it'd be better if the AI was just more annoying and just didn't give a shit if you were in 3D and just stayed in 2D, or if it was in 3D, I don't know. Either way, it's still pretty cool, the Kudge uh, attack does 20 damage, 
But you were still better. They're just stupid copies. I was so very close to defeating the heroes. With the power of the pixels, I almost got revenge on the ancients. Huh. So I guess Shadow, who was created by the ancients, really hated them and wanted to use the pixels to do another pixel uprising and defeat the ancients. That's kind of interesting. Your reward for beating Shadow is getting cards of all the different characters. You get a Mario card and a Dark Mario card, a Peach card and a Dark Peach card, a Bowser card and a Dark Bowser card, a Luigi card and a Dark Luigi card. Or technically Shadow, as, well, Dark Luigi appears to be the form in which Shadow takes, which makes sense. Um, since, you know, Luigi's like the ideal host for um, the KS art and stuff, it makes sense that this guy, who seems to be pretty obsessed with the whole power of pixels, ancient pure art stuff, would, uh, would take him. At first glance, these may appear like your basic everyday catch cards, but some of them actually have some special properties. Like, the Mario catch card, for example, lets you flip into 3D forever. There's no, like, gauge. The gauge won't go down, so you can just in 3D forever if you want to without taking damage. It's not like the most useful thing in the world and it's like, you know, I'm probably gonna do this in the post game so it's kinda whatever, but hey it's kinda neat. The Mario Kart and all other cards of the four heroes also have another effect. That being that they will increase your damage to all enemies. You know, catch cards increase the damage you deal to like one enemy of that specific card. Well, these work for all of them. Uh, essentially, multiplying your attack, well, it's not really multiplying, but whatever your attack is currently, add it four times, and that'll be your current attack stat for an enemy. Pretty nuts. Sure, this is probably gonna be one of the last things you do, so it's only gonna be available during the post-game, and even then, not much of it. But, I mean, it's not like you really need it. This game's already easy enough as is. Speaking of doing things in the post-game, we have one last thing left to do in order to 100% Super Paper Mario, and that is collect all 256 catch cards. Now, after doing everything in the game besides getting all the catch cards, I have exactly half of them. So, still a long ways to go. Now, there are plenty of ways to get catch cards. As far as all the ones that are, like, obtained through treasure chests and stuff like that, I've already gotten all of those. So the ones that are remaining are the ones that you can obtain through catch cards or the card shops. Like I said before, there are two card shops. Catch a Dream, where you can buy card bags, which will have a random card inside. You can purchase them for 10 bucks. You can also purchase regular catch cards here to catch enemies in a card. And then there's Fondest Hopes, where you can buy a select catch card of your choosing. Well, at least you're choosing in the current stock available. Although the cards are much more expensive than if you were to find them in a card bag. Going into this, I really thought Fondest Dreams was going to be more useful, but in practice, I actually found Catch a Dream to be far more useful. I might have bought one card from Fondest Hopes, and that was just kind of to just test it a bit. I don't know, I just felt like I needed to do it. It sounds bad getting a random card out of, like, all that you need, but... Maybe I just got really lucky, but I got a bunch of the cards I needed fairly quickly. And I mean, in quotation marks, this still took me a couple hours to do. But still, after a while of trying, I had most of the cards I needed. Um, the other thing about doing it this way is most of the cards only sell for like two coins. That's the lowest they can go. But still, you buy it for ten, sell it for two, you only spent eight. Not to mention, if you get a card that's more than 10, you've made a profit there. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. And if you get a really good card, like um, a tier 2 card that you already have, you can sell that one. And then you will get a much bigger profit. Some of those, like, second-rate cards can sell for an upwards of 50, I think some of them even 100 coins. So, yeah, I'm sorry, going for the card bag is just better. 
Um, there's not really much else to say. I just kept buying card bags until I was like, okay, I have a enough now. I can probably get the rest of these cards through other means. There are a handful of cards that you can get through Flim. You can get the Thwomp card, the Spiny Tromp card, the Spiky Tromp card, the Big Meow card, the Security Meow card, and the Gnaw card. That is a lot of cards that you can get through Flim. I would recommend getting these cards through Flim. You've probably already purchased a few throughout the game, and if you haven't, I don't know, I'd recommend doing it. <laughs> um, so, you probably have a couple of these. But also, they're like second grade cards, so they're pretty rare. Definitely rarer than third grade cards. You're only gonna get a couple of these second ones. Um, so I recommend purchasing them through Flim because he often has uh, at least one of them, and he cycles through his inventory pretty frequently. Um, so that's how I recommend getting these. You can also get a couple of these cards through catch cards, like all of the Thwomp and Spiny, Spiky Tromp enemies you can get through catch cards, but I tried getting a Thwomp, and after several catch cards and catch card SPs, he wouldn't budge, and you can't damage Thwomps, so, yeah, I just, I just got him through the fucking flim. I should mention, there are a couple cards that you can only obtain through the card shops, that being the Meow Maid card, the Racktail card, all of the Samurai cards being the normal, small, and big guys, as well as the Toad card, which for some reason is the last card in the list. Um, well, I guess that kind of makes sense. He's like, only appears at the beginning of the game. He's kind of weird. I don't know. Now, I mentioned the cards that you get from like judges and stuff earlier, but that doesn't mean you can't get them through the card shop. In fact, you can get basically every single card through the card shop. I think the only exceptions are like the character cards like Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Bowser, as well as Dark Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Bowser. Even stuff like the Pixels and previous Paper Mario game partners, you can get through the card shop. They're absurdly rare. Throughout my entire purchasing of cards, I only got one three-star card being the throw card and I just sold it for a bunch of cash So don't at all bank on that just get all of the cards that you possibly can without having to use the card shop um well uh, uh, Ignoring stuff like catch cards and stuff and then just like yeah Spend a bunch of time purchasing cards from the card shop. It's not very fun and you're spending a lot of time going through menus and selling cards and honest to god selling the cards is really annoying. But it does work. Money can be an issue and honestly, maybe in hindsight I shouldn't have been selling my cards because it took up a lot of time. Like it was still like whatever, but still going through all the menus and selling the cards is pretty annoying. I've already mentioned this, but you can, like, just go to Wacka, hit him, get his Wacka Bump, cook it, and then sell it for a bunch of coins for free, and you can do this anytime you enter Chapter 5. So it's not like grinding for money is really much of an issue. Um, but still, I tried to avoid doing that just because, I don't know, I felt like it. So I still had to sell some recipes, and I even went to the Flipside Arcade. And I had some tokens left over, and I bought a shooting star, and I cooked it and sold it um, as a meteor meal for like 200. And I also think I bought a shooting star from Flim and did the same thing. So, there's other ways of getting money. Um, but yeah, still, that whack, -a that whack a bump strategy is easily the best way. Most of the cards are fine. They take time to get through the card shop, or you have to get lucky with Flim, but they're not too bad. Like, I got most of these with relative ease. There was a couple at the end that took a while for me to get through the card shop, but still, most of them were fine. But there are three that are kind of a bitch to get. First one, a Maisy Daisy card. You could purchase one in the Flipside Arcade for 500 tokens. I don't recommend you do that. You can get it through the card shop, but it's a three-star card, so I also don't recommend you do that. And then you can use a catch card on it. Now, I don't know what the chances of getting it through a catch card are, but I got it on my first try, so I would just recommend doing that. You can find one, I think, 100% of the time, 
in um the fucking 5-2 um so yeah go there and just hope you get lucky with catch cards now these last two cards are a bitch um so remember that like uh uh, point system from the shops where you buy something and you get a point and I said it was random I lied I thought it was random because it seemed random but it isn't for 10 points you do get a cake mix but after 20 you get a honey jar after 30 you get a big egg after 50 a fresh pasta bunch after 70 a power steak and after 100 <laughs> a burp a mega koopa catch card um, yeah, remember that 8-bit Koopa? Yeah, you can get it as a catch card. You can also get it through the ca uh, the card shop. And it is only, a, like, a second-grade card. But still, I'd recommend doing it this way, probably. I had, like, I think 90-ish points, maybe 80 points, something like that. Um, when I started doing the catch cards. So I only had to buy a couple items to get it. So I just went to the main shop and flip side and bought a bunch of courage shells and stuff um so that's not that bad i feel like you can use the catch card on the mega koopa but um maybe you can't i'll, I'll have to look into that it the wiki doesn't say you can so i assume you can't um but maybe that works it'd be kind of cool if you could anyways um there's one last card that is a bitch to get and that's the wacka card you can get it through the card shop, but it's a three-star card for some reason. I don't really know why, but it is, so I would not recommend doing that. Um, I should mention, you can also find these cards in Fondest Hopes, and that's actually not that bad of an idea. Um, if you do see them there and you have the money to just do that. Um, I think I even saw the Amazing Daisy one there. Um, so, you can get them through there, but again, that shop only has so many cards at a time and it's not guaranteed to have a three-star card in fact that's pretty rare so you know don't bet on it you can't use a catch card on wacka even though you can jump on him so your only other option to get a wacka card is to earn 300 shop points after 150, you get a slimy shroom. After 200, a golden leaf. After 250, an ultra shroom shake. And 300 points, the Wacka catch card. And then after that, it resets back to zero. I did this. It wasn't very fun. The easiest way of doing this is to go to the Craglands and head to the shop there. In the shop, you can purchase mystery boxes for three coins and sell them for two. So... You need to purchase 200 of them, and then you can only have 10 items at a time, so you have to buy 10, sell those 10, buy 10, rinse and repeat. This took me, like, a while to do. But, it might sound like it takes a lot of money, but it really doesn't. Um, in fact, you actually gain more money by doing this because of the extra rewards along the way that you can sell. You end up getting a net profit from this, technically. So, yeah, there's that. But once you finally get 300 shop points, you are given the Wacka card. I really want to know how many people have actually gotten this goddamn card. It can't be many. Now that we've got all 256 catch cards, we might as well talk about these things. They're pretty cool, I guess. I mean... The text itself isn't anything super special, but they did try to make it relatively witty and fun, I'll give them that. Does it really warrant collecting all 256 of them, especially when you can just look up all the text online? But hey, I appreciate the effort they gave these mini bios. Um, there are a couple notable um, catch card descriptions, so we'll go over some of those. Some of the descriptions were changed from version to version. Like the Dark Head Bog Goomba description. Dark Head Bog Goombas live in a certain secret pit. They look like Dark Goombas, but they bonk. And then in the PAL version, it's Dark Head Bog Goombas live in a certain secret pit. They look like Dark Goombas, but they're not. Yeah, they just they just got rid of the bonk. I don't really know why they felt the need to change this one, but they did. 
Then there's the Dark Koopa Patrol. I know I pulled up the normal Koopa Patrol here, but trust me, it's the dark one that's changed. Dark Koopa Patrols dwell in a circuit circuit pit. Stop them to turn them into dark shells. Shocker! And then the PAL version, Dark Koopas dwell in a circuit secret pit. Stomps won't work, but hey, they're not flame retardant. I see why they changed this one, because it's true, you can't jump on Dark Koopa Patrols. So, um... Yeah, giving you advice to the player that they can stomp on them to turn them into a shells doesn't really make sense. I mean, I guess if you have carry, you can, but still. The Lakitu card doesn't have any localization changes, but it does mention the Pianta Parlor from TTYD, so that's kind of cool. Then there's the Wacka card, where they changed pastries to bumps in the PAL version. I do understand why they do this. I'm pretty sure pastries mean different things across different regions, so changing it from pastries... Um, to bumps makes more sense because they do drop wacka bumps. Ah, uh, so I get why they did it. I know it's not really like confirmed what what's a gender is and there's things in the original Paper Mario that contradict itself or whatever. Um, but out of curiosity, I checked the Watt card and it does refer to Watt as a he. So I don't know. Take that as you will. The last card description I wanted to mention was the one for the Mega Koopa which says that if you look at it in 3D, it'll blow your mind. I don't know what they mean by this. I mean, it just looks a little weird, honestly. Yeah, I kind of wish, like, maybe it had some depth to it. Or, I don't know. I mean, it does have depth, but it just looks odd from this angle. Also, you can, like, actually jump on the Mega Koopa and, like, kick it into its shell and then kick the giant shell. Like, that's kind of cool, actually. And, like, you can damage it using items and stuff. You can also, uh, capture it using a catch card. I didn't get it to happen successfully, but it does work on it. So, um, yeah, the question I asked earlier, I, I solved it. And with that, I don't think I have anything more to talk about. I've basically said and mentioned everything I wanted to mention about this game. I guess I could talk about some of, like, the beta content for this game or whatever, but I don't really think that's necessary for this video. So what I had planned when I originally came up with this video is once I was done talking about everything in the game, everything I wanted to show, mention, or whatever, that I was going to do my part and defend this game, hence the title. But it's interesting. I did some quote-unquote research, as in watching other people's reviews of this game, to see why other people liked or disliked this game. And I learned a lot from it. The general consensus of this game is that it is a very good game, but has some glaring issues in its design. The game itself has a fantastic story, really well-written dialogue, and amazing soundtrack. But it is severely lacking in the gameplay department. It's not that the gameplay is bad or isn't fun, it's just... not that... compelling? It's very basic, very simple. And when compared to the previous Paper Mario games strategy and turn-based RPG gameplay, it just really doesn't compare. A big reason why the gameplay is the way it is, is because of this game's big mechanic, the 3D. It's a cool and interesting idea, but because of the nature of the idea of switching between 2D and 3D, not only does the level design need to be pretty simplistic to fit that, but the gameplay needs to be pretty simplistic to fit that as well. I like both the 3D mechanic and the gameplay, the general combat of this game, but I can't deny it's not as good as the originals. There's just more depth to the gameplay in those games, more fun to be had, more Thoughts to, like, think. I don't know. It's just... better. It's still fun, this game. It's not boring by any means. It's just... not a great replacement. Far from it. 
And there's other flaws with this game too. One of the biggest ones that comes to my mind are the bosses. The bosses in the original Paper Mario games served as a nice challenge from the rest of the game. Not that the rest of the game was like a cakewalk or anything, but the bosses still served as a great challenge. But in this game, none of them really are a challenge. They're all very, very easy. They're not like badly designed bosses. They're fun enough, and there are some that I really like. Namely, Fracktail and Bone Chill. I just, I've always really liked these bosses, and well, the final boss itself isn't the best thing in the world. I still really like Super Dementio's design, as weird as it is. I just think it's a really fun, cool idea for a final boss to have this chaotic, weird-looking Luigi. They all would be a lot better, though, if they had harder-to-dodge attacks, more health, stronger attacks. And I just played through this game without ever using Bowser. Using Bowser, these bosses are even easier. Like, there just needs to be some resemblance of difficulty in this game. Maybe on a first playthrough you don't really notice how easy the game is, but on replay playthroughs, you really start to feel it. Free heals in this game are a plentiful, and they really don't need to be. When you level up, you get a free heal, and I get it, it's been that way since the original Paper Mario. There were just less free heals in those games. In this game, you're getting mushrooms all the time. I don't think I ever had to use items in this game outside of the Samurai Guy Kingdom and the Pit of 100 Trial stuff. That's it. Items were a huge part of the first two Paper Mario games, and in this game, they're relegated to something that you rarely ever use. I feel like I used items more as just, well, this item is better than this item and I have a full inventory so I might as well use this item more than actually just using items in a dire or needed situation. The 3D mechanic is slapped onto Mario and Mario only, so anytime you want to use this game's main mechanic, you have to be playing as Mario. and. Bowser's the only one that has any other purpose outside of just like solving puzzles since he has doubled attack in his flame breath. So, on a normal playthrough of Super Paper Mario, you're probably only going to be using those two. Bowser for combat, Mario when you just need to solve puzzles or don't really feel like using Bowser. Peach and Luigi get completely shafted. And that's just really unfortunate. And there's other things too, like the 3D mechanic. It's neat, but it is still kind of a novelty. And the fact that it's only on Mario kind of sucks. You're forced to use Mario throughout like the whole game essentially, at least a lot if you want to find all the secrets and play the game in a more natural way. But like, outside of Bowser, who is good for combat, having a double attack stat and flame breath, the other characters don't feel that useful. Peach and Luigi just get really shafted in this game. I mean, their abilities are good for puzzles, but for combat and other purposes, not really. I guess Peach can be useful for some bosses with her parasol making her completely invincible. But I don't know, Luigi's good for like Bone Chill and maybe Count Black. I feel like that's kind of it. In a normal Super Paper Mario playthrough, you're either playing as Bowser or Mario. Peach and Luigi are just kind of there when you need them to solve puzzles. And even when you do want to play as them, you still have to be switching to Mario a lot if you want to find all the secrets and just play the game sometimes. Like, in all fairness, switching between characters doesn't take a super long amount of time. You just press 1 and 2 on the Wii Remote and boom, it pulls up a quick change menu where you can change characters, pixels, and items. So, then you just first thing that pops up is the characters, switch to Mario, whatever. And you do it enough that you just kind of get used to it, but that's not the greatest excuse. But despite all of this game's, quite frankly, glaring issues, I still find myself having a very enjoyable time playing it. I suppose that's because a lot of the annoyances I have with this game are just that, little annoyances. Switching into Mario so often, it's annoying, but I can get past it. I can get used to it. The difficulty being piss easy? 
I can ban certain things. Like I said, I didn't play as Bowser, made the game a bit more challenging. And I can do other things if I really wanted to, like ignoring free heals or whatever. Like a Pokemon Nuzlocke. There's ways you can make this game more challenging if you really want to. It's so strange. I can look at this game as objectively as possible. I can see all the flaws with it, all of the good parts, and I can agree with everyone else. This game isn't as good as the first two Paper Marios, at least objectively speaking, but that's just the thing. When I actually get down and play this game, play through it all the way, I end up enjoying it more than the first two Paper Mario games, or at least walking out with a better opinion of the game in some weird way, but I don't understand why. I didn't know why for a while, I've gotta be honest, for a majority of this video, I didn't know why I liked it as much as I did, despite the fact that I could see all of the flaws in the game, and agreed with so many of the flaws, and related to the other annoyances people had with this game. But I think I finally figured it out. The first few Mario games I played were Mario Kart Double Dash, Mario Party 5, Mario Kart Wii, and Super Mario Galaxy 2. And I got a couple other games for the Wii and played a couple other GameCube games. But the very first 2D Mario game I ever played was Super Paper Mario. I know it's crazy for some to think about that this game could be someone's first 2D Mario experience, but it was for me. This is the first 2D Mario game I ever played. And playing it as a kid, I enjoyed a lot about it. The gameplay, as I've already mentioned, is pretty simplistic and easy to understand. And for me, being this dumb, stupid child, that was great. I struggled a lot playing 3D games as a kid. It's just more complicated. My, one of my first games I played was Super Mario Galaxy 2. I could barely get past the prologue. I couldn't even beat the first bot, so playing this game, I had a much more fun time playing it because I could actually play the game a bit more. I felt like I was making much better progress and wasn't getting nearly as frustrated. Kind of. The puzzles frustrated me to no end in this game. Mainly because I didn't read as a kid. I just... I didn't want to do it, especially if I was playing a video game. Video game was fun time, not reading time. Anyways, like, stuff in Merley's mansion. God, I genuinely just thought I had to get a million rupees. And I almost... well, not almost did, but for a long time, I just sat there a couple hours every day, just grinding away at the rupees until eventually my mom saw me doing that and actually helped me solve the puzzles with um, a walkthrough she found on her phone. And that was such a relief, because I was just like, I guess I just have to do this, but I, then, I, then I can play the game after I finish getting one million rupees. But no, oh, here are the million rupees. That was so, like, a, such a memorable experience to me as a kid. That experience, also in some weird way, ended up influencing the name of my little brother, and I don't feel like giving any context on that, because it's funnier that way. I remember that stupid Cragnon thing where you gotta say please a bunch of times. I didn't understand why I wasn't taking it, like, because you gotta, like, certain capitalization for it or whatever. I didn't understand that. I just kept going and it was just like, why is it not working? Um, but eventually I figured it out, but even then, I still wrote down the freaking code wrong, so that was a whole other ordeal. And again, it frustrated me as a kid, but looking back on it now, I have fond memories of that frustration. And that's when I realized it. The reason I like this game so much and can look past all of its flaws is because of nostalgia. If I played Super Paper Mario for the first time, like, Today, I don't think I'd enjoy the game too much. I think I would see it for all the flaws it has, enjoy the parts that are really good about it, but still see the flaws that it has. But because I have so many memories playing this game as a kid, I can just look past a lot of these flaws. I have good memories associated with a lot of the flaws in this game. All of those like frustrations people have about this game and like all of that. I have good memories associated with, so it's kind of hard for me to truly 
dislike that stuff entirely. This game may not be perfect. And it may be worse than Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, and maybe even the first Paper Mario, but it will always have a special place in my heart. And because of that, what can I say? I just like this game more than those two. When I first created this channel, I wanted to make Let's Play videos. And so that's what I did, and the very first Let's Play video I ever did was of Super Paper Mario. When I thought of a game that I wanted to play through and do a Let's Play on, this was the game that came to my mind. It's one of my favorite games ever, and I will always love it. And I may not do Let's Plays anymore, at least by myself. I still do them with my friends over on my second channel, but still. I know this isn't the ending a lot of you probably wanted from this video titled Defending Super Paper Mario for me to just end up being like, yeah, this game's actually not that good as I even thought it was. Um, but hey, I'm just being truthful here. There's also some criticism towards this game that I don't agree with. Stuff like the 3D gauge I've heard people complain about, I don't really understand why. I think it's a very necessary part about this game. Like, you shouldn't be able to always be in 3D. There should be times where you have to be in 2D because, like, you know, you gotta fight the enemies, you know, jump on the platforms. That stuff doesn't really work in 3D, so you should kind of be a little disencouraged from being in 3D all the time. It is the main mechanic of this game, so limiting how much you can use it and being punished for using it too much, I can see how that's annoying, but at least in my experience playing the game, the 3D gauge never really came into play that much. There was maybe a couple times where I was affected by it, where I just either had to tank the one damage it deals to you, or just flip into 2D and wait for a bit, but still, I feel like the 3D is spread out enough that you're never really gonna have to worry about the gauge. Some people say that the dialogue, or the characters, the NPCs, whatever, aren't as good as the originals, but that I personally really disagree upon. I made an entire section in this video just about the flip side and flop side, folks, because I think they're really underrated characters in this game that no one talks about and just assume that they're worse than, because you never really have to talk to them, but if you take the time to talk to them, they're just as good as the ones in the previous games. They're, they're really good, alright? And also, this game has Count Black, which is a really interesting villain, Dementio, who's one of my personal favorite villains, and a Mr. L, who is everyone's favorite villain. Like, how could you hate this game that much? You gotta appreciate it for at least those three alone, come on. If you've never played Super Paper Mario and watched the entirety of this video, I'd still recommend playing it if you're a Paper Mario fan. It's a very interesting game in the series, and there's still a lot to enjoy and get out of this game. And who knows? I mean, you might enjoy it even more than the others. It kind of just comes down to preferences. Like I said, the problems with this game are just little annoyances for the most part. So, like, I don't know. Right after this video, go on eBay and order yourself a copy of Super Paper Mario. Probably won't regret it. And if you do enjoy Super Paper Mario and watch this video, well, I enjoy Super Paper Mario too, isn't that cool? And I hope you learned something new from this video. Maybe there's something I taught you about Super Paper Mario that you didn't know about. I covered a lot about the game, so hopefully something new was in there. Regardless, thank you for watching this video, and thank you for sticking it all the way through. I can't thank you enough. And, I don't know, comment down below. Like, your thoughts on Super Paper Mario, your thoughts on the video. I know everyone says that, but I'm, I'm genuinely curious to hear what other people have to say on Super Paper Mario and this video. Like, I'm an open book, please, do tell. This was a really fun video to make, and I hope to make other videos like it. And with that being said, thank you for watching, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.